Hi everyone, welcome to the agenda for the second day of the Data and Innovation Summit 2020. My name is Henrik Jöfberg, I'm the founder of Daredax and I'm the chairman of this conference. In this opening of the second day, I would like to continue on from what we talked about uh, in the opening keynote yesterday what it means to work on becoming data and AI ready. Uh, and also what uh, you can see in some of the technology and practice sessions uh, that we share with Deradax and the Airplane Alliance. But here, let's talk about what it means to build a data and AI ready engine in practice. So, what I do, um, I'm working as an interim manager for more than a year now with Scania Financial Services. And they have a very uh, exciting journey uh, moving uh, into becoming data and uh, AI ready. And the whole reason I joined to work with, with Scania was that I felt that they truly understood these, their principles and our, our core values and ideas really match. Especially with the boss I'm, I'm working with now, a shout out to Helena Hörnebrandt, who is uh, head of operations for uh, Scania Financial Services. So here we have their principles in practice. The way we interpreted in Scania how to become data and AI ready. And you will see now that you always need to find the right context. You need to find the, the right lingo, how it fits in your own organization. So it's not exactly the same, but if you look at it, it is the same. So here it is. I will give you a short background on how uh, you know, the situation and the journey and the, and the business uh, vision for Scania Financial Services, what is our operational vision with the DARE engine, and then I want to highlight some key enablers, uh, what we really think has proven important uh, in this uh, specific context. So, let me start. So, the real why, what is driving and forcing Scania Financial Services, who then essentially is working with loan, leasing and insurance around fleets of uh, trucks. Uh, Scania, of course, is the truck manufacturer. Uh, now, there's a lot of things happening driving uh, this uh, map. External forces of, uh, of uh, how fine tech is developing, we, we, there are many mega trends who's really impacting uh, our, our lives. The regulatory space in the finance sector is, is quite strongly changing as well. And then of course, we are part of uh, Scania, who is essentially in the journey of be pivoting from being a truck manufacturing to, to find its place and position in a transport ecosystem. So our fundamental strategies in Scania also has an impact uh, of why we need to sort of do things differently. Now, what is it that we really need to do differently? Uh, so in a nutshell, uh, Scania Financial Services is coming from a, a, a very entrepreneurial uh, approach where we basically now uh, need to balance this entrepreneurial approach with more platform oriented thinking. So to some degree, we need to reduce complexity, uh, we need to uh, uh, reduce a scattered uh, IT and data landscape and try to understand how this will work in, in a, in a platform-oriented way on, on a global scale. And the way we are driving this journey is really based on three core focus areas. So one dimension is uh, how we are working with our, with our core engine, uh, one is how we work with uh, you know, data-driven and, and smarter decisions. And one is how we, how we explore and drive innovation. This, together with new ways of working and a new governance, is what we think is the fundamental engine that will take us to uh, the long-term approach that we want to have. The way this journey is going about is literally three major phases. So it's, it has been a sort of set the direction and foundation phase that started already um, uh, in 2018. Uh, I joined in 2019 and now we're sort of, we're in the middle of stabilizing the DARE engine. So basically 
moving away from project-centered ways of driving change to setting up this operating model where we where truly development and operations is managed as one, as a continuous evolution. And then when this phase has gone the whole way, when we sort of come to the core facets of key things in place, it's about utilizing this approach, what we have learned, our structural capital, our, our technology setups, and simply accelerate with what we have and improve on what we have. But right now we're still putting things in place. We're in the middle part. Now, the way we see these investments in our three key focus areas is one key area we call the engine is essentially to create the bread and butter uh, uh, ways of working and applications uh, that becomes the real engine, which is the core loan and leasing type systems. But it's essentially not only an engine for the bread and butter core processes, but it's essentially the engine of quality data. The second focus area is how we now take care of all the things that needs to go outside of this engine in order to make it smart. So how do we drive analytics and algorithms into it? Uh, and how in some ways do we also drive uh, to, to fix our legacy? So we have all these small applications running, supporting the, the, the major core applications. So how do we move them into a platform thinking? Now, the third level of this, of course, investment is uh, to also set up a platform oriented approach where we have our sandbox, how we can explore and very much more rapidly test the market and test new services and, and, uh, and new ways of uh, reaching the market. So you can sort of see that we are investing heavily to get the basics right, uh, we are continuously investing in smartness and we are gearing up the investment in, in, in innovation uh, when the, uh, Focus Era 1 and 2 has come to a, a critical tipping point. Now, our engine in a nutshell, yeah? So what is the DARE engine uh, that we have uh, looked at? So it has some key components. And of course, they're all uh, addressing our, our fundamental strategies and vision. But in a nutshell, the first idea is that we are truly driven out of our customer journey. So the customer journey is truly agnostic. It uh, doesn't matter of technology and data. We truly want to understand how to best serve the, the customer. And the customer journey is driving our user journeys. So this is sort of setting an agnostic way of how we feel about this. This is the CX strategy and our, and our UX strategy. Now, this is a key component. Another key component is how we are thinking around community and how we are thinking around uh, uh, hub and spoke. So hub and spoke for us means uh, we need to find a way how to balance the local approach that has made us extremely successful in a, in a global market where we are a quite unique type of bank and insurance company uh, existing in, in more than 50 different markets. Uh, how, do we, how do we have this entrepreneurial drive and you know, this decentralized close to the customer approach working and at the same time uh, reaping the benefits of a platform, uh, of a common data? synergies. So here we, we are truly trying to dig into on very operational level what it means, uh, what the role of, uh, of uh, head office is all about, what the role of our regional offices is all about versus the local markets. And in a nutshell, we don't think we can drive this journey, you know, pushing it from centrally out to the local markets. We, we, we try to create the reverse. How can we create a pool where we get best practices happening in one market to cross pollinate to another market and we, where we then are there from the head office to facilitate and orchestrate that uh, the community is, is sort of uh, latching on uh, best practices. Uh, other key areas here is the fundamental DARE lifecycle engine. You see that uh, in, 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 my, in my slide down on the right hand bottom. So here we truly have understood how do we define the key phases of a use case life cycle and how do we orchestrate some of the core dimensions that, uh, that makes this intersectional. The customer dimension, the business value, uh, business value capture dimension, how we, uh, how we d change uh, business process, how we adopt things within uh, the business community, and then what's the technology and what's the data uh, around this. So here is our take on, uh, on it, what's the uh, uh, DARE engine lifecycle. 
And then community is, is, is a key part I will come back to. And then what you see, we have also identified that there are several things that we, where we need to have cross-functional end-to-end capabilities. So if you want to drive a platform, the technology and design patterns, we need to find a way to build community around. How we do data and data management, data governance. How we look at business and solution ownership, product ownership. So we are trying to set up some core capabilities that becomes our framework and, and our ways of working that in a way allows us to be completely flex flexible on what to focus on and what to do, but what we are trying to drive a, a framework so the way we are doing things becomes uh, easy to harvest and reuse in, a, in, a, in another market. So this is, this is sort of the core components of the engine. Now, what I would like to highlight the last couple of minutes now is some key ideas that for us has been very, very important to address and as part of this uh, engine on more operational level. So if you remember from, and if you, if you reflect on what I said in, in the keynote from yesterday, the journey is really about setting up the frame and then not only building use cases that uh, it iteratively more and more, but at the same time harvesting uh, structural capital. And with structural capital, I mean how we do our processes. And processes goes all the way from business processes all the way to data ops uh, type processes. So, so a lot of things here, we are sort of having a big vision of where we want to go, but through the use cases that we are driving, we are stepwise uh, stabilizing uh, our view on the, these different areas. So some key enablers where we need to stabilize and where we're working on uh, are, are these four ones. And I will jump into them one by one now. So the first one I want to talk about is the core topic around modularization. And I think this is one of the key differences for IT and for the uh, traditional technology stack. How should we as an enterprise go uh, going ab about understanding our uh, technology landscape? You know, from ERP applications to CRM applications, building monoliths, you know, on the one corner to going to AWS Cloud or Cloudera on-prem and platform. How will all this fit together? And the key strategy we are talking about is that in all ideas, the fundamental idea is modularization. And of course, being part of Scania, modularization is very close to heart and, and very close to the lean concepts of, of, of Scania. Scania is world class in how to modularize the build of a, of, of, of a truck. And in this way, being able to autonomously work with different parts of truck manufacturing, who builds the engine, who builds the gearbox, who builds the chassis, and at the same time knowing that in the end it fits together. Modularization is a way to deal with complexity and it also allows us to make choices where do we want to develop things ourselves, where do we want to buy stuff. Uh, but this modularization, it, it goes further than that. It's not only an application level, it's also how we treat data, how we treat our algos or algorithms, and how we treat code. So how can we treat it as assets, infrastructure as code, uh, containerized algorithms and data, so it actually be becomes Lego pieces that we can reuse. And driving this dimension of modularization also drives a lot around, you know, how do we in the communities help each other out to reuse these modules in the smart way? Another key topic of this modularization then becomes sort of how to look at the whole uh, architectural la landscape. So we're also talking a lot about how do we uh, look at our legacy systems? How do we decouple data management and using uh, best technologies for, for, for data handling? versus application layers or analytical layers. And then ultimately, how do we drive this towards a UX layer where ultimately, from a, from a user perspective or a customer perspective, they shouldn't need to feel the pain of flipping through many different applications. We should be able to create one user interface for one key role or one customer interface. Uh, so technology-wise, this is the key topics how we want to solve this. Now, second key idea I want to highlight here is as an enabler, how to build a learning organization. 
So as you can see here, the trick here is to have your use case lifecycle on the one hand to work on sort of finding a common lingo so we have a business solution owner who knows the process uh, therein working together with, with data engineers, uh, application developers, uh, 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 application integrators or data scientists. So basically we understand as a cross-functional team what do we need to do uh, in the idea phase, what do we need to do in the validation phase. So this is a key topic now that we build a common lingo like this. Now to get this out across the globe this is where community comes in. So the, the key trick here is basically to build uh, communities both around the business people, so business, different business domains, like some guys are in, in sales, some guys are, and girls are in contract management. We have credit underwriting, credit, uh, credit management. So how can we basically harvest best practices in sales across the globe? How can we harvest best practices in, in, in credit automation as such as this? So it, the whole idea is then to, to closely connect the community as part of the harvesting process uh, uh, of what we have done uh, with one use case. Now, another key topic here I want to highlight is that we have fundamentally also needed to shift our ideas how we understand investments. So imagine going from a sort of project uh, waterfall traditional view of you know this is your project investments, this is your this is your sort of round span the line management of, of your application landscape. This is your process innovation, this is your IT innovation. So here we are really going in separating a commercial view of, of, a, of a funnel, like of a portfolio of ideas that we want to take. And then based on that, those ideas, we basically uh, make prioritization on what to invest and fund and work on, uh, on, 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 a, on a development level. And the way this goes now is basically in a way that we, we basically have an, a way to have a venture cap lean startup kind of approach. So we, we, we can start many ideas in the idea phase, but we only bring the right ones uh, moving forward. So, so the sort of business case and then run everything into production is gone. Uh, the whole pilot thing and see what we do is also gone. So everything has the potential to be part of, a, uh, of, a, of our production setup but we have ways of uh, filtering out what we don't need to work on. So in this way, th this becomes a much more agile steering of our investments. Uh, and it requires some different ideas on how to do bucket funding, uh, how to do funding essentially to, that be, is relevant for agile and DevOps, uh, so to speak. Uh, another key area to work on has been for us, how do we truly understand uh, business solution ownership? So when you're going now that you have an interdisciplinary team where you go from a business process and a domain owner in that all the way down to technology and data, one dimension of ownership. And then we have the other dimension of ownership, who, who owns the framework and ideas around a domain at head office and who owns it out in the global market. So we have, we have worked with a holistic understanding for product ownership or business ownership, so how we can look at from a business perspective or P&L owner perspective, who is the owner at head office, who is the value capture owner uh, at, 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 on the, in, the, in the local market, and who is the you know, business solution owners, product owners on a more technology level that brings, allows us to sort of uh, work cross-functional. So product ownership or business ownership is a, is a key topic. The last thing I want to highlight here is of course another key area has been around how we drive our decisions. You know, to get real speed, we also had to work closely with understanding to where do we make decisions. What decisions do we make in the Agile team? Where, where do we have our tactical forest which can make decisions on a, on a weekly basis? And how do we drive our strategic decisions? So this, this you know, the way we see it is really like a cogs moving well together and basically in order to get speed, we need to work on, on different horizons uh, with different types of questions. Now, as the last one, what this is all about, what this has been all about, has truly been around, we are doing something, we are onboarding one market at a time, we are onboarding one use case at a time, and then we are taking that uh, into production and then into an improved phase. And then we are sort of 
building our journey in terms of more markets on the one end, but also on the other end, different use cases to, to cover. Uh, so we're expanding our footprint in terms of how we are um, drying out the old and moving into the new. So with this, thank you very much for, for, uh, for listening to this. I hope this gave a couple of more insights on what a DARE engine could look in, uh, in practice. So with this, more questions, feel free to ping me on LinkedIn or anything. Have a nice day. Thank you. Our appetite for data has never been bigger, but connecting data across an organization can be a daunting task. As the dynamics of your data change within your organization, so does the complexity you face when trying to deliver value from data at the pace your business requires. All too often, the solution leads to a complex data architecture where you spend more time managing infrastructure at the expense of finding untapped potential within your data. Snowflake allows you to build a modern data architecture with our leading cloud data platform that eliminates the complexity, cost, and constraints inherent with other approaches. Available as a service on leading cloud providers, Snowflake eliminates architectural complexity so you can run many workloads with the elasticity, performance, and scale required by the modern enterprise. What makes Snowflake unique? In one word, architecture. Built entirely from the ground up for the cloud, Snowflake's architecture is comprised of centralized storage for virtually unlimited amounts of structured and semi-structured data, multi-cluster compute for running multiple workloads without resource contention, cloud services to automate common administration, security, and database tasks, and a cloud agnostic layer to deliver a consistent experience across cloud regions and providers. This unique architecture makes Snowflake applicable to a wide range of workloads, including Data engineering by leveraging Snowflake's ability to streamline data ingestion and integration as a data lake by using Snowflake as your data lake or alongside an existing one for data warehousing with unlimited performance and concurrency to streamline data science to simplify and drive performance for complex workloads for building data intensive applications that require an analytics workhorse at their core and streamlined data sharing between consumers and providers. Thousands of companies including McKesson, Instacart, Square, Caterpillar, and many more are seeing performance, scale, and productivity gains utilizing the Snowflake cloud data platform. Snowflake has over one exabyte of data under management, and hundreds of thousands of users execute hundreds of millions of workloads every day. 
The next step should be an in-depth conversation with you to help us understand where you would like to go and how Snowflake could enable you to get there. Tableau Desktop helps you see the stories in your data. It's visual analytics anyone can use. Drag and drop to find trends and outliers. Effortlessly drill into your data and use quick table calcs like running total to see the bigger picture. Connect to the data you care about, whether it's a spreadsheet, database, or big data. Access data warehouses, cloud applications, and cloud databases from a single application. Mix and match from different sources. Tableau brings all your data together in one simple view. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. In this view, we can easily spot underperforming products. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Change your perspective to discover something new. With a click, the scatter plot transforms into a tree map, highlighting that Western Asia has several unprofitable regions. Use drag and drop forecasts to spot trends, identify opportunities, and ask questions like, will I sell more next year? Add calculations to extend your data. Transform your data into powerful interactive dashboards. Then customize them for different devices. Share your analysis securely on Tableau Online or Tableau Server. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau makes analyzing data fast, easy, and beautiful for everyone. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Tableau. Answer questions at the speed of thought. Everyone, uh, this is Yunus Al Nasser uh, from Smart uh, Dubai. Uh, I am Assistant Director General and CEO of Dubai uh, Data Establishment, uh, known as Mr. Data within uh, the City of Dubai. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Data Innovation for this opportunity, and it is very unfortunate 
that uh, we couldn't uh, meet uh, in person uh, due to what is going uh, globally today with the pandemic. But what really is important for us at this stage is that everyone is safe and everyone is taking care of uh, each other. And I believe we are at an era where data became even more important and valuable to uh, give uh, good insights and value to any decisions that's been taken uh, within our cities. And for that, I'll be sharing with you uh, the, uh, our achievement into building uh, the cities uh, with the, the future of data and boosting the transformation uh, within uh, the Emirate uh, of Dubai. And I believe there is an important question that everyone has been through. Uh, what is data and what is the right definition that can be used uh, to identify data? And, and how it's been also uh, scientifically approached. Uh, but, you know, uh, instead of going in that uh, direction and into the debate of what does data mean, let me take you through the way that I usually prefer how uh, to describe data. And if you look globally, uh, how much data is available with us is uh, just an example. Today, there is more than four uh, petabytes of data is created every day by Facebook. And that is equivalent to 300 million, uh, 350 million of photos and uh, 100 millions of hours of videos. So that's basically a lot of data. And especially with the era that we are in at the moment, with the situation of people being at their homes, there is a lot of need for digitization. So that means there will be a lot of data generated. So by 2025, there would be more than 463 exabytes of data will be created every day. So that's basically 335,000 million of photos, more than 10,000 billion of uh, hours of videos. So a lot of data will be generated from many sources and definitely has a lot of value. But the value relies with the people who can uh, evaluate the data that's available and to extract uh, the value out of it. And before getting into that area, you know, it's important to highlight what type of data that's available and how it can be used. And data, as I said, can mean many things to many different people. And it's important to realize that every touch point we have today in our life, in our cities, in our countries, in our organization is generating data. As an example, if today you are doing your shopping, you are interacting with the uh, retail uh, sector. Over there, you are uh, generating a transactions, you are buying goods, and by that, there are a lot of data in the background being generated. By moving in the city, there are a lot of mobility data and it's being captured by telcos. If you are going to any hotels, then you are checking in and checking out, and there are a lot of valuable information exists over there. If you are tra traveling across the board, and so on, uh, a lot of information can be also from different sectors, public sector, private sector, data about our economy, data about our health sector. So there are a lot of type of data that's available in different formats. Some of them are aggregated. Many others are available in its raw format. And again, the question is, what are we doing with all of those data and what do we want to achieve? And this is where I'm answering the question of what we are doing here in Dubai. So at Smart Dubai, the Dubai data establishment job is to enable the creation of a new forms of value out of our city. The way we are doing that is by inspiring new realities, by harnessing the value of the data, by taking the raw data and also data from multiple sources into generating a good projection, a good insights, and also uh, good information that can support the decision making uh, in our city. And in order to achieve uh, our goals, we've built an environment for innovation. We, of course, doing that through a proper data governance and also having it supported with a digital architecture and infrastructure that's guiding the implementation of our approach towards harnessing the value of the data. And last but not least, we are doing that through an ecosystem engagement from different constituents of the government, of the private sector, and also bringing the individual closer to our initiative to drive this value. And by that, we are one of the leading organizations who are driving the most ambition and comprehensive data initiative globally. And, 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 and keeping that in mind, it brings us you know, to the next question, what are the opportunities that have, uh, we have in the data? And as I described, there are a lot of the opportunities that is uh, available in our data today, uh, but it's a question of how we are harnessing those values. 
And I'm sure many of the terms that is available uh, in my presentation, you've heard about it. I'm sure everyone knew, uh, knew that data is the fuel uh, of the future. Some of them, or some people call it the, uh, the oil of the future. Some other calls it you know, the new steel and, and so on. So yes, definitely data has a lot of value and it's a matter of how you are generating uh, that value and how you are uh, bringing the people who can analyze those data can apply to uh, the scientific models that uh, that can uh, transform that data into uh, a new insights. Uh, also, data can support decision making, and that is a great opportunity. Of course, today in, 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 in an era of a COVID, uh, I'm sure you know uh, every uh, person and every decision maker uh, wanted to get an access to real information about uh, the current situation, uh, number of uh, infection, uh, number of uh, recovered people globally or uh, locally, uh, number of people in critical care, and they also wanted to know what is the situation with the uh, healthcare sector. Uh, and of course, the impact of, uh, of such, a, uh, such a pandemic to different uh, sectors uh, within the city. So all of, the, all of what decision makers need is a lot of data and insights that can support them into taking the right measures, the right controls, and the right uh, decisions that can uh, support uh, uh, the, the right uh, future uh, approach to, to, to that country or to that city or to that economy. So there, this is an example of opportunities that we have in our data. But also on the other hand, it comes with some of the challenges, which is also well known, but I wanted to summarize it in this slide, that data comes with a lot of accuracy issues and quality issues. Of course, it has a lot of, uh, it comes in a big volume, but meaning that, you know, if we don't address the data accuracy, it can uh, uh, sometimes generate some uh, uh, misleading uh, guide towards uh, how a, a decision can be made. Uh, data integrity is another uh, challenge to be addressed. Data accessibility, as we know globally, uh, many organizations uh, are, are, are called data huggers. They want to keep their data locally to themselves. Wherein, you know, we are living, living an era where data should be accessible by people who needs it uh, to exchange data to the extent that is possible. And also to have uh, data open, uh, free of charge for everyone to, to get the value of it. Uh, one of the challenges also have been data security. How do we maintain uh, the data security and privacy while we are exchanging our data? So all of those are known challenges, but you know, nothing stops us from moving forward by harnessing our, uh, our values out of it. And for, uh, for that, to address both the challenge and the opportunity that we have from data, uh, in Dubai, we've chosen a unique approach uh, that we have uh, crafted on how we are dealing uh, with data and driving uh, value out of it in the Emirate of Dubai. And that has four main pillars. The first pillar is data governance. The second is around city data architecture and infra infrastructure. The third uh, is around ecosystem engagement, and the fourth is value creation. And I will now take you in a deeper, uh, deep, uh, uh, in, a, in a more depth of each and every uh, pillar uh, and what are the initiatives that we have delivered in Dubai. So when it comes to data governance, uh, our approach has been uniquely uh, distinguished and globally in terms of uh, the initiatives that we've launched under data governance. We are one of the first cities uh, globally to have a data law that's governing the exchange of the information uh, within the city of Dubai. It comes with sets of policies and uh, sets of policies that address areas such as data classification, uh, data confidentiality, data security, uh, data access rights, and so on. So we've detailed it to a level where everyone can know what are their obligations when it comes to data. We also uh, have simplified further the, both the data law and policies by having data standards that can easily be implementable within organizations and uh, if, uh, all of the organizations within, uh, within Dubai uh, uh, drive data within one single standard. Last but not least, uh, we've uh, included into our uh, journey the private sector. As we know, they withhold a lot of uh, valuable information. Uh, we wanted them to be our partner into exchanging uh, their uh, data with the city. And we've uh, launched a full-fledged strategy on how to approach the private sector, uh, maintain uh, the confidentiality of the sector, but still uh, include them in this uh, transformation. 
Another uh, initiative around our data governance have been is uh, balancing between uh, innovation uh, potential uh, while we are protecting uh, the privacy by taking three different uh, approaches. One of them was about building uh, trust between uh, the different constituents who are sharing the data, uh, having an incentive mechanism for both public and private uh, sector to share uh, their data. And last but not least, to demonstrate the outcomes and the values uh, that can be generated uh, from these data and inspiring new realities. Uh, with having such an approach in mind, it has unlocked a lot of uh, opportunities where I would uh, discuss in, in further slides, inshallah. Uh, uh, last uh, initiative under the data governance I wanted to shed the light on it is uh, our uh, AI uh, principles and guidelines that have been launched uh, in uh, June, January 2019. And that is, you know, when we are taking our uh, governance mechanism into advanced levels uh, and uh, including it, you know, part of it would be around the technology, another part of it would be around the data. This is when uh, we are using technologies such as artificial intelligence into uh, analyzing a lot of uh, information and taking decisions uh, on behalf uh, or, uh, or together with humans. So these uh, principles have been, you know, how do we be ethical more about the data that we have in our hand? Uh, how do we maintain the security, equality, and humanity? And for that, we said a principle and guidelines is not enough. We've launched a smart tool, one of its first kind globally, that can uh, as, uh, help uh, AI uh, or, uh, organizations who are dealing with AI to uh, self-assess their uh, initiative and to understand how they are compatible with the principles and guidelines we've launched. Uh, today, uh, most use cases within the government of Dubai uh, have been run through uh, the smart self-assessment tool and have been provided back to them with an, uh, uh, as their assessment level, but also with the recommendations on how to they improve their AI implementations and make it more uh, compliant towards our uh, principle uh, when it comes to AI. So that was our uh, city governance. Now I would move to city data architecture and infrastructure, where uh, we've launched in 2017 the digital backbone of uh, uh, the data exchange within Emirates of Dubai, which is called Dubai Pulse. Dubai Pulse is nurturing and hosting more city data when it comes from the public sector. It comes into two different forms. Uh, a lot of it is available for open use, but many others is available for shared purposes. When it comes to shared data, it's only available for uh, the uh, government organizations who are eligible to get the access to, to such a data. And this is when it comes to that we wanted to make sure that our initiative is holistic enough and covering most city data that's available around ourselves. Yes, of course, not all data will be available and made open, but a lot of other data can be used into creating government efficiencies and creating seamless experiences that is impacting every individual uh, that's uh, living in the Emirate of Dubai. And I welcome you all to visit Pulse.Dubai to check the amount of data that we published and also to see if you could uh, derive some value from it. Uh, we've also uh, wanted to decentralize our platforms so that we widen our scope instead of just only uh, having a centralized approach of exchanging data, we are looking at technology innovation on how do we democratize data in a decentralized platform. And for that, we've looked into four main pillars. We've looked at the technology side. We've looked at the community of people on bringing partnership around how do we uh, exchange our data in a decentralized fashion. We've built also a robust governance system that is very unique. And our methodology is being published on, on, on white papers. You can have a look at it on how do you uh, decentralize data within a city. Last but not least, we also uh, wanted to build a marketplace uh, this marketplace uh, should hold uh, the data of uh, the entities who uh, wants to, to share their data, but also to provide them with the incentive mechanism and also have a revenue generation model where they can uh, monetize uh, their data. Uh, and now I would move to our ecosystem engagement, and I would say we are one of uh, the uh, first cities to build a full ecosystem around uh, improving the data literacy in the Emirate. And for that, we've launched a lot of initiatives, uh, starting with data champions. We have a concept 
which called the data champion within each and every government department in the city of Dubai that are guiding the implementation of our uh, data regulation, data policies and data standards, and also publication of the data on our digital uh, platform. We've supported them with a lot of educational program to certify them as being uh, data champions. Uh, we've also created uh, data advisory groups and also data boards where uh, they are guiding the implementation of citywide uh, strategy data initiative. But also we boosted the organizations with providing them with uh, a concept which is called a data clinics, where whoever in the city needs a support in terms of how do they uh, govern data within their organization or how do they start their uh, uh, data initiative within their organization or how to transform their organization to become data driven with a lot of uh, sessions where uh, we call them data clinics and uh, where we go together with them and identify their data initiative. Last but not least, we also have our science lab where I will talk more about in the upcoming slides. Uh, we've also launched a data first uh, city data challenge uh, that we wanted to improve uh, the uh, city compliance when it comes to uh, exchanging data. For that, we had uh, three main uh, objectives. One of them is to increase city data availability. Uh, enhance the data governance and nurture strong uh, data community. And we've been able uh, uh, earlier this year to, uh, uh, to announce the champions and to recognize their efforts uh, for being compliant with city data. And it have made a great uh, significant move towards uh, city compliance and improving overall city uh, compliance. Uh, towards uh, exchanging uh, the, 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 the data within, uh, within the Emirate of Dubai. Uh, of course, when it comes to our data lab, uh, it is when we are using it for uh, public and private use case development, uh, we have a methodology around it where we start with defining the challenges uh, and uh, ideas, uh, generations uh, to define uh, what kind of are eligible to, to be a data, a data use case. Uh, we apply to it a design thinking exercise where uh, we look at what type of outcomes that is need to be generated uh, and who are the different users would be of such an outcome and what kind of support it will provide at the end. Uh, we also combine it with a data science and analytical approach where uh, that data will be modeled, that data will be uh, used with a, a different algorithms that are coming from data science that can uh, build uh, such a use case and, and drive a value. And we do it in coordination with the uh, different constituents who can either be uh, using this uh, use case or they would be a data supplier uh, to it. And, and by that, you know, we've been able to deliver uh, many uh, data science use cases of, uh, out of the city. One of them have been very recent when it comes to COVID where we've launched uh, a COVID uh, control, uh, or it was a COVID uh, dashboard uh, where we've used uh, a known uh, uh, data science model such as SEIR in order to project the different scenarios that uh, the city might go through when it comes to this pandemic and understand better the spread of the virus across the Emirate of Dubai and to support the decision makers and the policy makers of the Emirate and to different actions that they had they needed to take when it comes to uh, closing some sectors in the cities uh, or you know uh, also bringing back uh, or opening back the economy uh, in the Emirate of Dubai and also keeping a close monitor on the uh, the spread of the virus in the city so again as i said you know there are a lot of opportunities uh, but it's always um, uh, a matter of what kind of uh, uh, methods that you're going to apply to it and then uh, drive a value out of it. And now I would move to value creation and I will talk about two different use cases that we've developed in Dubai. One of them is crowd management and I think the value of crowd management comes at a high, uh, it comes at a very high level uh, today when it comes to, uh, to the current uh, situation globally. Uh, we know that uh, there have been a lot of uh, restrictions uh, applied globally in terms of people's movement uh, cross borders and even internally within the cities and districts and for that you definitely need to be empowered with the right tools and crowd management comes at the heart of it where it always have supported the uh, decision makers from both uh, uh, health sector from the economy sector and also from uh, security and safety perspective 
in order to understand how do we better best serve uh, our people and also to understand uh, how uh, the city compliance is coming when it comes to different control measures that have been suggested. And again, this is just a single example of how uh, mobility data uh, in its big data format can be uh, utilized into, uh, into uh, driving a value. Uh, many other use cases that also been identified where we are combining it with data from uh, retailers in order to understand the uh, crowd uh, effect on the retail sector uh, and provide insights in terms of footfalls. So again, number of use cases under, uh, under such a tool uh, is, is, is endless. It's just a matter of uh, priorities and it's a matter of how do you define the different values that you want to generate. Uh, my second uh, example over here is an economic dashboard. Uh, we've built a, a real-time dashboard for the Emirate of Dubai uh, in partnership with both of public and private sector to provide a real-time indicators in terms of how the economy is performing. And again, with the current situations, there have been a lot of questions. What is the current impact of uh, COVID on the economy? And without having such an advanced tool, without having such an advanced uh, data modeling uh, mechanisms, it would be very hard to measure uh, the economy. And, 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 and in the merit of Dubai, as I said, uh, we've been able to do that, and, and thanks to our investment and to uh, the support that we've been, we've been given by the leadership uh, into building such a capability that is today uh, helping and supporting uh, the transformation in uh, Dubai. Uh, that has been our approach when it comes to uh, city uh, transformation and harnessing the value of data. Of course, that comes with uh, uh, a lot of efforts that uh, uh, Dubai have, be, have put in into uh, driving uh, data and, and, and uh, doing such a transformation uh, through a, a, a method and uh, an uh, approach that is uh, transforming the city. Uh, we are looking towards our uh, next uh, 50 years on how do we plan uh, better uh, our future and our, we are, um, our ambition will continue in the same way that we have started uh, our initiative as a data committee. But what's really important is to look at what opportunities we have in the future. And as our wide, uh, wise leadership said, the data economy becomes an essential financial pillar of all, uh, of all future uh, cities. And we truly believe that. And it is uh, the way that the city is is looking into uh, unlocking the potential values for one single reason, and that is to transform our city uh, into becoming the smartest city by creating uh, citywide experiences to inspire new realities with an aim of achieving a happier uh, life for all. Uh, at the end, I hope by sharing our story, by uh, providing you with our methodology of how to drive uh, data innovation within your uh, country, within your city, within your organization, or even within your individual capacity, that together we would move towards becoming a data-driven uh, uh, organizations and a data-driven uh, world where data is supporting many of our activities and transforming people's lives into becoming uh, uh, the happiest, uh, happiest in the world. Thank you again, and thank you, uh, innovation, uh, data innovation.
Trifacta empowers everyone to prepare messy and diverse data faster. It's a data preparation platform built for the speed of modern business. Start with a flow where the elements of your data preparation project are managed. Add new data to a flow by connecting to a source or dropping in a file. Trifacta presents your data visually for intuitive exploration. Easily spot patterns or data quality issues that may need to be addressed. Preparing data in Trifacta is interactive. Immediately see how a potential transformation will impact your data to ensure you're making the right choice. In this case, we've standardized a date format. With each interaction, Trifacta offers an intelligent suggestion to guide you on how best to clean and structure your data. Use the toolbar to kick off common tasks, such as joining two data sets. Trifacta guides you to select the right common keys and how best to execute the join. All of these transformations are automatically tracked as part of your recipe. When you're finished, click Run Job. Schedule workflows to run on a regular basis for repeated production use. Publish your output to any file format, database, or application for broader use. With Trifacta, you can bring together more data faster, whether you need to prepare data for analytics, machine learning, or standard reporting. So what data do you need to wrangle? Get started with Trifacta today. Hello, welcome, thank you for listening in on me. My apologies for not being present at the conference right now. You can only listen to this pre-recorded message as right now I will probably be hiking somewhere in Scandinavia, um, which in fact beats uh, sitting at a computer for me. So thank you very much for taking over that task. 
My name is Patrick, and I've learned to be critical about what people call AI, or what researchers call machine learning. I've been working with neural networks since my master thesis in the late 1980s, and later on my PhD thesis in the 1990s, and several jobs in research institutes and universities I've had since then. And I'm enjoying the new interest in this field that we've uh, seen in the last, well, let's say 10 years or so. But at the same time, I know there is a very, very long research way to go. I think we are only at the very, very beginning of what machine learning can do for us. And the reason for that is the following. The current success of applications of machine learning is to a large extent almost exclusively based on supervised learning. And that means that neural networks or similar technologies learn from the data that are annotated in most cases by people. So in most cases, you will actually have people sit down and create data sets from which a system like this can learn what's what. Like in the example here, we have annotated images of cats and dogs. And it's actually for these kind of uh, fields, like, like images or language, it's not all that hard to create these data because you can do crowdsourcing and many examples are available. But it certainly does not scale to other domains, like in control or things involving machines. The problem of these methodologies and that you need many, many data to have these standard machine learning methods work. And that's because they are based on the central limit theorem. And the central limit theorem says that any data set, which is infinitely large, has a Gaussian distribution, a standard normal distribution, which is the, uh, at the heart of the mathematics of these methodologies. So this assumption holds for a large enough data set. If you're data set is large enough and a nicely annotated data set, then you can use that to train a standard neural network quite well. But in most cases, of course, it isn't. You don't have these. Nature does that very differently. Animals do this differently. We do this differently. <clears throat> we can all do this. We can control um, and navigate in very, very complex environments by learning the relationship between our actions, between what we do and our, our, our um, observations, what we see, what we hear, what we feel. Our brain learns to predict what we will see, what we will experience based on the actions that it plans to execute. So. It learns a simulation, basically, of what our sensory inputs are going to be and can play that simulation based on planned actions. And that, of course, also includes the actions of the environment. So, well, neuroscience calls this predictive coding and it's actually key for survival. And importantly so, it is learned without a teacher. So we don't need to have an external entity, an external teacher, which tells us what to do in a specific action. But our brain learns that from experience. In my lab, which is a fundamental research lab of machine learning and control at Volkswagen Group in Munich, we are trying to do the same with unsupervised learning and optimal control. Basically, what we do is we learn neural network representations, internal representations of dynamics of a system in terms of its sensory inputs. And the scheme you see on the, uh, on, on the slide depicts that. And if you look at the Z symbols over there, those Zs are internal representations of the observations X. And look at sequences of data. The arrows in the picture are in fact neural networks. And each of these neural networks, three in total for each time step, are trained unsupervisedly. They don't need a teacher 
they just need to observe the environment, the data that is, comes in through the sensors, and the actions that are taken by the system. All of that is unsupervised learning, optimal control, and in deployment, the system runs just on local small computers, Raspberry Pis, on those drones. We do that in different settings as well, like in this example. Here we use the same system to learn navigation in an unknown environment based on sensor readings only. It actually learns a map from the environment. It's put into the same kind of probabilistic neural network as you've seen before. And then we can use the information that is coded there on the position of the agents and the uncertainty in that position to, for instance, plan a route or to know where to find uh, new information, where you should go to find the next information that you're missing. So even though all of these systems are still in the beginning phase and we are not, not uh, very close to general deployment, but that will certainly come. So perhaps with these systems, we will be moving closer to something like general artificial intelligence, more closer to what in biology you will find uh, as, as intelligent behavior. But if that happens, do we actually need to worry? Or do we should we be worrying about machines becoming smarter, smarter than we are? Of course, machines have always been smarter than we are in, in many singular tasks. And we should really think in each and every time about the implications of that. Comparable to how mobile phones change our life, machine learning is already beginning to do that in even a more uh, impactful way. Example, it can go wrong, of course. Look at this, this is a very uh, well-known example from five years ago, Google image recognition software then mistook black people for gorillas. And for a very simple reason for, for somebody who knows how the system work, because the data set that were used to train these neural networks simply contained too few images of black people. So Google couldn't fix that immediately. So um, what they did initially is to remove the class gorillas out of their image recognition software. And that solved the problem on the surface. But to really solve it, it took them actually three years to fix that. Important message here is how do you actually recognize such problems? How do you see that these problems actually exist before they become uh, problematic for society? There are many other examples. Uh, th this is just, uh, just a small uh, excerpt of them. For instance, Microsoft, which put a chatbot online, which learned from people interacting with it. And of course, it didn't take long for people to feed it with racist and other hate speech. And it was very quickly put up by the chatbot. And so Microsoft had to take it offline. Or gender bias in images is a big issue, right? Many of us are, of course, raised with some bias. And that's reflected in the data that we use to teach a neural network. So in that, the system learns to copy us in mislabeling, for instance, in this example, a man in a kitchen as a woman. And that's maybe not a very important thing, but it can have very important side effects as well. For instance, when Amazon tried to uh, train an automated human resources tool on their previous hires, well, of course, it copied the bias that was in there in favor of hiring only men. But not all failures are based on unbalanced data sets only. Another example, the 2018 Uber crash, for instance. This error was to a part caused by engineers which changed specific safety features in the system to improve a demo for stakeholders. And apart from these things which are hard to, uh, to recognize immediately before they occur, there is, of course, also the issue of misuse. How can we safeguard such wrong use? Well, it's nothing new to think about that. Um, as an example, here's a picture from a recent publication from uh, Thilo Hagendorf approximately a year ago, listing ethics, AI ethics guidelines that are out there. It's a large number that you see there. Um, 
And that's wonderful that so many of these exist, but the problem is, is that these are not accountable or measurable. They're not actionable. So what do you do with such a set of guidelines? How do you actually take those things into account that you do want to do good and do want to use your algorithms for good causes? Um, but what does it mean for you as a researcher? What does it mean for you as a programmer, uh, as a developer, as a deployer? Indeed, despite of all of these uh, measures of goodwill, despite of all of these ethics guidelines, things still go wrong. This is an uh, overview we made approximately a year ago, and it's far from complete, but it just gives you a demonstration that the number of initiatives of goodwill and AI ethics increases, but at the same time, the number of ethical concerns does as well. So how can we solve that problem? I think it needs to be addressed very uh, acutely. First of all, finding a set of ethical guidelines is needed to start off with. And indeed, those exist. As an example, those by the HLAC, the High Level Expert Group on AI of the European Commission, or of the OECD, or of the UNESCO, or many others. These can be used, are ready to be used there. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But then, secondly, those guidelines need to be made actionable. We have to make them measurable. What do these guidelines mean for my department? What do they mean for me as a coder, as a developer, as a researcher? What do I actually do with those? And once I know that, how can I actually measure that impact? How can I measure how my department deals with these issues? So, in short, we need to make these measures, uh, these, these guidelines, measurable and certifiable. And thirdly, of course, we must go to a situation where we can create trustworthiness by design. Ethics, you shouldn't forget that, also has an impact on research, on machine learning research. And it's a positive one, I'm sure, because ethical concerns makes us researchers be more conscious about new algorithms and how to make these stand up to scrutiny. So we've set out to do that. We created an organization which is working on exactly these issues. The organization, it's called ETAMI for Ethical and Trustworthy Artificial and Machine Intelligence, started early this year and it takes the 2019 HLAC report and the OECD and UNESCO recommendations as a starting point and it evolves these into measurable and actionable items. And then it looks into certification. So to get this momentous task solved, we decided to set it up as an independent organization. And we invited several uh, European companies and universities to join us in developing this path. You can see a list of uh, partners here. It's a total of 40. Fitting in the landscape, ETAMI currently is just setting uh, uh, academia and companies working uh, on standardization and auditing. Now, of course, we've had a bit of pause in the last months as everybody, but we've restarted now with these companies and universities and have planned the rest of the project. Right now, we've set up the organization and planned what we're going to do and who of the currently 14 partners are going to do what. And that is by first making ethical compliance measurable, then testing and validating those guidelines, and finally implementing a certification roadmap. So the first part, the measurability and the standardization, we are going to have finished by the end of this year. And early next year, we will have those results for you, and we will start piloting our companies with these methodologies. And once it's done, we will, of course, open source everything we have produced. As I do in my lab, because open sourcing, in my opinion, is the only way to bring knowledge in our society forward. And finally, we will then move towards certification. So in a year from now, Itami will be rolling out a path towards certification of trustworthy AI. And 
this is the only place where I actually like to use the term AI rather than machine learning through its partner companies. ITAMI will then go towards standardization and certification. And I think ITAMI can do this, this because it started from an open source research lab, my lab, which is placed in industry, and bridges thus between academia and companies. Of course, ITAMI will be inclusive and open to other companies and universities joining, because I think this is an issue that we must address together in order to make sure that no stupid things, stupid mistakes happen, but at the same time that we can continue our development and employment of these very important methodologies. As always, I'm of, of course very happy to engage in a good discussion on machine learning research about ethical and trustworthy AI or about deployments. Ah yes, and in the end, uh, I'd like to uh, give a short commercial. Um, at the same time, we are doing something rather differently, is looking into how machine learning can be deployed for the development of the uh, solution of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. So what we've done is uh, we've teamed up with Microsoft and started the initiative Tend to Go which will take place in an event end of February in 2021. And at that event, we will invite 100 people to join in, um, in developing methodologies based on machine learning, based on data to tackle the SDGs. And the winning team will be awarded 100,000 euros to make their methodology come to life and remain sustainable. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. What's up everyone? This is One Minute AI with Robert. I want to tell you about the difference between simple methods and complicated methods for AI. Everybody says you should start with the simple stuff like linear regression instead of using deep learning for all your problems. But the fact of the matter is they're used for solving different things. Linear regression is precisely a line. If your problem is as simple as guessing the price of a house and your input is how big it is, use linear regression. If your business problem is a little bit more complicated, like guessing how long the queue has to be at the service depot, depending on how many things need to be packed, uh, where they need to be picked up in the warehouse, and a lot of other complicated nonlinear factors, linear regression is not going to cut it. So don't let people pull wool over your eyes and tell you that you can start with the simple one and then advance to the difficult one. Deep learning is solving the types of problems that you haven't been able to solve before. So make sure to distinguish between the two of them. and welcome to the Data Innovation Summit 2020 and to our keynote. My name is Steve Allison and I'm from Adobe here in EMEA. In my keynote, I'll be speaking about the four major data hurdles in delivering real-time customer experiences. Data preparation, 
data governance, connected data, and ontologies. I'll walk you through these hurdles and suggest ways to mitigate them and thereby enable your business to become an experienced business. Let's get started. Data. We love data. We collect data, we store data, we create data warehouses and data lakes. Why do we do that? What is it about the data that makes it so attractive to us? Well, actually, it's not the data itself. It's the fact that we use that data to personalize the interactions that we have with our customers. We create experiences for them. But who is the customer? In many ways, there's been a journey within digital transformation in our businesses from the early days when we used cookies to read and write data and track people. We understood them because this cookie contained information that allowed us to recognize someone as being the same person that we saw yesterday. And then things got a bit more sophisticated and we started to be able to recognize devices. So now I can recognize a device and how that device interacts with my website and how it comes back again and what it does on all of those different times when it visits my content. But these days, we're all about personalization. Personalization needs the business to understand who the person is, who are the people behind the devices. How do I find them? How do I understand them? How do I go from cookies and device IDs to actually understanding who the customer is as a person? And actually, that's a pretty big question because we understand customers in lots of different ways across lots of different kinds of business systems. They come to our website, they come into our stores. We've got CRM data, we have shopping data, we have loyalty card data, we have social data, we might have chatbot information and their reactions to the media that we put before their eyes. Lots of different data, all with different IDs. And that makes it quite a complicated thing to actually understand a person as a whole, because unlike the traditional customer lifecycle, these days our customers are interacting numerous times a day across many different channels. There's no single way to access your content. There's no single piece of data, no single business system, which has all of that information that we need in order to do that personalization that creation of the experience to understand the person as a whole. And understanding the person as a whole is actually really important to us because what we've discovered is that people are buying experiences, not just the products. You know, products can be generic. Subscriptions can come from lots of different places. Obviously, not always. But it's the experience that we have that really makes a difference. So what do I mean by experience? Well, if personalization is getting the right message in the right format in front of the right eyes at the right point in time, then an experience is about all of those things put together over a period of time. So all of the individual pieces of personalization that you've done and how that comes together to create the entire experience of doing business with you, the story of your engagement with that customer. And all of that creates the experiences that drives your business. But having said that, it's not always easy to create those experiences. And there are four major barriers that stop us creating these real-time data-led experiences. The first of those is, is just identity the disconnected nature of identities. Is it a name? Is it an email address? Is it a cookie ID? Is it something else? How do I discover who that person is with all of these different systems using different IDs? That becomes a major problem in identifying who our customers are as people. The second one is that of data governance not being enforced. Now, I maintain that the problem today is not data. We can collect data easily. We can store data easily. We can move data easily. The problem is not the data. The problem is understanding and being able to enforce what data can I actually use right here, right now to make this personalization or recommendation or next best action 
for this person. That's the biggest problem facing us, in my opinion. And it's one that we can solve. It just takes a bit of forethought. The next area is that traditionally, artificial intelligence and machine learning has operated in, in silos. You get your data together, you push it into your data warehouse, you run your algorithms, you find your insights, you push those insights back into your front end systems. Well, that's way too slow. Most of us have millions, if not trillions, of interactions with our customers across all of our different channels. Every week, every day, every year, that volume of data grows. And we need the artificial intelligence, the machine learning, in order to find those insights to enable us to make those decisions fast enough to actually affect what that person is doing next in the same session that we're having with them. So we need to bring the AI and ML out of the silos and make it part of the interaction that we have with users in real time. And that really brings us to the fourth one. Traditionally, data activation has been slow and inconsistent. When we need to share data, move data around, we need to be able to do that as fast as we capture it, as fast as we find those insights, we need to be able to share it with other systems. No delays, no transformations, no working out where it goes in, in, in other business systems, just moving the data as fast as feasible. So let's have a look at how we can solve some of these problems. Well, the first one is the whole thing about identities. There's a big discussion today about cookies and cookies going away. Well, actually, it's only third-party cookies that are going away. But in general, cookies are becoming less useful, and we need to start using other IDs. But the problem is, no, what ID? Every single one of these business systems or methods of engagement probably has a different ID. What if we could resolve all of those different IDs down to a single person? And that really is one of the trends these days, to build a profile, a personal profile, a unified profile around that person, the famous 360-degree view of a customer. If I know what the ID is of that data when it gets onboarded, then I can start to make links between, oh, this email has this cookie associated with it. Let's link that together as the same person. So I can start to bring in CRM data because I know who that customer is. I can start to bring in the IDs and the data from other systems and start to tie those together to build an identity graph based off the IDs, cookie IDs, declared IDs, CRM IDs, email IDs, whatever it might be. Use that to unite the data into a single person and resolve it to a single person but use any of those IDs that I need to. Now, if I can do that with IDs, I can also do that with devices. So I can build up a device ID and understand the devices that the person is using, resolve those devices down to that user. Again, mixing those devices and the IDs together so I can bring that information down to a user. If I know who that user is now, then I know what segments they're going to belong to, so I can very quickly get you the kind of information that they are going to need. But in order to provide real-time context to that conversation that we're having, we need to have something that we call an experience event. Experience events are all the real-time click streams. It's the real-time behavioral information. It's everything that they've ever done with you across every channel and everything that you have done with that customer across every channel, all in a time series so that I now know what were they looking at on the web yesterday? What was the last offer that I sent them by email? What was the last thing that they discussed with me when they came into the shop? All of those things become experience events that I can look up and that gives me the context of why we're having this discussion with them, and also the history to allow me to make better personalization decisions or next best action decisions or whatever it might be at the end of the day. Now, I mentioned that this design of data governance needs to be there right from the start. 
we should be thinking of you know, how are we using that data? What am I going to do with it? How long do I need to keep it for? Because that enables us to be confident that when we use it further downstream, we're using data that we are actually allowed to use. So first of all, on data ingestion, as I'm bringing the data into my system, I need to know what that data is. So I should be labeling that data as it comes in. And therefore, I know this is PII information. This is social information. This is partner information. This is third party information. This is financial information. Now, whatever it might be, label the data as it comes in. And therefore, I know what that data is going to be. Now, closely linked with that is the idea of using a standard data model to standardize and normalize that data. So we can then link the data model together with the data labeling so that any information that comes in through that data model is by default labeled and then becomes really useful, as we'll see further on in the presentation. So data's got labels on. And the next thing we need to do is make sure that we've got consent for that data. OK, so we shouldn't be collecting any data that we don't have consent for. But if they have consented, we need to be really clear on what it is that they have consented. So we write that consent in with the labeling so that we know that Steve Allison, my name, can be used anywhere where you talk to me. But my email address or my bank balance or whatever should only be used in specific circumstances that we can declare. Managing the consent in those labels allows you to get a granular knowledge about what data I can use in what circumstances. Of course, rights management is a vital part of this. Now, who has access to look up that information? Can you go in there and correct it? Can you delete it? All of those GDPR things that we know, but also internal security within your own organization. Who has the rights to go in and view this data? And obviously, we can manage this through roles-based authentication and, and all that kind of stuff. And then finally comes the actual governance part of that, where we write the rules about what data we're actually allowed to share with other systems and how that data should be shared. So if it's my systems, then I can share all the PII information. If it's going to a third party or a system outside of my premise, then maybe you want to anonymize all of that data before it leaves um, your environment. We write those rules. We create those rules for everywhere where we share and use that data. And this gives us the ontology of the data that we need to be able to use downstream. Now, data grows all the time. The amount of data gets bigger and bigger, and we need the power of machine intelligence, machine learning, artificial intelligence in order to make this work effectively. But not just that, we need the system to get better and better. By 2022, Gartner reckons that more than half of all businesses will incorporate continuous intelligence into their real-time decision-making in order to make personalization work better. And by this, what they mean is the ability to capture information about what a user is doing, where are they, what are they doing, what have they just received, what have they just opened, and then use that information to then think, okay, what should I be doing next? What is the next step in this process that I want them to take? And then action, create the offer, create the recommendation, put that article in front of them or whatever else it might be. And then learn all the time from every decision it makes, is this working? Why is it not working? What is working? Where do they go next? What happens next? Can I build that back into my model? What segments are being used? What servicing happens as a result of this? So a continuously evolving process is where the machine learning has a dramatic impact in building those real-time experiences. We can have the machine learning update itself in real time, make its calculations in real time, observe what happens next in real time, and therefore reassess, redetermine, redecide, reallocate, whatever it might be, in order to make better decisions about what to do next or what the customer is likely to do next. So how are we feeding this data into the machine learning environment? Well, let's go back to my profile, my unified profile. We've got all the data here being updated in real time from 
the web, from click streams, from all of those other business systems. As that data changes, the profile gets updated and it becomes the perfect food for your machine learning algorithms and your AI environments. So now we can start to build machine learning that recognize actions and likelihoods that allows us to take measurements, et cetera, et cetera, much easier because it's being fed that data in real time in a structured way that we know the, the ontology of, we know the um, consent of all of that data. Being able to model that in real time, work out those attributes and refine the process, that's powerful stuff. That helps with our planning. It helps us to understand what it is that I should be doing in order to convert customers, service customers, retain customers, now, whatever it might be. Should you be spending your money on YouTube? Should it be LinkedIn? Should it be Facebook? Or should you be doing it yourself through your applications? Where's the correct balance between where you should be putting your activity? Well, attribution modeling is a perfect way to find those Find those answers now to, to, to see what makes the biggest difference for your users. And if we get it wrong, it doesn't matter. That's a great data point to make sure that the next time we get it better, we get it right, we learn. So the machine learning updated in real time as part of the profile, as part of our normal engagement with users, becomes a really powerful tool in helping us to create personalized and great experiences with our customers. It's also something that we can write back into the actual profile because the output of those machine learning algorithms, the, the propensities, the churn scores, the recommendation scores, all those things, they're in the profile. So now I can use them when I'm finding my audiences, when I'm creating my segments. And my segments can now be very sophisticated. Find me people in this area who are interested in this product or this service or who need this particular service, who have got this kind of device and a propensity of over 80% to actually open this message that I'm about to send them. That's a powerful segment. If I can create a model with that kind of prediction built in, that's powerful stuff. That's a powerful way of targeting the right content to the right people at the right time, instantly able to look it up, instantly able to action it, so we see that ability to pull all of the data together and make it available to machine learning as being a really powerful part of a proper experience-focused business. And those machine learning algorithms, they might be the ones that Adobe provides. They might be ones that you have from other vendors. They might be ones that you build yourself. And that's actually quite an important notion. You need an environment where you can use generic digital marketing algorithms and you know, they might be useful in everything else, but you need to start to train those algorithms on your data, your models, your customers, your data, your processes, not generic training, but trained against your data. So even if you have a generic algorithm, if you train it against your data, data that's constantly being updated in real time from your customers, you're going to get much better results out of that. So again, part of this flow of the data that we have is that if you've got the profile, if you're able to bring all of that together, if you're able to bring that into the machine learning environment and train your people against it, your, your algorithms against it, then you're going to get an algorithm which actually responds in your business context far better than anything else. So let's bring all that together. We created a unified profile with all the customer data updated in real time from multiple systems and data sources. This frees the data from any single system and makes it standardized and normalized for sharing with other systems later on. We know what consent we have for that data and we've labeled all the data items so that we know we are all using data that we are allowed to use. And that data is being shared to machine learning in real time and contains machine learning scores that help us to find the insights as the data changes. So you can now share the profile data, the insights, or any other data that you want with any other system via the data model and subject to the consent and usage model that we've already created earlier. What we have done to solve the four data hurdles to delivering real-time customer experience 
is to elevate the relevant data out of individual systems or, or data sources, standardize it, label it, add in consent and usage information, enrich it, make it available, providing the perfect environment to build customer experience applications or services or workflows or other microservices. I hope you enjoyed that. If you would like to engage with the Adobe team to learn about how other customers are building themselves into experienced businesses or about our technologies, then please feel free to book a meeting via the app or ask for a post-event follow-up with either myself or my colleague, Carl Bergstrom. Our emails are on the screen at the moment. We'll be very happy to continue the conversation with you. In the meantime, thank you very much for your time today. Hey there, welcome to Data Innovation Summit and welcome to Microsoft. If you want to learn about the latest and greatest within the data and AI space, congrats, you're at the right place. During these two days, Microsoft subject matter experts will share their expertise and best practices on how to leverage data and AI to engage customers, empower employees, optimize operations, and transform products. You will also hear directly from our customers and partners about their first-hand experience making data-driven innovation happen on Azure. Why Azure, you might ask? Azure is the most trusted enterprise cloud that enables you to innovate at scale and innovate with agility. We offer a wide spectrum of technological innovations. It's not all about speed performance, and scalability. Azure is also the industry leader to empower data scientists and developers to innovate responsibly with our Microsoft AI principles and responsible ML capabilities. So go ahead and embark your data innovation journey with Microsoft. The moment an infant opens its eyes, the building blocks of creativity begin to take shape. Everything we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch determines how we think, feel, and create. It's how our minds work. It's what makes us who we are. Just by tapping out the right sequence of keystrokes, we breathe life into the void. The internet connected the minds of the world, and overnight the only limits to what we could make were the scope of our imagination, the physics of the transistor, and the speed of light. Or so we thought. While our minds fluidly process a complex and ever-changing river of information, our programs inhabited a world of boxes, rows, and columns. No incremental improvement, no workaround, no framework could cut the gridlock that entangled our code and choked our progress. It's a problem you can't unsee, and solving it became our defining obsession. 
So we broke the boxes. We made something new, flexible, intuitive, fast. We built it for the curious, the driven, the playful. Those who see an unsolved problem and dare to create a solution that doesn't fit in any box. We built it so our ideas can reach the world faster, so we can meet the needs of tomorrow's customers better, so we can move as fast as we think. At its core, a development experience that makes data natural in every context, reducing the friction between imagination and implementation. An adaptive, intelligent platform to serve any workload, from the most demanding transaction processing to advanced analytics to rapid prototyping. A modern foundation to build the future on that allows data to vary, to change, to flow, to adapt to whatever happens next. Because we did not come this far to stack boxes. We were all born to create.
Michael Richard, welcome to the fifth edition of the Data Innovation Summit. We are really glad to have you and Sam Arke with us for this special edition. Uh, it's not the first time that you are particip participating in one of our summits, but it's the first time that Sam Arke is our uh, partner. So to start with, please tell us a bit more about yourself and Sam Arke. Yeah, hello, Ivana, and um, hello, everyone watching. Uh, yeah, it's good, good to be, well, good to be talking to you. I rather hoped to be in Stockholm, but unfortunately, that's not to be. So I'm yeah. <laughs> talking to you here from my home in uh, near London. Um, yeah, I'm the general manager for Semarkey Limited. And uh, from our offices here in the UK, we look after business, obviously, for the UK, Northern Europe, and the Nordics. And Semarkey uh, is, we, we position ourselves as the intelligence data hub company, um, providing software for master data management, reference data management, and generally in, in the data management sphere. Mm -hmm. So that's something about us, and uh, I'll tell you a few more in a moment. Uh, great. Uh, and today you presented uh, on the data management stage, introducing Simarkis Intelligent Data Hub Master Data Management. Uh, could you sum up the main key points that attendees took away from your presentation? Yeah, sure, Ivana. Um, I think that there were a number of points in it, but I think one of the key points is the is the complexity of a master data management solution. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's very easy to assume that uh, it's simple. Um, people presume that it's simply about people, places, and things. Uh, but when you add in the other complexity of information in, in an enterprise or in an organization, um, information from call centers, um, information about contracts, uh, sales forecast information that surrounds those people, mm -hmm. places, and things. Um, it actually becomes a very complex uh, network yeah. of information. So I think that one of the key takeaways really was that by joining all of that together uh, in what we would call a data hub, then you're really able to take action and analyze that information uh, and build on that to, to increase the, to, to achieve the results that you want to achieve from your, from your systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, talking about MDM, it is constantly evolving and becoming more accessible through available MDM tools uh, and software. Could you please give us some interesting examples of your MDM projects uh, and how you help our organizations excel in this area? Yeah, um, some interesting ones and um, I'll not give names, but um, it, it yeah. should be fa fairly easy. Um, one of my favorite ones actually is a very a worldwide, a global um, maritime shipping company um, and they use our software to interface to their um, SAP systems their their wall-to-wall -wall SAP for their for their ERP systems uh, but then taking Samarki software they then interface to that um, to provide information on the um, the goods that are being shipped on the, the vessels that they're on where the actual containers on those vessels are and even down to where they are um, on the oceans so yeah. that's a really interesting one um, and another one, um, uh, a major um, Swedish automobile manufacturer, um, that people may be able to guess who they are, but they're using us um, primarily for customer information. But then that customer information, as I mentioned earth, earlier with the complexities, links through to information on, uh, from the dealerships, on the servicing of those cars, the components that they've used. Um, the cars themselves, as you know these days, they have... Um, uh, methods of ident locating them where they are on the roads or where they are in the country and all of that information is linked together into one global hub so that when you or I as, a, as an owner of one of those vehicles um, corresponds or communicates with the manufacturer they know everything about you instantly rather than having to look in multiple different places so again that's another um, interesting use of our software yeah. that goes way beyond what I would call um, basic MDM uh, and is a, is, is a genuine data hub. Yeah, thank you. These were some really interesting case studies. Um, but from your perspective, what are the biggest and most, most common hinders or challenges uh, that organizations face when it comes to master data management? And what are the implications of not solving these challenges? Um, well, th th there, are, there are many. Um, and yes. I've been working with master data management for something like 15 years uh, and prior to that data warehousing. And obviously the, the challenges are quite apparent to me. Um, if I answer the question the other way around, the implications of it clearly yeah. are that the, the, the company or the enterprise does not benefit from that solution uh, being implemented as quickly as it could be. And uh, I would say that 
all these applications are implemented for a business purpose. There's usually, um, I, I would say, one of three reasons. One is to increase the profitability of the company. Uh, one is to uh, imp improve the productivity. Um, and thirdly, for compliance and fraud issues. So the implications of not doing it are that you don't benefit from the productivity right. or the profitability or you're exposed to compliance and fraud more quickly. Um, one of the key, some of the key reasons I think are is that it's very difficult to prove the value, uh, the return on investment, the ROI. And I think one of the constant challenges we face is that we talk with the, the business community or the business user the, for the requirement. Um, and how do we prove that ROI um, okay. to convince the budget holders and the business to actually spend the money to implement the system? So, so that, that's kind of the implication. And yeah. If we could solve that problem, then I think we could move forward more quickly. Yeah, great. So these were some really relevant implications you mentioned. Um, but where should firms begin to approach them? Uh, could you give us some uh, advice on how Hemarchy, uh, Semarchy, sorry, helps companies tackle these challenges? Yes, yeah. Um, again, I guess it. one of the things that we've tried very hard to do with the Semarchy XDM platform um, is to make it agile. And, and that's an often overworked use. Everybody speaks about agile. Um, but the quicker that you can implement something, um, the quicker you can prove whether it works or not. And there's, there's an expression, if you're going to fail, fail quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that using the agility of our platform, you can implement a, a proof of concept or a proof of value, as we call it, uh, in a matter of weeks. Uh, then using that proof of value, you, you can quickly identify the ROI. So, so the budget holders then believe in the concept and are able to move forward. So I think that um, probably one of the quickest ways is actually um, not to spend months or years talking about it, but to actually get on, yeah. um, get involved and, and build, build a quick proof of value. Mm -hmm. That's a good advice for companies. But considering that MDM is becoming more main mainstream and moving to the cloud, what can we expect uh, from a technology point of view in the next uh, one to two years, let's say? Okay, uh, in, that's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it, I've been, as you may have guessed, I've been in the computer industry a long time and trying to, to predict the future is always uh, unpredictable. Yeah. Um, five years out, it's impossible to know. Um, I think in the next one to two years, as you say, the, the use of the cloud has become much more prevalent. Um, only four to five years ago, the finance sector were very reticent to use the cloud, um, but now it's becoming much more acceptable. Um, and let's face it, a lot of cloud um, installations are more secure than, than people's own yeah. on-premise computing. Um, so I think we'll see a lot more use of the cloud. Um, we'll say move towards product as a service, um, and in some cases, software as a service. Um, but also surrounding that, I think that there's, there's room to expand to link the data hub um, in the area of communication. So I think linking it to closer with emails, uh, mm -hmm. chat, for, chat groups, um, channels like Slack, so that the data hub itself then becomes something that uh, people mm -hmm. can communicate and interact within the organization. Um, and also then that will lead to, I think, um, improved functionality in workflow areas. So I think that the, the whole... Um, concept of the data hub is going to become more collaborative over the yeah. next one to two years by incorporating these, these type of features. Um, and yeah, it should become a comprehensive place where people go for their information um, and how to do things, the analysis and driving the business. Mm -hmm. These are some really exciting future outlooks of yours uh, that we will see we, how they turn out. Uh, well, we hope was, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we hope. Um, so thank you. This was our last question uh, for the interview. And uh, I would like to thank you for being part um, of the Data Innovation Summit, uh, you and Simar Kim for doing this interview with me. Thank you, Ivana. It's, it's a pleasure. Thanks.
Welcome, everybody, to Data Innovation Summit 2020. I'm here with two great guests to talk about how to build human-centered and explainable AI models and products. Please feel free to introduce yourselves. Patrick? All right, so I'm Patrick Couch. I work with uh, IBM. I'm, uh, I work as a business developer focusing on artificial intelligence and cognitive technologies. So I work within what IBM has branded Watson. Uh, and in, in addition to that, I also work as a spokesperson. IBM doesn't really have evangelist roles, but we have spokespersons who are out and about talking about their various uh, expertise uh, areas. So mine is AI and the implications of AI. So that's what I do for IBM. Excellent. Vivian? Thanks. I'm Vivian Trantien. I'm a director of AI consulting at Dataiku. And basically, I help Dataiku's customers implement AI projects. Excellent. Cool. So let's get started immediately. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a topic that everybody has top of mind, ethics and uh, explainable AI. And sometimes it can feel a bit vague. So let's try and make it concrete. Why don't you guys tell me what human-centered and explainable AI is to you and why it's important? Uh, Patrick, how about you start it off? Yeah, sure. No, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of... Uh... <laughs> talk now about artificial intelligence in the light of ethics and morals and mm -hmm. accountability, explainability, morals, the whole thing uh, that was perhaps previously the domain of the humanities in the academics. And uh, it's a bit of a novelty now, I think, for the tech community to be so heavily uh, focused on ethics. But I think it is a correct focus. I think uh, AI as a label for a lot of different technologies is so transformative that we need to give thought to ethical implications of AI. And I think when it comes to human-centric AI, I think the, the, the main idea is to make sure that these powerful capabilities that we are now standing up are understood by the user, basically, or the, yeah, the user, the, the us humans, in a way that makes it possible for us to make sure that the technology serves the purposes that we have given it. Excellent. Yeah. And Vivian, what do you think? Or what well, do you say? Yeah, I agree with all this. Um, for me, human centered AI refers to the use of AI, which takes fully into account the implications of uh, these uh, uses on people, uh, taken either as individuals or communities or more generally as a society as a whole. Right. C can you both perhaps? Let's see if we can make this concrete. Can you share examples of AI ethics challenges that you personally have uh, faced at customers? And if it was overcome, then how was it overcome? Because I don't want to make the assumption here that these are trivial challenges that can be overcome. In some cases, maybe you know it might put a stop to a project. What do I know? Uh, Patrick, what do you say? Yeah, no, you're right. And uh, these are challenging uh, challenges for AI. And a lot of these challenges in terms of ethics uh, relate to uh, the data required to get the magic out of the uh, out of the technology, right? And I think over the years we've seen a tremendous amount of of uh, uh, or tremendous amount. We've seen a lot of funny, weird, sad, tragic uh, examples of uh, AI applications gone wrong. Uh, and I mean, IBM was exposed to this uh, early, maybe two years ago, when uh, there was an MIT study showing uh, biases in facial recognition software. And uh, IBM uh, immediately addressed this and put this on the agenda for IBM research. So we were trying, we, we tried to overcome the, 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 the challenges within uh, bias in data sets for AI applicability by taking the bull by the horns, basically, and, and, and working with it. So IBM set up this whole program for mitigating AI uh, biases in AI, and it's been a continuous struggle. And I think the, the most clearly um, sort of examples of how to address this is the fact that IBM has um, commercialized, uh, made available to the open source community, created products, all with the purpose of mitigating bias difficulties. But, but, but you're right, it hasn't been overcome as much as it has been now been an acknowledged as something that we need to continuously address and work with. I see. Uh, Vivian, what do you say? Uh, have you come across this in projects that you've been involved in? Yes, I've had a, quite an interesting uh, use case uh, with interesting ethical implications. 
So in a previous life, I was helping a public health agency, which was responsible to organize health inspections for restaurants. And this agency wanted to use online reviews to target inspections. And it raised interesting ethical concerns. And there were two main concerns. The first one was that not all uh, consumers use smartphones or um, mobile applications in the same manner. So there could be a, a fairness issue in the sense that if you are not in a demographic group that uses this kind of technologies, then maybe your voice is less heard. And also if you are a restaurant and your consumers happen to use this kind of technologies, maybe you will be inspected more often. So is it fair, is it not fair? And the second concern was that basically the, the idea was to use the plain text of the online reviews. So it was possible that you used for your predictions words that reveal the type of restaurant, like is it a French restaurant or a German restaurant or an Italian restaurant? Right. And then it's interesting because like it's not like the nationality of a person, because of course it would be forbidden to you to discriminate on the basis of the nationality of a person. But in, in a certain way, the type of restaurant may be connected, correlated with the nationality of the business owner, for example. Mm -hmm. um, also, what is interesting is that there might be legitimate reasons to use this kind of information. For example, if you are uh, selling Japanese food with mm -hmm. sushis or makis or sashimis, maybe there is a, a stronger health risk. So it might be legitimate to use this information. Mm -hmm. It was quite an interesting um, um, example of uh, ethical concern. And basically at that time, my recommendation was that it would be interesting to train the model with the online reviews as they are without training them. And then with uh, okay. AI, the idea was to look at the words that were the most influential. Right. And if we realize that the words corresponding to uh, the nationalities uh, of the restaurant didn't contribute to the predictions and were mostly fine. And we may want to just blacklist this world and then we, we won't have any problems. Right. If we realize that they have a strong influence, then we will need to look at this more in detail with domain experts to realize to what extent it could be legitimate to use this information. That's a super interesting problem. And I'm curious to hear in your opinion, if you felt like you were able that, that it could be overcome, or if it's more of a process that's managed continuously um, as you work with it. I mean, is it something that you can, can we fix these types of ethical concerns? If you... I think we can address them, but we, it's clear that it's clearly not only a problem for the data scientist, because for example, I've never been in the kitchen of a restaurant, so I wouldn't be able to interpret all this data but it's a matter for which you need to work closely with the domain experts because they are able to interpret uh, what you discover in the data. And then it's also important, I think, I think to involve the decision makers. Right. Because at the end of the day, uh, it's it them who are responsible to enforce the values of their organizations. And it's not your place as a data scientist to take this kind of decision. And often it's a judgment call. It's not our black or white situation. So right. you need to have a fine grain uh, analysis. And then it's important to be able to convey all these um, ethical dilemmas to decision makers. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think you're very right. I think it is not black and white. It's not right or wrong. It's not binary, which makes this uh, Robert, you know, more of a managed process, I think, than, than something that we, we, we tick it off and then we, we go on to other things. And I think what, what you touched upon, Vivian, is also very true in regards to value alignment with the company's values. I think this is a much more fruitful way of, of thinking about the ethical problems from a business perspective. I mean, people have been discussing ethics 
forever uh, and we haven't uh, sorted it out yet. It's an ongoing conversation. But what we can do is make sure that the various applications that we stand up and the capabilities that we make available do align with whatever comp uh, company value uh, that we want to promote. Uh, so then, then at least, you know, within within the, the, the business that we're conducting, we can make sure that, that, it, that we run a tight ship. Uh, but, but I think beyond that, I think it is much more um, a question of having an ongoing conversation, what those values should be. I mean, there are certainly different value systems in various cultures, and we see this playing out uh, you know, globally in terms of China, Europe, uh, the US, going about things slightly differently in terms of data privacy, for instance. But it's not saying that one is right and the other is wrong. It's just different points of view. And, and we need to make sure that we that we make available and, and possible this type of conversation. And therefore, you know, the human centric explainability is very important, more so than, say, the best ethic. OK, I think we can split the conversation there because <clears throat> explainability certainly is something that um, has, has uh, taken a lot of the time of these conversations, whether or not we can understand why certain decisions were made. Um, so if we do have two classes of problems, we have the explainability, and then we have the, the bias of the models. And I'd like to hear just your thoughts on one thing. With, with regards to the bias of the models, it seems that all of the models that are biased are trained to be like humans and trained on human decision making. So we're perhaps trying to make a model that's like a human, but good. Because you never see models that are biased on detecting brain cancer or something like that, right? It's always a model that's trained on police, police actions in the past or credit givers' actions in the past and that kind of thing. It, it, could we perhaps simply by adopting a better scientific methodology uh, get rid of a lot of these biases? Or do you feel that bias, is bias in the colloquial sense of the word, is inherent in machine learning. Patrick, what do you think? Yeah, so that, that's a very good question. I think uh, there is probably, you know, a very uh, <clears throat> scientifically, the technological, deep explanation that you could bring forth in terms of answering that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the data. But, but I think, rather, I think um, there is no reason for us humans to transfer our biases into uh, the technology. I don't think that's a law. You know, I, I think it's a strong tendency. Mm. It's, it's certainly a human uh, tendency to sort of uh, think of uh, your own outlook as, a, if not a very good outlook, then at least, you know, a, a predominantly norm-centered uh, outlook. But that's just, you know, your fault in, in circumscribing the data set that you navigate within. Uh, but I think we can, by putting the spotlight on this, we can certainly make sure that the, the way uh, algorithms treat data is less bias-ridden than, than our own uh, way of dealing with data. I think so far what distinguishes algorithms from humans is often you know, the experience. I mean, humans bring with us all our experience that we have accumulated through life, but the algorithm may have only existed for a couple of minutes, and the, its experience is basically the data available to it. So I think it is possible to actually weed out a lot of these, shall we say, unnecessary biases in data sets. And I think it was, uh, I think it was Daniel Akine from Microsoft in a panel you and I had, uh, Robert, a, a year or two ago, and he, where he said, you know, we should require more of our technology. Why just mm -hmm. say that it should be at the level of humans? And I thought that was very astute. I thought that was a very good, clever way of, of, you know, setting up the problem. Expect more from technology than from your fellow human being. Why not? Right. Vivian, what's your take on this? Uh, is it possible to sort of disconnect the model training from human decisions? You know, we've seen high profile cases of models that have been used for finding good candidates for a company that were trained on, you know, historical uh, um, data from, from people's decisions. Is it possible to find other data sets, or is it merely just being cognizant of it um, that is the important, uh, the important part? Yeah, first I'd like to react about one of the comments that you made about the fact that you don't find machine learning models on medical images that are biased. But I'm not sure that it's correct because it's possible to be biased with um, 
like the settings of the medical imaging devices that you use. And sometimes you have a model with good performance uh, with a certain kind of devices. But if you slightly change, for example, the contrast of the pictures, then the results are very different. And it's also possible that the people for which you uh, uh, you use these images may be different from the general population. So I think even with this kind of application, it's possible to have biases. And then to come back to your question, um, definitely we can uh, be more cautious and there are several techniques that can be used to try to mitigate the biases. But at the end of the day, it's a socio-technical problem. So it's not possible to have a 100% technical uh, solution. At some point, you need to um, to use human judgment and to uh, explicitly choose your, what values you should try to, to want to, to put in your system. Right. So, yeah. So like a methodology, is that what you mean? Perhaps that, uh, that, that there should be not perhaps a solution, but perhaps a methodology that you should try to follow to make sure that you're <clears throat> cognizant of everything? Yeah, definitely. So I think that there are um, algorithmic solutions that can help us at certain points in the, uh, in the life cycle of your project. But at the same time, you should have a process in place to ask the right, the right questions all along your project since the initial framing of the project until uh, the moment when your project is in production and when you monitor continuously that everything is fine. Yeah. It's curious that we should land in uh, healthcare. And I, I picked perhaps not the best example of uh, unbiased uh, AI, but the uh, healthcare sector has a long and, and esteemed history of ethical thinking going back to the ancient Greeks. Uh, and depending on who you ask, some might say that it's uh, time to rethink a lot of the ethical practices. And uh, some say that it's served the healthcare community very well. But I think we can learn a lot about having it up front and center, at least, um, from them. Uh, let's put a pin in that, and I think we can come back to it and shift back to the other aspect that we mentioned just a moment ago about the explainability of these models. And I think anything that touches humans and things that are important to them, um, ethics and, and uh, uh, the decisions that these models make become important. So we want to be able to explain what the models do, and we have a lot of technical solutions for those. To what degree are these technical solutions sufficient or lacking when it comes to the explainability of models? And I'd also uh, like to challenge you um, to, to say whether or not you think this is applicable across AI, because we can always pick the worst possible example of a bank not guaranteeing a loan. But is that, uh, are these really fringe cases, or, or are they just the best, uh, most understandable examples? And every aspect of AI has these sorts of issues connected to them. What do you, what do you say, Patrick, with regards to explainability? Yeah, so, uh, well, so first off, I think explainability uh, we need we need to we need to make possible explainability at some level. It doesn't it, it doesn't mean that everybody needs to understand everything. I mean, I certainly do not understand how the airplane can fly that I that I take that I use for for flying someplace, right? But I but I trust that it that it should perform according to uh, you know getting me there safely. Uh, but I would very much like the, the the service technicians, the pilots, and, and some of the, the the tech specialists to understand in detail everything about that uh, machine. And I think the same should be true of, uh, of data science and, and, and data and the, the, the machinations of, of algorithms. I certainly want somebody to actually be able to understand it at its core. I don't need to understand it, but but I need to to to, to trust the somebody to to do so then i'm thinking of uh, you know the apple card uh, problem where apple was scoring they were scoring uh, credit applicants differently based on gender which was of course a problem but the more interesting thing was they could not explain why the algorithm behaved that way nobody could like there was no data scientist no specialist at that group initially who could stand up and say hey 
the reason why it's going like this is exactly because of this. It sort of grew out of the conversation later on when they were doing some forensics on, on the data right that they came up with some you know, explain, explanation for that. But so um, I, I do think that we need to work towards explainability. I think we need to put it front and center. And I think we should think of it in terms of a, um, a hurdle to be overcome in order to achieve scale. So I don't think that we can scale out AI applications if we can't explain their workings, and we because we won't we won't trust them, and if we don't trust them, we won't use them. We may be exposed to them, but we won't embrace them, and we won't give them the buy-in that we would like to to get that uh, the benefits that they can provide. So I think it is a, a central problem for data science today and and for for business overall to address this topic, certainly. Right. Vivian, what are your thoughts on the matter? I'd like to be contrarian on it, but I think it's more important that you get your say in all this. <laughs> I think that the, the explainable AI technique that we have at the moment are already quite useful, not mm -hmm. only uh, to address ethical concerns, but also to uh, debug a model, for example, during uh, the training phase or when it's in production to provide some insights for the people using the predictions to make decisions. But at the same time, I think that the term explainable AI is quite misleading for many people because, in fact, the, the explanations that we get from these techniques are very basic uh, and are in no way comparable to the explanations that a human would give. So, for example, if you imagine a system that recognizes cats on a picture, a person would say, well, I see a four-legged animal, and I see the fur, and I see a tail, I see ears with a certain shape. So it would be a logical reasoning. But an AI system would just say, oh, these are the pixels that are that are contributing to my prediction. So it's it's very poor compared to what we could hope or expect. And it's uh, more analogical than logical, and it's based only on low level concepts like pixels and not the anatomy, anatomical parts of the animal, for example. So at the moment, it's very far from what we could hope in a perfect world. <clears throat> right. Let's, um, let's go to the next step um, in, in terms of how we can shape the policies with regards to these. I think it's important for us to have these conversations, but uh, Perhaps there are ambitions to be had as well. Uh, YOLO v4 was just released, and now YOLO v5 is on its way out as well. And its original inventor refused to work on it <clears throat> because of its prevalence in facial recognition solutions that are used in parts of the world where they're used for uh, less than good things. Is it OK to use this sort of technology, object detection, when we think it's for a good cause? Or should we perhaps forbid AI that could be used for bad things? What do you say, Patrick? Yeah, so, um, well, I guess defining, defining myself as an anarchist at heart, I think we should sort of uh, let the technology be used. But at the, at the same time, I'm certainly for regulations. I'm not for uh, bans. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it, it will be very difficult to sort of instill some kind of prohibition on possibility. If I look in, in the rearview mirror, I've never really seen prohibitive measures being fruitful in any great extent. I mean, you can take any topic, you know, alcohol prohibition in the 20s in the US or whatever, right? Well, cryptography is a good example when they tried to ban uh, very strong cryptographic algorithms in the US. Right, right. And now, they're, now, they're, now they want to ban TikTok and, you know, it's. I don't think that's that's a fruitful venue avenue of, of pursuit, but I, I do think that um, we we need to work uh, um, regulatory uh, initiatives. Uh, I mean, philosophically, you you could say that well, you know, technology is not good or bad; it's its use. And you know, the the NRA guys they are always pointing out that uh, you know, guns don't kill people; people kill people. Uh, and technology is sort of a bit like that. Technology is, you know, the gun or 
nuclear power or gene splicing or you know anything right it can be used for good or bad and i think prohibition is not the way forward but i do think that regulatory measures is the way forward and that brings us back to the to the challenge that we have in agreeing on what those regulations should be uh, i right. mean i know that similar similarly to to the the, the creator of yolo uh, ibm this summer wrote a letter to U.S. Congress stating explicitly that we will cease with any general purpose facial recognition uh, uh, technology. So we, will, we won't do that anymore simply because of the problems. And we haven't been able to see for ourselves how we can help those limitations be overcome. So IBM has said, well, you know, we step out of that. We, we certainly do um, visual recognition, specific purpose uh, technologies but not these general ones where we just allow people to well you know do whatever with it because right. of this because of that so um again i think uh no we we cannot uh you you cannot control through pro prohibition you can control through education and mm -hmm. an invitation to the table very few people will will have such a strong ideological foundation that they will disregard the uh, you know the improvement for themselves, for their loved ones, and from for everybody else. You really need to be a fanatic in some sense to just say, well, screw that, burn everything, and I want to use this for evil anyway. I mean, so I think it's much much better to, to try and get more people online, more people educated, more people fed, clothed, and you know, given healthcare. And then those people can then use technology the way they see fit. And my belief then is that then they will use it for better rather than for worse. But hey, I'm an idealist. So. I think we'll circle back to the notion that uh, an AI model can be a weapon in just a moment, you know, something that needs to be licensed out, perhaps, in a sense. Uh, Vivian, what, what is your take on this? Well, when it comes to the Yolo algorithm, it's an object detection algorithm. And of course, there are many legitimate and beneficial uses of object detection. For example, you cannot build an autonomous car without object detection it could be useful as well for medical diagnosis. So it wouldn't really make sense to try to forbid such a general purpose algorithm. But of course, as you mentioned, I think that uh, there are very strong concerns regarding uh, some applications, in particular, uh, facial recognition when it's used by authoritarian regimes. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a big concern. But I think that for this question, we need to make a distinction between the technology providers and the technology users. So if you are a technology provider, for example, if you provide um, like an API or uh, a pre-trained model or just the description of an algorithm in the paper, then once you provide this, uh, it could be used by um, malicious users for bad, with bad intentions. And then in a way you are partly responsible for this use. So I think it totally makes sense for IBM to be uh, very cautious with, the, with providing this technology. But if you are a user and if you are uh, thoughtful, cautious, uh, if you take time to think about the implications of your use of certain technology, there is no reason why you couldn't use this technology for legitimate purposes. Right. I think IBM has many reasons to think about whether or not they want to make those kinds of capabilities public. And a very high profile case was I, uh, a little while ago, OpenAI made a big splash when they refused to put out the weights of GPT-2, uh, likening it to a weapon that could be uh, used online to spread fake news and dangerous ideas on a massive scale. Now GPT-3 is coming out and it's going to be turned into a neat service that can be accessed via an API. Can we expect these companies to self-police or is regulation the right way or perhaps dissemination of the knowledge to sort of normalize the correct use of it? I mean, what is the right approach here? I take it, Patrick, that you feel IBM took the right decision in that circumstance, but what is the right way on a general scale? Right, so I my preferred way forward would be uh you know the the, the forward escape uh, mentality where you rather than than work defensively and prohibitively you work uh, forward leaningly and and make sure that you 
enable, empower, and make transparent as much technology as possible so that the the market, if you will, or the market dynamics can have these um, uh, the fallouts uh, align with you know some kind of a sense of of risk mitigation. So I think that we should we should empower people to to use technology in a judicial uh, way, and the way to do that is by making again technology transparent, explainable, uh, so that when users when when Anybody who uses technology does so may can make sure that that it is understood how how it has been used for what purpose it has been used what the what the underlying uh, you know reasons for using it are and the agenda and it, I think it circles back to you know the, the the GDPR and the data the rights to your own data and all of that I think as long as we make possible. Uh, um, a solid, you know, judgment on various aspects of the use of, of these technologies. Then it is much better to, again, you know, not not work defensively, but but seed possibilities to the greater community. So I I, I think that we should open up borders. I, I think we should, you know, take down barriers. I think we should increase transparency. And I think it's only when people are uh, reluctant to sort of show their cards that we should, you know, bring in maybe regulations. Uh, and I, I certainly think that grassroots movements or political uh, um, political work can sort of accelerate the adoption of regulation, but I think it is more sustainable for the community to self-regulate. Uh, right. But, but but as the community self-regulates, there's always the risk of, of misuse and abuse, perhaps to a greater extent than, than if you uh, bring regulations in. Um, so I, I wouldn't like to see a free for all, really. Uh, but uh, but I, but again, I think uh, better to 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 be open and in, invitational than to be defensive and prohibitive. Well, let's let's uh, continue on that thread for a moment. Then, if we if we and let's keep it practical and talk about GPT. I think um, one of the questions, perhaps, is how much of the onus of determining whether text is. Uh, uh, is made by a human or a machine, you could say it argues, uh, or it falls on the recipient. So somebody reading something online has to make a decision, is this something I can believe or not? Uh, should we be focusing on the receivers of AI uh, decisions and uh, uh, products or on the producers of AI products? What, what if we have maybe some kind of um, Digital signatures for everything. Uh, maybe that is solving it on one side. Well, uh, Pat, Vivian, where do you think uh, the the effort should be spent at, at the source or at the receiving side? I think at both at both sides. I would say because, well, for certain cases, I think it's practical and possible to uh, use regulation, but only for very specific applications. For example, for facial recognition. But it's true that in general you cannot regulate in a meaningful manner um, innovations more generally. Uh, so I think I think it's also up to the civil society, like the press, the public, uh, academics, to put pressure on these kind of organizations so that they don't do anything uh, reckless. Mm -hmm. But also, so it would be at the, at the source level. But also when it comes to the other side of the spectrum, I think that now that the cat is out of the box, we'll have to live in a world where we have all these powerful AI systems. That yes. is, and at the moment, when you see something in a video, you can more or less assume that it's authentic, more or less. And when you see a text that is well written, you can more or less assume that someone wrote it. Right. We'll be able to make this, these assumptions anymore. So we'll have to find other ways to consume information or to interact with each other. And well, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we'll need to find ways to be collectively more resilient. Some kind of decentralized way of, of determining trust, perhaps, a, a, a chain of trust, a blockchain, perhaps. 
Yeah, everything on a blockchain. <laughs> who knows? But, but what I was thinking, I think you're absolutely right, Vivian. We can't put the the, the cat back in the bag. Uh, th- that's that's not a possibility. We can't rein it in. We can't put the brakes on this. We can't go back to the rainforest and live, uh, you know, the naked ape paradise of the past. Uh, we can't. We're we're the technology creatures uh, par excellence. So so that's just the way it is. But I do think that um, we should put pressure on the individual recipient to 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 don't be an idiot, right? And and act uh, in a in a in a in a judge for in a, in, in, in a in a in a good, sane, solid, critical thinking, uh, open-minded way. But we need to put pressure on the providers to make that possible. So, for instance, I would like to be able to just call up. Uh, Google and say, hey, Google, I want to see me as you see me now. Can you just give me that? Like curate the, me, the way, all the data that you have that touches me, six degree separation, bring it forward and show it to me and I will tell you what I'm comfortable with and not. And before that, that ease is there. there there's sort of a power of information uh, that, that, is, that is unfortunate and it resides the way I see it, at the wrong end of that spectrum, recipient receiver, uh, recipient provider. Uh, so I think we need to, we need to make possible the end user capabilities for judicial use of technology. We cannot victimize ourselves to be, you know, the the victims of of the provider's services. I mean, I remember, remember before, you know, um, Netflix and the streaming services. If you wanted to consume mass media, you had to suffer through the, the, the commercial breaks. And there was no possibility of saying, hey, honestly, I don't, I don't want the commercial breaks. I'd be happy to pay for not having the commercial breaks. But now you can. Now you can watch you know, a movie on Netflix instead of, say, uh, some of the commercial channels. And you won't have re- uh, advertising during your, during your uh, enjoyment of whatever you're watching. And I think those types of technical capabilities need to be put in place for the user then to indicate in, in a classic market economy what is preferable. I, I'd like to commend you on saying that uh, everybody has a certain degree of responsibility and uh, uh, you know, putting it simply, you can't trust everything you read on the internet. It seems reasonable, um, but I don't want it either to be a cop-out to say that um, uh, it, it's anybody's fault. We, we all have a, a degree of responsibility in trying to use this technology in a good way. So let's spin this in another direction because I am respectful of the difference in scale of what this technology can do because when you talk about um, what Google knows about you, uh, you feel like it's reasonable to ask that of Google, but you might not feel that it's reasonable to ask that of me. Tell me everything you know about me and, uh, right? But it's different what Google can do that with that information in practice, and so it's only reasonable. But I think the amount of good that can be done with this technology is simply not talked about enough because a lot of people see the Terminator when they talk about AI. And so I'd like to hear some nice examples from you of what, where AI can be used in a good way. I do read about people that say that they're very comfortable with letting a computer make a decision because they're, they think that that computer has the potential, at least, to be less biased than a person sitting in a, in a booth. What are your thoughts on that? What do you say, Vivian? Well, for me, the two domains for which I'm the most uh, optimistic about the, the prospects of using AI for good is are the, um, the medical sector. Mm. And where the hope would be that uh, we would all be able to get a personalized uh, medical diagnosis, for example, even in the regions of the world which are currently not, um, we, which we do not have good uh, medical infrastructure. And the second domain would be for me education. So what we can see is that most of the educational systems are very uh, monolithic, like the, all, the, all the students are treated the same, but the hope with AI would be that we could have a personalized uh, curriculum and a personalized teacher for every single student. And it would be uh, a massive change compared to the system that we have now. I think that's a really nice message to end on because uh, we're very focused on our own issues 
And there are a lot of places in the world where this can have a massive impact and, uh, and do a lot of good. What about you, Patrick? What, what would you like to close on and the good that AI can do? Well, I think that I think AI can do a whole lot of good, uh, and I think it's already doing a whole lot of good. It's just not doing it enough, and it's not doing it broadly enough. So I think when people talk about uh, the promise of uh, democ democratization through uh, participation or availability of information, I think that's a, a goal worth pursuing. We want everybody online, all 10 billion people in 2100 or 2100. We want everybody online. We want everybody to have access to all the personalized biometrical uh, uh, capabilities of med tech. We want everybody to have access to the, the best personalized uh, recommendation engines on Netflix, but also, you know, when it comes to financial uh, uh, aspects and, and work, we want everybody to have access to everything. And, and I think that can only happen digitally. Like materially, that's not possible, right? I mean, we already have Earth Overshoot Day happening earlier and earlier every year. So everybody can't have the same material standards as everybody else. But perhaps we don't need to. So perhaps AI can be this frog leaping of, um, of, of uh, you know, future improvements that, that we can get at through going the digital route and then have that feedback into the material world that we live in so that we can get, you know, more optimized food chains, more optimized healthcare, better financial services uh, across the board for everybody so that we can actually you know, by using and leveraging the promise of AI, make sure that the material side of, of humans conducting themselves over time uh, to actually be sustainable for a long time, because that would be very interesting to me. I would love to have a sneak peek into a, into a, into a future that actually exists in 500 years. I mean, that would be mind-blowing, right? And 500 years is a long time. <laughs> yeah, it is, right? But we've been around for a couple of, you know, hundred thousands yeah the way we are now so i think why not be ambitious so why not say that put the measures in place that we so that we can use ai for the betterment of everybody i don't think that's a lofty goal i think that's a pursuit worth pursuing you know i agree so go for it and i think you are right by the way i think that we tend to talk a lot about the, the negative things the hurdles the problems and not you know the the great future that we could actually stand up. And I think that is unfortunate. And I think we should, we should uh, all, you know, try and bring forth positive energy into this domain because it is certainly needed. Excellent. Thank you guys for your perspective today. This has been uh, one of my favorite sessions so far. I hope the people watching enjoyed it and I will be seeing you at the next session. Thank you.
about expanding an uh, existing multi-year silicon carbide wafer supply. Uh, we're going to start by watching a video, so a nice and gentle start. It's a bit cheesy and a bit 80s, but I think a lot of the ideas are still, are still pretty valid. Okay. <laughs> Lift off of space shuttle. They've done studies, you know. 60% of the time, it works every time. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> Amazing. If you don't speak up, you'll agree. Uh, and we are all. Right. Welcome to Data Science, uh, <laughs> right? Welcome to Data Innovation Summit 2020. I'm here at another tech news session with a guest from Snowflake. Please feel free to introduce yourself. 
So hi everyone, uh, my name is Mats Stelval. I work as a senior sales engineer at Snowflake. So I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes to talk to you about, well, Snowflake as a data platform and show you what it can do. Uh, so let's... Awesome. So, yeah, so I... I have an introduction to Snowflake. Not everybody has, I think many people have heard the name. You guys sure, sure have had a presence at many of these events, but uh, maybe many people haven't had hands-on experience with it and know what, what's different about it. So please tell us. Yeah, so let, let me start off by uh, giving a, a short introduction presentation uh, so we all are on the same page in regards to uh, what Snowflake is. So I'm just going to show you a couple of slides, quick slides, um, just to set the scene. So Snowflake is a, what we call a cloud data platform. It's, it's built for the cloud and it lives in the cloud. Uh, it is uh, cloud agnostic, so we run in Google Cloud, Amazon, Azure, uh, and we can run across clouds so and regions in that sense. The focus we have is to manage your data and enable you to use that data uh, primarily around six different workloads, so uh, optimizing your data engineering tasks, your pipelines, uh, using your data in a data lake manner, using it as a data warehouse, supporting your data science, um, and allow you to build data applications on top of your data. And then we also have features and functions that I'm going to show how you can share your data and make it available through your organization, but also to third parties, and also how you easily can use third party data, which is a kind of an important part of, of your data management. And finally, just showing the architecture so to say what, what is unique about Snowflake. Uh, what does it, why does our customers and partners like us so much? Uh, and much of the secret sauce is in the architecture, how we are built up. So we have what we call centralized storage. We gather data, logical in databases, but we're utilizing the, the storage mechanisms of the underlying cloud we're using. Uh, and this is central. We store data only once. And on top of that, we have a compute layer. Now, a lot of uh, solutions talk about the separations of compute and data, and we have a true separation of that. That means we have different type of compute shapes we work with. We call them virtual data warehouses, but you can see it as instances or clusters you can run, and each of these clusters can run independently of each other against the same data. So what we manage with that is a kind of a separation of workloads, so you can do your ETL at the same time you do your BI and analysis, without affecting each other uh, when it comes to performance. And we can scale up, so we can you can grow up once you need more uh, power, but we can scale out as well to support concurrency usage. And on top of that, we have what we call our cloud services that is managing transactions, security, metadata. So what we manage with that is a kind of a separation of workloads, so you can do your ETL at the same time you do your BI and analysis without affecting each other uh, when it comes to performance. And we can scale up, so we can you can grow up once you need more uh, power, but we can scale out as well to support concurrency usage. And on top of that, we have what we call our cloud services that is managing transactions, security, metadata. So we capture metadata about all the data we have and the usage of the data, so we can, can use that in smart ways and also sharing and collaboration. So this is a very high level, quick introduction to what Snowflake is. But I, seeing is believing, right? Right. Uh, so let's see if I can manage to uh, show us uh, more about how Snowflake works. So what we have here is the standard interface you get. So Snowflake is a data, is a service. So you can see Snowflake as, a, as something like Salesforce or ServiceNow. So you don't need to do a lot of configuration when you start it. You get your account and you log in, and this is what you get. And, and within this, you have your databases. So as I said, this is the how we logical store da uh, gather data around. But it could be, you know, it's not just relational uh, data. It could be semi structured data as, as JSON and XML as well. And then we have the warehouses, which is our different types of compute that we work with. And I can have multiple of these, and you can see they have different sizes. So when I create an instance, I give it a name, and I and I gave it the size. And you can see this as since we all have T-shirts, T-shirt sizes. 
so we have everything from extra small to four times large. And for every uh, size, we double the capacity uh, of what we can do. And I can grow this up and down uh, instantly if I want to. And I also set it up for clustering so uh, to handle concurrency. So the bigger the instance get, the, we don't get more concurrency. We get, just get more power to crunch data. So if we want to have concurrency, we need to have scale out and uh, have more instances to work with. So we can work with that with clusters. So we can have up to 1 to 10, and we can automatically scale this. So once it gets more queries, it will spin up additional clusters for me. Can I ask a question? You, you mentioned that you can both scale up and scale out. Is it equal? And then uh, with many vendors, um, it can oftentimes be easier to scale uh, upwards but not downwards, or outwards but not inwards. So um, given that this is a, a nice opportunity for cost uh, efficiency, you know, being able to scale out and back, is it equally easy to scale back if you know you've done some um, end of the year calculation and then you want to scale back after all that's done? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, it's a good question. And, and this is this is something that is built from start. This was the focus. Since this is cloud, as you said, uh, we want to be effective and we want to be cost effective. So you can scale up easily. It's just a command to say, well, scale, change the shape. But it's the same command to say, well, change it back to a smaller uh, size. So you can do you that quickly. You don't quick have to reshuffle data and do like a long process to be able to scale out and scale back? Yeah. So uh, and and the scale out is the same. So if if it uh, I set it up and I have a policy in how it's going to be scaling out, uh, the standard policy is once it's starting to queue queries, is it will run more clusters, and then once these queries run out, it will scale down uh, automatically for me to my original what I say the minimum clusters I want to have for this. But we also have features like auto suspend, which is also important to say well if this Compute the instant compute is not used for 10 minutes, shut it down. Right. Automatically. But also, if I send queries against it, start it for me automatically. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't need to do this all, all admin. You know, you go in, shut it down. And then I realize, okay, I want to run some reporting. I have to start it again and, and remember to shut it down. We, we take care of this automatically. And I'm, I mean, during times like these with Corona and everything, when people are downsizing, our customer love this feature. And so we can see that they they can stop using and don't have to pay for it, which is great in these type of things. But you don't also have to be afraid that you have something big running uh, and, and you forget about it. So let's just work more practical. I, I have loaded some data uh, today in a database. But you can also see here rather quickly is to say, well, this is how I scale scale up to say, well, set the warehouse size to large. Then I have a command here where I load the data. I already done that. And then I scale it down directly afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that's all I need to do. So I preloaded about uh, 100 million rows for us. This is um, city bike data. So the bike sharing organization in New York, they, they make their data public available. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can download it and use it. Uh, so we have. Some basic data around trips, so you can see that uh, how long took the trip, when did it start, when did it stop, what is the starting station, the end station, the bike ID, and so on and so forth. And of course, we can analyze the data. We, I mean, we speak SQL, so everything is 100% SQL. However, one of the challenges for me is I'm a kind of a visual guy, so. <laughs> Uh, for me to look at data in this way in Tabular is, 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 is making life a little bit hard for me to understand if this is good, how is the distribution and so. So we're talking about new things in Snowflake. So something we released recently and, and is rolling out now is uh, a new interface called SnowSight. And SnowSight is a more visual interface that I can work with what we call worksheets. Uh, I still write SQL. Uh, the, the difference is that I get out the suggestions, mm -hmm. so I don't need to be uh, fluent in SQL in order to write things. It also keeps track of, you know, my 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 databases and my tables I have access to, to. So I also can get these type of things for me, and I can then run that and get get some answer. Mm -hmm. uh, however, 
when I do my analysis or my data understanding, I want to know a little bit more of my data. So we we can run queries uh, and we will get the result as we see. We also provide some additional statistics in this that helps you to see well, what is the distribution of my data uh, based on the data set I, I, I got the return for. Okay. Uh, and we can basically quickly select part of this data. Now, one thing that I like with this is that we once we retrieve the data the first time, we don't go out and ask for it when I do these type of selections. We're using the same cache data. So we actually don't use my compute resources. Right. So there's no charges uh, for me when I'm doing this. So if you've already filtered it, you don't have to filter it again to do an additional query on the filtered data. Yeah. So so when I'm using these type of filtering, mm -hmm. uh, so I can clear my selections. So I can download it here as a CSV. Mm -hmm. But maybe what is more interesting is also we provide charting capabilities. So in the same way as some of the notebook GUIs like Zeppelin is doing, uh, I can use uh, charting here. So it gives me a, a, a line chart, for example. Uh, we we don't have that many. We have a number of the more commonly used, like bar and scatter and heat grid and scorecarding type of charting. But it also allows me to interact with it. So I can say, well, I want to do instead of a sum, I can do an average. Uh, and once again, it doesn't recollect data. It's using the same result. It's doing, it doing everything on the cache for me. I can even also change the way how I'm bucketing the data. So it sees that my data for, for example, the start day is a daytime, and then it gives me possibility to say, well, I want to watch this on a month level instead, and I can do this. Once again, we don't collect new data. We're using the same result as you have. Uh, and we can see, and I can get some information. I can see that it's a highly seasonality on this data. I can see that there's a increasing trend until we were hit by by Corona uh, and everything goes down. But for some, it seems like in New York, they are starting to relax and using bikes again. So it's uh, it's uh, on the way up. And another part of this is uh, I can combine these worksheets and what we call dashboards. So if I want to run, have a more combined picture of this, I can, I can do the same thing. So this is just worksheets that I'm combining here and, and putting together. Uh, and I can share this within my organization with people uh, using the link so they can go in. Now, this is this doesn't have all the capabilities that you would find in Tableau and, and these type of tools. But it, it, it's really helpful to get a start and understanding of the data before you decide to do your BI tools or, or something else on top of it. Right. Uh, let me ask, I really like the, the notion that you had uh, t-shirt sizes when it came to um, the, the nodes. Uh, that um, analogy is cool. Uh, are the t-shirt sizes uh, the same no matter what cloud you're on so that you yeah. have a, sort of a snowflake t-shirt size? And that's, that's sort of nice. That makes it easy to, <clears throat> to talk about them. I'm curious, you know, now you're making queries and it's redrawing things and it's sort of interactive. I think that's a, an important... Uh, uh, function in a tool that a data scientist uses, so you don't have to run a query and then come back 15 minutes later and hopefully what you intended comes out. You know, there needs to be a level of interactivity. Yeah. How should people be thinking about t-shirt sizes and uh, the amount of data uh, that they have in order to get a level of interactivity that's uh, fun to work with? So you, you said, I, I suppose this is the 100 million row data sets. Yeah. What kind of things should people keep in mind? What kind of data sets can uh, Snowflake handle comfortably? Oh, uh, the sky is the limit, I, I would say. I mean, I, I think when it comes to sizing, it, it, it is always, the, the as you said, how, how the level of interactivity you need. So how quick do I need to have my results back versus, well, what is the cost for that? Because, I mean, you, you consume compute, so you pay for usage. We, we charge by the second. Uh, so if you use it for 13 seconds, you pay for 13 seconds. If you use it for five minutes, you will pay for five minutes. Uh, so you have to take that into consideration. But I mean, if, if it's uh, something you need to do quickly, well, then you might need to want to have a bigger size. But I'm doing this on a, on a small size uh, warehouse. So I'm not using a very big one. It's, it, the way we, how we store data and distribute data makes it very efficient in selecting data. I'm, I'm not, you, we're not, you, you don't create indexes either as a user for this. Okay. It, 
compromise it's it's by itself so, so you kind of have to test your way through mm -hmm. uh, for example, I, when I loaded this data, I was using a large instance, and it took me about 10 seconds to load 100 million rows. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's very efficient. Uh, and of course, then you have with the cluster size, it depends on the concurrency uh, you need to have, how right. many users are going to do this at the same time. But we also have functionality within this <laughs> within this UI, so I can I can set it up to say that that I want to have it. Um, to do notifications. Mm -hmm. So if I have long running queries and I, I don't want to have them fast, it, it, it is okay. It takes me five minutes to crunch this 10 minutes. It can it, it can interact uh, with Chrome to give me a notification once the query is finished. So I get an, an alert in my browser that now is the query finished. I can go back. So we also provide functionality for that in, in that sense. So so this is this is a, a little bit quick run run the dashboarding and, and that type of functionality we have. I, we were looking at you know trips data, and it would be nice to be able to combine that with third party data like weather because there's probably some correlation and causation between the type of weather we have and how many bike bike rides is going to be be done. So what we have in Snowflake, we we recently launched something called the data marketplace. And the data marketplace is a way for you to get third party data. So different organizations and companies can publish data here uh, that I can use together with my, my own data. Uh, so, so you have within different types of, of uh, data, like demographic data, we can have some government data, uh, and so on and so forth. We have, for example, in this case, we have weather data. So if I were interesting to use my trips data with some additional weather data, I don't have to go out and grab that data for myself, scrape or using API. I can go into the marketplace and I can I can find it and say, well, there's a weather source here that has global weather data. Uh, it gives me example how I can use it. And I can just click on get data um, to get it and, and use it. But it doesn't copy data. It just enables me to use the data. Right. And I suppose you have internal enterprise uh, data stores as well so that you can both um, import public data sets and your corporate data sets. Yeah, but you don't import it. And I'm going to show you later on how you use it because, okay. because that, it doesn't move. I mean, you should, other types of data marketplaces that are out there, they have APIs that you have to call to grab the data. Mm -hmm. But the problem is once the data leaves the marketplace, it, it is as it is, and you have to grab it again to update it. In this way, this is just going to work as a, as a regular database that you have in your Snowflake account. So if the provider updates, your data, the data you use is automatically updated as well because you're using the same data. I see. Uh, so, so you don't have that. You don't have to move it around. You don't have to pay for that storage either because it's not stored on you. Right. And this data is available in a different way. It could be free data, but it can also be subscribed data. So mm -hmm. me, I as an organization, if I have interesting data that I want to monetize, I can use this function to be a provider to say, I want to sell this uh, to others uh, to use. Right. So, so this is a good way. But we also provide as part of this a way for you to share this in more of a private manner, because everything, if you get a provider on the data marketplace, it's globally available. Everybody that has a Snowflake account can see it and, and can use it or subscribe to it. So we also have something we call the data exchange. And the data exchange is a way for me to privately share data uh, within the organization or with my customers, suppliers, or, or anyone else I want to do. So for example, within Snowflake, in the pre sales community, we share data with each other. So example, the demo I'm showing you, the city bike, all the assets for that is shared. Mm -hmm. uh, and we right. also provide internally weather data. So I can go here and say, I want to use this weather data uh, mm -hmm. because it's already prepped for me. And same as the as the marketplace, I say, well, get data. I want to say have it as a called it weather in my instance or in my Snowflake account. I, I need to accept the terms. And now I can create uh, I have created this as a database, but physically I haven't moved anything. The only thing I make this is is, is logical available for me. Right. So I have now a new database. So if I go back to my original uh, GUI and I do a refresh, I can see I have 
suddenly I have a web a database that says weather. It has a little bit arrow, and the arrow says to me, this is a share. Right. So this data is not local. It, it is outside, outside, but I can access it as, as normal data. So if I want to um, query it, I can do it quite easily. So I'm just going to set some context. So I'm using the right roles, and I'm using the right warehouse around this. Uh, <clears throat> and give it some rights. So if I select from this, this is the, that my, my weather share. So I just select from it. So we can see here's the weather data. I have temperatures. I have uh, if it's rain, how much rain it is. Everything is in Fahrenheit and inches. Is this American? And, and we're in Europe, so we want to do Celsius. Uh, so I can use this data the same way I use my database data, so I can create a view on it. <clears throat> uh, so now where I do my uh, conversions, so I can convert this to, to millimeters and I can convert this to, to uh, Celsius degrees and I can work with this view. So the view is now stored locally for me, so nobody else sees this view, but it's using the same data and I can actually combine it with my own with my own data, so I can join this with the trips data I have that is locally stored for me, uh, with the weather data that is stored outside my account. So we now com combine this third-party data with, with additional data, uh, with our own data, easily without having to move data. Mm -hmm. So once I, I get more trips and they get more weather data for each new day, this will be I will see those changes immediately. So it doesn't. I don't need to create some kind of pipeline to reload or update my from my external source. So if I was scraping weather data by myself or buying it from 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 a weather provider, uh, I would call an API every day to get the new weather data. But this, as soon as the provider has updated, it is updated for me. Right. Uh, in the same way, if I share internally or I share with other organization, if I say, well, let's share my trips data, if I update it, it will go through. To, to all others. That's pretty neat how by design it sort of facilitates these, uh, these processes and data pipelines just by the virtue of how Snowflake is designed. Does that mean that Snowflake is uh, uh, main strength is in OLAP um, processing or is there OLTP capabilities sort of in the background? What would you see as its main strength? The main strength is, is OLAP. Uh, that, that is where we have started and, and what, what we've been focusing on currently. But of course, who knows what's in the future, but, but that is where, where we have the strengths now in analyzing vast amounts of data uh, and using it in, in various ways. That is what our customer is using it for. Okay, so for like the C-level decision makers now, um, what would you say is the standout feature of Snowflake? I think you, you know, we can talk about uh, uh, neat schemas and uh, neat user-defined functions and whatnot, but uh, if you want to summarize it for the C-level people, what would you say is a standout feature, the, the one-liner? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I think one thing that, that C-level likes is just this uh, data sharing, the data monetization. That is something right. that, that I find very interesting in how we can make data available for others. We have. We have customers like Cisco that that is provide data for their for their suppliers in in this way, um, and using that. But also the, the around how you pay for what you use. So right. we, we truly just charge you for for usage. Uh, you have a fee for your storage, which is basically a flat fee based on whatever the cloud provider is charging you. Mm -hmm. So it's about, let uh, on an average, about $23 per terabyte per month. So that is the fixed cost you have. And then we charge you by second for the compute. Right. So Cinema loves that, that you have, I mean, you only pay for what you use. Uh, that means that if we have downsizing times, like we have now, and we send home half the stuff for almost everyone, and we have no, nobody's using this, well, it doesn't cost anything else than storage. So that is something that they like a lot of this. It is also, I mean, how easy it is to use. Just load the data and start querying. So I don't have to set up things. I don't have to maintain or optimize and doing these type of things. So you get started rather quickly and you can grow as you go in that sense. I think that is 
something that appeals them a lot. Uh, it doesn't take six months uh, to get something running. Uh, you do it in, in hours and days instead. Nice. All right. Well, that was a really neat introduction. I feel like I've learned more about Snowflake, and I hope the audience took notes while you were presenting today. Thank you very much for your time, and um, please feel free um, to contact Snowflake if you have any more questions about what was uh, uh, shown today, and I will be seeing you at the next session. Our appetite for data has never been bigger, but connecting data across an organization can be a daunting task. As the dynamics of your data change within your organization, so does the complexity you face when trying to deliver value from data at the pace your business requires. All too often, the solution leads to a complex data architecture where you spend more time managing infrastructure at the expense of finding untapped potential within your data. Snowflake allows you to build a modern data architecture with our leading cloud data platform that eliminates the complexity, cost, and constraints inherent with other approaches. Available as a service on leading cloud providers, Snowflake eliminates architectural complexity so you can run many workloads with the elasticity, performance, and scale required by the modern enterprise. What makes Snowflake unique? In one word, architecture. Built entirely from the ground up for the cloud, Snowflake's architecture is comprised of centralized storage for virtually unlimited amounts of structured and semi-structured data, multi-cluster compute for running multiple workloads without resource contention, cloud services to automate common administration, security, and database tasks, and a cloud agnostic layer to deliver a consistent experience across cloud regions and providers. This unique architecture makes Snowflake applicable to a wide range of workloads, including Data engineering by leveraging Snowflake's ability to streamline data ingestion and integration as a data lake by using Snowflake as your data lake or alongside an existing one for data warehousing with unlimited performance and concurrency to streamline data science to simplify and drive performance for complex workloads for building data intensive applications that require an analytics workhorse at their core and streamlined data sharing between consumers and providers. Thousands of companies including McKesson, Instacart, Square, Caterpillar, and many more are seeing performance, scale, and productivity gains utilizing the Snowflake cloud data platform. Snowflake has over one exabyte of data under management, and hundreds of thousands of users execute hundreds of millions of workloads every day. The next step should be an in-depth conversation with you to help us understand where you would like to go and how Snowflake could enable you to get there. Tableau Desktop helps you see the stories in your data. It's visual analytics anyone can use. Drag and drop to find trends and outliers. Effortlessly drill into your data and use quick table calcs like running total to see the bigger picture. Connect to the data you care about, whether it's a spreadsheet, database, or big data. Access data warehouses, cloud applications, and cloud databases from a single application. Mix and match from different sources. Tableau brings all your data together in one simple view. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. In this view, we can easily spot underperforming products. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Change your perspective to discover something new. With a click, the scatter plot transforms into a tree map, highlighting that Western Asia has several unprofitable regions. 
Use drag and drop forecasts to spot trends, identify opportunities, and ask questions like, will I sell more next year? Add calculations to extend your data. Transform your data into powerful interactive dashboards. Then customize them for different devices. Share your analysis securely on Tableau Online or Tableau Server. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau makes analyzing data fast, easy, and beautiful for everyone. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Tableau. Answer questions at the speed of thought. This is One Minute AI with Robert. I want to tell you why there's a difference between people that are good at math and people that are good at computer science. The fact of the matter is that you're going to deploy all your solutions on computers, not on people. And deploying uh, a machine learning solution on two computers, on 10 computers, is a computer science problem. If you ask a statistician how to do a numerically stable uh, computation of the variance of a data set across 10 computers, they won't be able to answer that question. If you want to deploy things in production, you're going to need computer experts. So don't go and hire 20 PhDs to solve papers for you. Start by building up a competence center that has a varied skill set. Trifacta empowers everyone to prepare messy and diverse data faster. It's a data preparation platform built for the speed of modern business. Start with a flow where the elements of your data preparation project are managed. Add new data to a flow by connecting to a source or dropping in a file. Trifacta presents your data visually for intuitive exploration easily spot patterns or data quality issues that may need to be addressed. Preparing data in Trifacta is interactive. Immediately see how a potential transformation will impact your data to ensure you're making the right choice. In this case, we've standardized a date format. With each interaction, Trifacta offers an intelligent suggestion to guide you on how best to clean and structure your data. Use the toolbar to kick off common tasks, such as joining two data sets. Trifacta guides you to select the right common keys and how best to execute the join. All of these transformations are automatically tracked as part of your recipe. When you're finished, click Run Job. Schedule workflows to run on a regular basis for repeated production use. Publish your output to any file format, database, or application for broader use. With Trifacta, you can bring together more data faster, whether you need to prepare data for analytics, machine learning, or standard reporting. So what data do you need to wrangle? Get started with Trifacta today.
Hello Sweden, hello Nordics. I hope you are doing good and make the best out of these challenging times. Well, I'm currently driving my car to the office and as we unfortunately missed the chance to meet face to face, sit down and discuss, even shake hands, I still want this session to be as real as possible. So this is why you see me currently driving my car. Now I can imagine that some of us currently miss driving their cars more than others just because to meet customers, going to partners or even meeting colleagues in the office to drink coffee or you know friends and family. And that brings me to the topic of today's session. This is why we are all here and this is to discuss what's the single source of any real solution in the future world. It's data. And we are here to discuss what's the possibilities of data, how can it help innovate and how do we really overcome a really complex data project. And did you know that while I'm driving my car today, a future car slash AI driven car is producing 100 terabytes of data. So a future car is really a data driven car. And every pre-work shopping leaves the data trail in so many different IT systems. Like the CRM of the retailer, the ERP for money flow, or credit card company, or next gen payments like Apple Pay. Think about the demand system to predict next week's demand of procurement of goods. And this is just the structured data. Imagine the unstructured data like camera feeds, photos, local social media data, customer behavior or the shopping flow to actually indicate fraud like fishy activities. And at Fujitsu, while we ship our great products across Europe to customers, partners, our employees, every single product leaves a data trail inside all the relevant factory IT systems. So think about the components coming from the US or the OEM from Asia until it's then really finally assembled in Europe, at our site or at our channel partners. Until it's finally unboxed. This one's from Japan, it's the Fujitsu PC Lifebook. That's the laptop! What? Tiny and light. Managing this complex supply chain, we have set ourselves a common target. Now think about starting with demand, engineering and production, we want to become data driven. So this is why we've just launched the data-driven transformation strategy. And that's a strategy not just relying on how we tackle challenges, but also how we really make sure we use any given opportunity. And we want to make sure that we walk the talk, which means we transform ourselves at the same time we are offering the same service to you. We want to make you more data-driven. And surely we have all common targets like improving the customer experience, de-risking the operations and obviously also thrive for better business performance. And we have got proof. So we have made a data maturity survey which clearly showed that there is a dependency between business performance and data driven. So you may ask why us? Why Fujitsu as your partner of choice when it comes to your data challenge? Well, it's not only us. We don't just rely on our strength. We rely on any strength. 
Building the ecosystem of tomorrow is in the core of our data-driven transformation strategy. Us is not just Fujitsu anymore. Us means you, her, him or existing relationships to our great 30,000 partners in Europe. Our existing ecosystem like NVIDIA, Splunk, Nutanix, Microsoft, VMware, AWS, Intel, NetApp, Fikudos, Xterra and so on and we like them all. And now we are even looking forward to extend it because we want to be the one player who is able to identify the seven partners which are required to build the data driven solution. And data challenges are really complex projects. So it requires more than just one subject matter expert or one software to deploy or even one platform. It requires a whole bunch of people and expertise. Our data-driven transformation journey is underpinned by the human-centric design process and it's covering it all. It starts with defining the de desired business outcome and it ends with finishing the data-driven project. On the basis, we will bring together industry known experts in data, unbiased choice of technology of us and partners. So here's a quick overview of just our recent launches to underpin our target customer experience. So in the last three months, we are really proud of various launches like the new discovery services to optimize hybrid IT estates. Think about your SAP environment as an example where we can achieve double digit ROIs or even, you know, start with how to implement your data strategy. We actually launched the whole new strategy in not just a month ago or so. We further extended the partnership with NetApp. The world leading data company. We expanded our storage portfolio to even focus further on software defined solutions to build the right base for any data. So we surveyed our global customers to really look into what effects digital transformation and data driven transformation has on society. We then built the fastest supercomputer in the world and this is now up and running help solving the global pandemic. And soon we will launch the latest generation of Primacy GX, a system fully optimized for workloads like AI and HPC. And in addition, watch out for Fujitsu Uscale. Uscale will be our brand when it comes to consumption based IT. So in short, we are bringing it all to you in one place. We bring the process, we bring the data consultants and to bring the ecosystem or even extend the ecosystem just for your solution. So I can really just encourage you to work with us on your individual data challenge. And please watch Judo Würz, our very own AI expert who is really available here today at the online data innovation summit talking about our data-driven platform, which is already live today. And he's giving you a live demo of this platform. So he is one of the data consultants working with you on your individual solution. So wondering how to start? Well, it's easy. Just contact us and I am looking forward to meet you. The core of every digitalization project is the management of data. This is a complex process of exploring, creating, protecting and monetizing data. Fujitsu supports you end to end in this journey and augments its own expertise by leveraging its network of partners. In a unique co-creation approach, Fujitsu masters your data journey. Hello Sweden, hello Nordics. I hope you are doing good and make the best out of the
Customers are forcing businesses to transform. They want to engage on their own terms and seamlessly navigate through digital and in-person touch points. But above all, customers want to be recognized, to be known. Not tomorrow or next week, but in real time. Unfortunately, most businesses can't deliver. Please hold while I check five different systems to understand your relationship with us. Sound familiar? It's time for you to get to know your customers and to reimagine a customer experience built on connected customer data. Reltio Connected Customer 360 powers all your touch points with rich profiles that are continuously updated in real time. The Reltio platform connects the dots of siloed customer data scattered across all your applications. You can manage billions of trusted customer profiles packed with thousands of searchable attributes, including transactions, interactions, and third-party data. You can unlock the power of relationships between people, products, organizations, and locations. You can drive hyper-personalization and support connected interactions with real-time insights across all touch points, all while simplifying compliance with privacy laws, consent, and communication preferences. You can use inside-ready data to power machine learning and AI investments and bring big ideas to life. Reimagine customer experience for the future. Deliver it with Reltio. Customers. Hi. It has been five years since we first met. We had ambitions then. We were curious. We were excited. We were afraid. We wanted to demystify data innovation, understand what advanced analytics is, and how data science can help our business. Make management believe in the potential to invest in people and tech. Change the way we work. Change the world. We started learning and became explorers. We started sailing the sea of data and became navigators. We started experimenting and became scientists. We started sharing our knowledge and became their legends. Welcome to the new decade. Are you with me? I work as a data scientist in AstraZeneca and my team is basically an internal consultancy which we work with in AstraZeneca and um, our primary job role is to look at the data, derive insights from it, um, advise and suggest strategies which uh, will help AstraZeneca invest and uh, also spend smartly. Data and science, they both are at the heart of AstraZeneca and AstraZeneca being a scientific company uh, understands how valuable data is. AstraZeneca started to apply data science and AI across multiple functions and um, our transformation programs are data focused and data science driven. Our data scientists sit very closely with business and they try to scope and influence the projects and I think that is the major strength AstraZeneca has in data science and AI. In my opinion, AstraZeneca is one of the world's most exciting biopharmaceutical companies because in the recent years it has fully embraced artificial intelligence and data science across its R&D and operations. The most exciting part of my job is its impact because the drug development and discovery process can take a very long time and can be very complex. So AI and data science in particular have the potential impact in reducing this time and complexity and therefore deliver a real impact. The drug development and discovery process involves dealing with enormous amounts of heterogeneous data. Knowledge graphs can help us obtain this data by integrating them together and in supporting us deriving new insights from the graph. What made me choose AstraZeneca 
was first and foremost its mission. AstraZeneca has a clear mission of delivering life-changing medication to millions of patients every day. Another reason why I chose AstraZeneca was that AstraZeneca continuously reinvests itself and currently it's investing heavily in expanding its AI and data science capabilities. AstraZeneca is a great place to do data science and AI because of the volumes of data that we've got, the complexity of data we've got, and the use cases that we have to address here. And we can see that adding value to patients' lives and adding value to the organisation. AstraZeneca's vision for data science and AI stretches across the whole organisation. It's enterprise-wide. It's not silo. The aim is to break down old silos and to give us insights across the whole of the enterprise. Within AstraZeneca, I can see the future of data science and AI being all about connecting data sets, about taking disparate data sets from across the organisation and bringing them together with powerful data science techniques to provide cutting edge innovative insights to accelerate drug discovery, to give us insights and about our finance processes, to start predicting behaviours and to start prescribing interventions and outcomes through all of our business processes. I think that AstraZeneca is an appealing place for a data engineer to work just because of the volume of data we've got, petabytes we're processing regularly, the complexity of the use cases that we've got, the value of the use cases to patients' lives, the technology we're using, we're in the cloud totally, we're a cloud-first organisation, the people that are here, they're clever, they're nice, smart, trusting people and it's a great team to come and work with. Hi Nick, uh, it's, a, it's our pleasure to have you as the key uh, keynote speaker at the Data Innovation Summit. Uh, to begin with, uh, please tell us a bit more about yourself for our viewers and the type of work that you do. Sure, so basically I'm an independent uh, consultant and educator. Probably about 70% of my work is online, uh, well now online training, <laughs> uh, as with everyone else. Uh, I was doing many in-person workshops per year uh, before. 
uh, specializing, like I said, in data visualization and uh, information dashboard design uh, specifically. And then about 30% of my work uh, roughly is, is consulting. So I've designed dashboards for about uh, over 50 large organizations, for example, uh, and I've consulted with, with many other clients as well. Great. Uh, so the next question is connected actually to the um, online uh, workshop stuff that, that you do. Um, when you teach a dashboard design training uh, workshops, um, what would you say are the most common challenges that dashboard designers raise uh, in your workshops? Yeah, they're, it's interesting because they're remarkably similar from one organization right. to the next. Uh, you know, like I said, I've consulted for over 50 uh, organizations. I've taught far more than that. I've mm -hmm. kind of lost count at this point. Uh, and yet the, the, the challenges that people report are all uh, incredibly similar. You know, people, the, the, the audience doesn't know what they want. They ask for too much information on the dashboard or there's not enough information on, on the dashboard um, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, you know, how do I make this so somebody can take, or can take a screenshot of it or print it and it's still going to make sense. Uh, and so, uh, like I said, you know, there's an incredibly, uh, people think that their organizations are always unique in terms of their dashboard challenges, but I, I can tell you that 99% chance they are not. Everybody is struggling common. with mm -hmm. this and it's been going on for probably more than 30 years, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's go back to your uh, Data Innovation Summit presentation uh, to connect mm -hmm. it with the topic. Uh, your topic presentation will focus on the real reasons why so many dashboards disappoint users. Uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, despite the fact that books and courses on, on information dash dashboard design have been avail available for years, many dashboards still end up disappointing users and organizations. Um, so why do you think this happens? Um, I think, the, I mean, there's certainly a, you know, a combination of reasons. Uh, a big one, though, is in terms of how people typically try to solve uh, the user satisfaction problem, right? Because as I mentioned, the user satisfaction is typically very low. And oftentimes, people will really focus on sort of the visual aspect, right? They'll try changing the colors uh, or maybe changing the chart types or the, the layout of, of the dashboard. But in my experience, this rarely works. Usually, the problems are much more fundamental, in terms of, for example, how the information is organized onto different types of displays. And so basically getting the right information in front of the right people at the right time. And so those types of more fundamental problems are not gonna be solved through the more sort of visual cosmetic part. I mean, that matters, right? Graphic yeah, design course, and color yeah. selection, those are important, but I don't think that that's why dashboards fail. Um, ultimately they fail typically because they're simply not, uh, not very useful to users. They just don't answer the questions that they have um, too many clicks uh, to actually get to the information they need if it is actually there. And so most of what I talk about in my workshops is more around essentially information organization, how to mm -hmm. organize information mm -hmm. onto mm -hmm. different types of displays. Yeah. Okay. To make it more uh, useful for the users. Um, what our views, uh, viewers will find, uh, I think, interesting uh, is that you're the author of the upcoming book, Practical Dashboards, uh, which uh, summarizes uh, your rich experience uh, designing dash for, dashboards for over 50 large organizations. Um, so could you tell us what is the message uh, in the book and uh, what you, uh, you expect readers to take away from it? Sure. Yeah, so um, kind of like we were just uh, talking about really, like I said, after seeing so many organizations struggle with dashboards, I found that the challenge is really around how the information is organized. And so probably about 80% of the book and the workshop, which I started teaching uh, as well, is really about that, is about mm -hmm. how do we organize information onto different types of displays. And so the course, both the course and the book are really centered around essentially a taxonomy of 13 different types of displays, which unfortunately everybody calls dashboards. They're not everybody, but certainly most people. And yet, when you kind of look at them through that lens, you really see that a display, for example, um, that's going to be used uh, in a sales pitch to persuade somebody, and it's got slick graphic design, and they call that a dashboard because it has several charts on it, really has little in common with something like, for example, a status monitoring display for a frontline worker. Uh, you know, the, the best practices, the design principles, you know, there's, there's a, almost no overlap. And so I think that's why there's been a lot of struggle in terms of as, you know, as an industry, when we try to talk about dashboard design best mm. practices, we're talking about all these really different types of displays. And so I'm trying to basically bring uh, some, some segmentation to that and say, let's talk about best practices for specific types 
right. of displays, which people call dashboards. And then they're, they're quite different from one type to another. Right. I believe our audience will find it really useful and helpful <laughs> if they get a chance to read it. And uh, one last question, Nick. Uh, what's your advice for companies just starting out with dashboards? Um, what key points they should take into cons consideration? Yeah, thing. well, I guess kind of maybe to summarize uh, some of the points that we talked about, um, you know, like basically don't uh, don't sort of have the knee jerk reaction of trying to fix dashboards strictly through essentially cosmetic mm -hmm. or, or purely visual means. You need to look deeper. Um, and so uh, it took me a long time to figure this out. <laughs> um, and oftentimes that's what people expect me to do when they bring me in as a consultant, right? Is I'm going yeah. to make the dashboard prettier or I'm going to change the colors or something. I'm like, no, 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 we need to go way deeper because you have, for example, one dashboard that's trying to do like six completely different things for like three totally different audiences. Let's start it's there, right? Yeah. We, need, we need more than one dashboard. Yeah. Otherwise we end up with what I call Swiss army knife dashboards mm -hmm. because they're basically dashboards that try and do everything, right? They have all these tools built in, but none of the tools are actually very good, right? Like, is it a, does a Swiss army knife has a, you know, does it have a good saw? or a good magnifying glass or a good compass? No, they're terrible, right? It's just because you tried to jam them all together. And so really the starting point is, is again, how do we break this apart into multiple displays that are gonna be purpose specific and do a better job of meeting the user's needs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, great to hear, interesting. Um, Thank you. This was the last question uh, for this interview session. So uh, I would like to thank you for doing this interview with us and for being with us at the Data Innovation Summit. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun and I'm really looking forward to participating uh, in the summit uh, in August. Hello everyone and welcome back to one of the most exciting tech sessions that I'm really pleased to present to you. I'm here with uh, Todd from OmniSci. Please introduce yourself and OmniSci. Hey Robert, good to be with you and thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, I'm Todd Mostek, co-founder and CEO of OmniSci. Some people may for know us as formerly MathD. In a past life we were MathD, same company, same product, just changed our name. Uh, yeah, been uh, going at this for some time. Uh, OmniSci slash MathD started out in my grad school research at Harvard and then MIT, and then spun it off as a company in late 2013. Um, we moved out from the Cambridge, Boston area in Mass to California early on. And uh, now we're about 100 people focusing on accelerating big data analytics with the power of modern hardware, um, GPU and CPU. Can you expand a little bit on what modern hardware is? Because that it plays a pretty key role in what OmniSci does. Right, yeah, no, so I think there's been a tectonic shift on in terms of hardware architectures, particularly a move towards parallelism. So if you think about it, if you go back into the 90s or early 2000s, people thought, you know, we were just going to speed up the, the single core of that processors had back then, we're going to speed it up through three, four, five, six, ten 10 gigahertz, right? And we would just get our gains as we reduce the transistor size, we would get frequency gains and all was going to be great. Well, you know, we hit a little bit of a speed bump there, um, no pun intended, where basically they realized that there was a, a power wall and a heat wall where they couldn't scale the frequency anymore without tremendous, um, you know, uh, power and, and heat uh, overloads. And so they started going in parallel, right? You saw CPU, CPUs get multiple cores. 
And then eventually you saw these things called GPUs, uh, which were originally designed to power video games, of course, that took a different approach of having many, many cores instead of one or a few fast cores to basically process graphics in parallel. You could compute the colors of pixels independently for the most part on a screen in parallel. What happened is that people realized that this parallel model, if you could actually harness it, uh, particularly on GPUs, was really powerful for all sorts of heavy duty uh, compute use cases. Whether that was um, doing seismic um, you know, visualization for oil and gas, whether that was doing things like um, uh, simulating the Big Bang, or whether that was eventually uh, machine learning, data science, and big data analytics, kind of the space that we're in. And so our kind of insight, uh, which led to the founding of the company, was basically, hey, let's leverage this modern hardware, um, in this case, GPUs. Let's take all those cores and let's do all the hard work for the user of putting those cores to use to make SQL queries and visual analytics and data science workflows run orders of magnitude faster than they would um, in traditional technologies, which t tended to be CPU bound in even single thread. So, I love the idea of using technology to gain a competitive advantage. That's sort of the premise of a lot of data science in general. Um, so I suppose it's fair to say that speed is a fairly central value proposition of what OmniSci offers. And just uh, casually speaking, probably most vendors would say that their product is fast enough. What does it mean to be fast? Just exactly how fast is OmniSci? Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think to your point, you know, if we had, a, if our company had a little name, speed would be somewhere in it, right? Because, you know, yes, people do say it's fast. Their stuff is fast enough. And I would say that that can be true within a certain realm, right? Like, so if you don't expect to get real time analytics, if you're already doing things with a batch or, you know, kind of pre baked mindset, like we're going to cube our data, we're going to heavily index it, we're going to run all this stuff, say in Hadoop overnight, and we'll get our report in the morning or maybe next week, then what does 30% faster really get you? It doesn't fundamentally change the game. But if you make it fast enough, if you have enough of a quantitative edge, it makes a huge qualitative difference in the what the user can actually do. So, for example, OmniSci, one of our claims to fame is being able to take billions of records, um, not index it, and then be able to run kind of heavy-duty analytic queries and visualization over that data in milliseconds. And you might say, well, who needs it in milliseconds? Well, that opens the door to a set of new opportunities. So imagine you're a user. And you're seeing log data. Imagine you're a telco and you want to see, you know, why are my calls being dropped? Or is there kind of fraudulent calls, you know, robocalls on the network, et cetera? Basically, you can go in and, you know, the human visual perception system is one of the most powerful processing systems on the, on the planet. Um, basically, go in and say, oh man, look at that anomaly. I want to drill down onto that. What's that spike in X? Why were calls dropped there? And then you can slice and dice at kind of the speed of curiosity to determine what's the root cause of what's happening. And kind of all our customers do T say, this is fundamental new capability for us. We didn't even know this was possible. We used to do this and say, there's a problem on our network. We're gonna take hours to figure this out. And now we can do it in real time and be much more agile in response to changing conditions and just the problems that crop up each and every day. So you're saying that uh, the speed difference is not on the order of 20%, but it can reduce it to orders of magnitude? Is, is that the difference that GPUs can make in many cases? I know in video games, a good GPU does make a big difference compared to a computer that doesn't have one, but is it the same case with databases? It is um, it's very similar, right? So the thing, like you would never run a high quality video game on CPU. And even when people run them on CPUs, they're running them on the little integrated GPUs. Same thing for analytics. We feel that by massively accelerating and running, you know, GPU can have over 5,000 cores each. A lot of our customers have, you know, servers with eight of these GPUs, that's 40,000 cores. And then you have a cluster of 10 of these things sometimes. So that's 400,000 cores, that's effectively a supercomputer. So, you know, that can give you orders of magnitude speed gains. That can take things that take hours down to sub second. The other thing though I'd like to point out is that it's not just the hardware, right? Um, you know, uh, companies have seen the power of this, uh, hardware technology of GPUs and have started to enter the space. But if you don't optimize your software for it, if you don't build the fastest software for the fastest hardware, you're leaving a lot on the table, right? It, especially GPUs require a fundamentally new paradigm in thinking about how you're going to process data. You have to think parallel first. And so we've done a lot of work to kind of eke out all the performance of the system 
And so that, um, you know, we're actually kind of achieving in many cases what's called roofline performance or what's the theoretical max um, that the hardware can support. A lot of legacy vendors, if they were to try to take their systems and port to GPUs, maybe they would get some speed ups, but I mean, they'd probably be leaving uh, mini X, <laughs> you know, maybe they would say be at a fifth or a tenth of the potential because they're not architected to take advantage of that parallelism from the ground up. You mentioned something about uh, making the data ready at hand and visualizing it and the human uh, visual perception that it's one of our great assets. Uh, so OmniSci is more than just uh, an OLAP database. It includes a, a visual component as well. Can you talk a bit about that component? Right. No, I think it's a, it's pretty key for us um, because what early on we realized, and especially as we started to encounter our first users and customers, that one of the key killer apps of having all this speed is accelerating the human in the loop, right? And as much as we talk about the panacea that will be AI, and certainly we're making tremendous progress on that front, you know, most people still need a human, a subject matter expert to who knows the domain and knows maybe they're deep in, you know, what's a fraudulent tr financial transaction or why a call would be dropped. You know, they're a telco network engineer and they need to be in the loop and they need to basically not be hindered by the lack of speed of the hardware and software at their disposal to kind of um, kind of figure out the correlations and anomalies in their data and get to the answers they need. So visual analysis is a really, you know, you think of traditional BI, which is like mostly static reports. And certainly tools like Tableau have made some progress towards making that more interactive, but still fundamentally it's not, um, it's not exploratory, right? Especially at scale when you have billions or tens of billions or hundreds of billions of records. So what our system does is pair the fast database, um, the very fast SQL with a very interactive visual analytics front end. And so you can put something like Tableau on top of our back end, and it's much faster, right? But our tool was designed, our front end Immerse was designed from the ground up. We know we have a fast back end and we optimize for it. And so we're not afraid to give the user a sledgehammer to use all that compute on the back end in the service of finding insights faster. Okay, so you can use Tableau on the front if you want to, so that your existing investments there can still benefit from OmniSci in the back. And then for other new use cases, if they want to, they could either choose Tableau or Immerse depending on what they prefer. Right. And that's a common pattern, Robert, actually. I mean, I think a lot of people have made significant investments in you know, traditional BI tools. And these systems are very mature and they have um, you know, large user bases inside our customers. So it's nice that they, you know, it's a bog standard SQL, just much faster. So they can accelerate their existing investments. But with Immerse, they get something different, which is really geared towards interactive data discovery and exploratory processes. The one thing I didn't mention before is the other very cool thing about GPUs is not only can they crunch things fast, but obviously they were designed to originally render video games. So we can also use that to good effect. Um, particularly a lot of our customers have big uh, spatio-temporal or geospatial data. Imagine you know all your call data records, where people are connecting to cell towers, telematic data coming off of cars, uh, data coming from satellites, any kind of sensors. I mean, think of the world of IO, the IoT world. And what we can do is use, not only query the data quickly on the back end on the GPUs, but without copying it off the GPU or anything, we can render it in situ. So we can take billions of points or lines or polygons and actually render them interactively onto a map. And so um, if you think about most client server architectures, whether it's a Tableau sitting on top of a server or a traditional GIS tool like um, ArcGIS, you know, you're going to cap out at 10 or 100,000 rows. Um, you hit a scalability wall. You can't send all that data to the front end. The front end's not using GPUs, so it can't really render it, even if you did get that data. And so what we can do is render it in situ on the back end and make the user feel like they have the billions of points in their browser, but we're actually leveraging the graphics cards in the back end to do that uh, rendering interactively. So geospatial capabilities is super interesting. I think a lot of databases, uh, especially old relational databases, have geospatial capabilities. And then you typically have separate tools like ArcGIS, where you're very focused on the uh, geospatial aspects of it. But like you said, you know, trying to draw out more than 10,000 elements at the same time will slow it to a crawl, absolutely. And you tend to have this uh, long stack of tools um, is OmniSci something that uh, w would sort of consolidate that? Because geos if, if you're working with geospatial data, or how, how do you see yourselves uh, positioning yourselves? 
Yeah, for certain key use cases, absolutely. So one of the things when we you know market ourselves, we talk about converged analytics, right? And converged analytics means fundamentally, traditionally, you've had these different spheres. You've had the analytic BI person either using SQL, uh, maybe Excel, and then BI tools like Tableau. You've had the geo person using GIS tools like Esri. And then you've had like data science, um, yeah, data scientists using probably programmatic workflows in Jupyter or in your case, Julia or something, right? But they're doing it programmatically. And the idea of converged analytics is that we can bring all those different aspects. People are seeing the elephant in different ways, often working on the same data. And we can converge that understanding with one platform. And so a lot of the work that's shared, whether it's ELT or building basic visualizations or building blocks can be shared. Now, in the case of Geo, one of the things that's interesting is like, Right now, you're kind of stuck between two hard places, particularly if you're not strictly in the domain of traditional GIS. So traditional GIS, like a county trying to survey all the light poles in their, you know, uh, in the admin district or the county, right? You, something like Ezra is going to work really well. It's not big data. It doesn't require a lot of non-geospatial insight, right? So the old GIS tools do great at deep geo analysis, uh, deeper than you know, we can go like view shed analysis, right? So that's great for that domain, but they don't scale and they don't provide traditional analytics capabilities. Similarly, um, traditional BI tools um, might excel at general purpose analytics. Um, they're often very weak at geo because it's a different modality of understanding and it requires a lot of compute and such. The BI tools often scale a little better than the GIS tools, but the, still, you know, like we talked about, they're still fairly static and can't handle billions of records well. So our system can converge the two right, where it's a new workflow, it's not traditional GIS. It's again, you're trying to understand what's happening on your network. It's a, maybe it's a car maker trying to figure out where their autopilot and why their autopilot's going wrong. Where do people grab the wheel? Um, it's people actually doing retail site analysis, right? Where do they put their store based on the location data, based on census demographic data, et cetera. So these are not traditional GIS domains, but it's something that both traditional BI and traditional GIS tools don't serve well, both from a scale and functionality perspective. Something I've been talking about for the past few days here is the importance of not simply having math chops, but having computer science chops, being able to program and that kind of thing. And what do you say to people that are, you know, really hot uh, on Python and they want to maybe use Rapids and, you know, they, they like the idea of OmniSci and the speed and the visualization aspect. How do they sort of marry the tools that they're happy with in Python uh, with what OmniSci can offer? Do they work well together? No, and that's one of, I think, our key value props because even though we've built this you know, nice user-facing front end and immerse, we're still fundamentally a platform. You have full access to the power of SQL. And not only that, for the data science stack, we've done significant work integrating our platform with uh, particularly on the Python side, the Py data side, right? Where you have inbuilt, you can go from immersed straight, flip between a Jupyter notebook, um, there's interoperability. From there, we've done integration with something called IBIS. IBIS is a Pandas-like API that issues SQL out of the back end, um, but we have advanced support for that. You can do inline visualizations with Altair in your Jupyter notebook, which is based on Vega. And so data scientists can basically accelerate a lot of what, do what they're normally doing, but have something that's 100 plus X faster. Uh, not only that, but there's a rich ecosystem emerging around GPU accelerated data science, particularly under the umbrella of the NVIDIA Rapids project, which is open source. And so we've done some uh, work on integrating that as well. So you can take the results right out of the database and then actually push them into um, uh, inference or training machine learning pipeline and then actually take the results of that and feed them back into the database, right? So you can do advanced stuff outside and in Rapids, or you can even do it inside. We have now support for taking Python user-defined functions, and we actually compile them down into to our system. So we have a lot of capabilities that allow the more advanced users, the people doing advanced analytics or data science, to get a lot of value uh, from the system alongside more traditional users. And this is what happens with our customers, right? We have somebody who's a very basic kind of BI user alongside somebody who's kind of a top-notch data scientist all getting value from the system. I think that's a pretty good value proposition to not have to ask people to change the tools that they're happy working with, you know, forcing people to write their functions in Lua or some strange language like that. Um, so one thing I'd like to ask you is, 
what industries do you see OmniSci finding success in? Because um, there are companies here that, you know, they're on top of data science. And then there are some that say, um, we don't have enough interest, interesting data. Uh, is OmniSci only working in industries like oil and gas where there's just tons of data? Or do you see a very varied type of clientele? Like where, where do you see uh, very good applications? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I think it's been very varied, if you will, in the sense that almost every industry, um, big data is a major phenomenon. There's a lot of hype around big data, but I think, you know, 10 years later or whatever, it's increasingly a reality, right? So um, one of our biggest commercial spaces is uh, telco and communications, right? And so you think about all the data coming off the network. So it's call data records, it's the handoffs between cell towers that people need to troubleshoot. It's all the billing records. It's, um, you know, if you're going outside um, kind of the US or Western markets, it's, a lot of it's prepaid. And so there's a lot of kind of retail analysis of, you know, how these things are being sold, what's how do incentives affect sales. So all of this is big data. A lot of it's very geospatial. And so I think it's uniquely suited for our platform. You know, um, likewise, we've seen this in retail, whether it's site analysis or propensity, brand propensity, retail and CPG, right? Oil and gas, as you mentioned, is obviously a ton of data, both at the well level and the seismic level. Um, even things like insurance are now becoming big data problems where it's not your traditional actuary that would sit there and work with pen and paper or Excel. That's not happening. People are actually using satellite imagery to gauge the risk level that a roof will leak or something so they can offer people good insurance rates, risk adjusted driving profiles, um, even like natural disasters, you know, insurers need to reinsurers in particular need to gauge the risk um, from a hurricane in area so that they can adequately value that that risk in their in their estimates. So um, it's everywhere, right? Everybody has big data. And of course, there are problems that are not big data problems, but um, I think uh, the world, and you know, if you want an edge over your competitors, you have to leverage um, the data at I your disposal. Let's put things into context here. This is a, a peeve of mine. A lot of people use uh, sizes of data, and there's very seldom context in it. I spoke to a, um, a bank quite recently that was lamenting how much data they had to deal with. So much data, hundreds of millions of rows of data they had. And depending on the context, if you have an Excel file with 100 million rows, I'm sure that's a lot of data. And I'm sure that if you have, you know, a cluster of 200 Cassandra nodes, uh, it's not a lot of data. So it all depends on the context. What advice can you give to decision makers that are really trying to understand the scope of the problem that they have when it comes to data volumes? Um, especially for decision makers that are looking to maybe invest into advanced analytics right now? How should they be thinking around data volumes and um, the challenge that they face? I think you make a good point, Robert, that it is all relative, right? And it's relative in the sense of, is the scale or the velocity of the data getting in the way of timely business insights or decisions, right? And it, you know, some use cases have, some things have massive data, right? But it doesn't really matter if you make timely decisions. And so maybe those are less good candidates. You could use traditional big data tools for that. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, like you said, there are banks with hundreds of millions of rows, but it's like real time, I apologize for my kids outside, uh, real time risk, or you're, you're doing something where being able to make real time decisions, and that both means um, up to date with the data coming in, not making, you know, uh, tomorrow's decision on today's data or today's decision on yesterday's data, but also in the sense of users being able to get to their insights fast, which also means that they'll dig deeper, right? Like if they have something slow, they're going to do the bare minimum, the very basic roll-ups, and they're only going to get surface deep on what's actually happening with the phenomena that the data is, um, is you're trying to reveal from the data. If you can go faster, you can dig deeper, you can ask more questions, you can get deeper insights. So. I think it is all in the context of what is the goal and is the volume and velocity of the data a barrier uh, towards getting the business insights that are needed in a timely fashion. I think that's a really good point. I'd like to uh, dig just a little bit deeper in it. Very few people uh, in these talks have been willing to be, speak in terms of absolutes. One person said that the cloud, it's a necessity, you know, that kind of thing. 
Um, but I like the point you're making now where you're saying that uh, in terms of the context of your data volume and what investment you're supposed to be making, that the focus should be on how important it is to come to an insight in a timely manner and uh, what that insight means to you. Uh, do you have any other advice to uh, companies that are looking to take the next step in the analytics journey? Because right now, um, people have gotten so far that they've done a lot of POCs. They've staffed up and they have data scientists. When it comes to investment, is the important thing having an infrastructure in place, making decisions uh, on a single use case the right way? What, like what success cases that you've come across with customers that have implemented OmniSci, what have been the factors that have led to success in those use cases? Right, no, this is, um, that's a great question. So, you know, first off, I'll say companies across the board are investing either because they have compelling reasons to or everybody else is doing it in their big data or data science uh, capabilities, right? And so one thing I'll say first off is that, you know, rightly so, people first invest in the people, right? And these days, as everybody knows and often makes jokes about, you know, a top-notch data scientist or even a competent data scientist is not a cheap resource, right? So one thing I would say, and I've seen this time and time again, is people spend a ton of, or companies spend a ton of money on hiring top-notch talent, but they don't give them the tools. And that's not just on these side, right? That's across the board. But they don't give them tools for those folks to be productive. And if you're gonna do that, it's like giving Mario Andretti a Ford Pinto, right? You're <laughs> kind of where the rubber meets the road, you know, it's just um, you're not taking full advantage of the resources you're you're, you're spending. Um, you know, I think also um, in terms of a analytics and data science practice, one of the things I've seen important is it's very hard to get these things right, completely right, top down, right? So if you're going to hire the best people, you also need them to be agile. So part of it's a culture thing, encouraging them to ask the right questions, to dig deeper, to think beyond the static report. Part of it, again, is the tool question. How do you enable them to say, huh, there's something interesting or weird in that data, right? Like we had a gaming company use our platform and just because they were, they had a culture of curiosity that promoted curiosity, um, as soon as they got our tool, all of a sudden people said, well, I've always wondered about that. And all of a sudden they found like, um, and pretty big gaming companies, so they found 10% lift through different things they could do in their game to get it stickier and et cetera, et cetera and that it improved revenue from that game or stickiness, I believe, 10%, which I know doesn't sound like a lot, but was huge for them, right? You, you realize that they're optimizing on the micro percents here. So, and that's because they had a cultural curiosity and then our, our platform enabled those data scientists and analysts to um, use that curiosity to find insights. And it wasn't top down, it was just people saying, hey, I want to explore, you know, I care about this business problem, so. It's very difficult to speak in terms of truisms or absolutes in this market, but, uh... For sure, being able to be agile uh, is super important, especially when the technology is changing this quickly. Um, this year has been a very special year. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to hear from you in, in closing, perhaps, is uh, how has this changed the way people are using OmniSci? And perhaps uh, what opportunities are presented now that companies are looking inwards um, with respect to what OmniSci can offer in this experimentation and uh, agile way of finding your way forward into where you want to take your advanced analytics. Right. No, I think the case of COVID-19, the pandemic with that we're in the middle of, actually makes the case in spades for agility, right? Because if you even think about, we, we, we would hear this sometimes, people would say, well, I kind of understand my business problem. It doesn't change that much day to day. And so why do I need a tool that enables me to be agile? Now I think people realize that, hey, well, not only are there's always black swans, but we're in the midst of an epic one and human behavior has changed in a way that probably we haven't seen worldwide since World War II, right? And so, you know, to get on top of that, and it's gonna change buying behavior, it's gonna change transport behavior, it changes, you know, work behavior. You need to basically, A, you're gonna have to recalibrate all those machine learning models you built. But to do that, you need to first kind of understand what's going on. And so a lot of our companies have been using um, Skyhook actually, which is an indoor location provider, has been using our platform to get insights into changing retail and consumer behaviors um, from their location data using OmniSci. And that's been the case um, you know, over and over. We've had insurers readjust their risk profiles as they've changed drivers, drive, you know, 
drive differently, they drive less, they um, change their commute patterns um, because of COVID-19. So I think it's a, a great case in point of why it's important to be agile. And, um, you know, specifically though, on the COVID-19 thing, we've also seen um, some pretty interesting use cases around contact tracing, both commercially and in the um, government, uh, the public sector. Um, but we've actually had a, um, uh, it's a fleet management company in Australia use us because they have a big workplace and they do need people in the office for various things. And so they wanted to basically see where people were and, you know, if somebody got sick, they could do contact tracing. Um, and we've been exploring this with other um, kind of manufacturers as well. On the federal side, um, contact tracing and hotspot analysis, obviously you have to do it in a way that protects people's privacy is top of mind for everyone, whether it's at the, you know, municipal, state or province or federal level. So um, I think there's a rich set of use cases for fast, scalable analytics. I think one of the uh, neat things about OmniSci is it needs to be experienced a little bit to be believed. If somebody wants to get started and try it out and test it with their data set, what is the smartest way to do that? Right, so um, we have a number of ways. We try to make it very easy for people to get started. And we have a lot of faith in our platform. Partly, you know, one thing I haven't mentioned, because it's fast, means that you don't have to index or do all the pre-prep or massaging of your data that you often have to do to get good performance. And so people can often get started, get their data. We had an oil and gas, big oil and gas company that said, 10 minutes, we got our data into the platform, half a billion rows, and we another five minutes, we built a dashboard and we were off to the races. They had never kind of seen that time to value in any product. They were expecting like a month's implementation time or POC. So um, there's a few routes to get our product. I invite you to go to our website. You know, the first thing you can do, um, you know, to get your toes in the water is actually try our interactive demos. They're not gated. Um, so if you just go to our website, go under learn in the header, and then you'll see interactive demos. <laughs> and uh, you can basically, um, I think we have 11 billion record ship demo. We have um, taxi data, we have an oil and gas uh, demo. And so you can try different, um, and a real-time Twitter demo, which people love. So you can search for what people are saying about COVID. It's up to date within the last five seconds or so. And so you can get a taste of the platform from that. Um, next, if you're interested in diving deeper, uh, would uh, suggest that you go on our website, you can actually um, uh, contact us, right? And um, you can contact us to get a trial. We actually have a self-service trial right on the website. And um, the core of our platform is open source. So we'd also invite people um, who are more keen on just the database thing. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but it has most of the core technology uh, to try our open source and we have builds for that. So there's a number of ways for people to get access to our platform also on the cloud. So you can spin us up hourly on AWS, Azure and GCP. Oh, I think maybe that's important to point out. Uh, this does run in the cloud and not just on premise on special hardware. Is Right. That was huge for us, right? Because when we started the company, um, especially using GPUs, it was um, not everybody had access to these. And now I'd say more than half our deployments are in the cloud. Some people obviously still have to run on-prem. You know, telco often our bank may want to run on-prem, but um, it's easy to get access in the cloud within a few minutes, you can be running our software. That's pretty neat. All right, cool, Todd. I think you've really squeezed in a lot of information in a very short amount of time. I encourage everybody to check this product out. Uh, contact Todd if you want to try something out. And uh, I will be seeing you all at the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Todd. See you soon.
about expanding an existing multi-year silicon carbide wafer supply. Uh, we're going to start by watching a video, so a nice and gentle start. It's a bit cheesy and a bit 80s, but I think a lot of the ideas are still, are still pretty valid. Okay. <laughs> Lift off of space shuttle. They've done studies, you know. 60% of the time, it works every time. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> Amazing. Hi. It has been five years since we first met. We had ambitions then. We were curious. We were excited. We were afraid. We wanted to demystify data innovation, understand what advanced analytics is and how data science can help our business, make management believe in the potential to invest in people and tech, change the way we work, change the world. We started learning and became explorers. We started sailing the sea of data and became navigators we started experimenting and became scientists. We started sharing our knowledge and became their legends. Welcome to the new decade. Are you with me?
Hi. It has been five years since we first met. We had ambitions then. We were curious. We were excited. We were afraid. We wanted to demystify data innovation, understand what advanced analytics is and how data science can help our business, make management believe in the potential to invest in people and tech, change the way we work, change the world. We started learning and became explorers. We started sailing the sea of data and became navigators. We started experimenting and became scientists. We started sharing our knowledge and became their legends. Welcome to the new decade. Are you with me? Good morning, everybody. My name is Diego Galar. I'm professor of air condition monitoring in the University of Lulio and also principal scientist for maintenance and reliability in Tecnalia, the Spanish Research Institute. It's my immense pleasure to be with you uh, during this uh, Data Innovation Summit 2020, uh, sharing some thoughts about, uh, about the digital twins that is a very, very catchy topic nowadays. So you can see there the picture of Dorian Gray, and I will come later uh, to explain you why this picture is relevant for my talk. So the first thing that I want to share with you is that uh, the artificial intelligence has a number of applications in our daily life, but uh, nowadays has a tremendous application in the industrial life. In the industrial life, in the way of services, because we cannot, we cannot uh, miss uh, the train that is, uh, of course, artificial intelligence is extremely relevant when you can provide services based on artificial intelligence. And in the daily life, in the consumer, uh, in the consumer domain, is that we are used to Amazon, Google, etc., with a number of services like uh, segmentation of customers, uh, prediction of uh, products that you want to buy, profiling of people, etc. What are the services that are relevant in the industry? In the industry, we have the same type of uh, the same type of uh, analytics, the same type of uh, artificial intelligence, what we call the industrial the industrial AI. These services they must cover the whole life cycle of the asset. This is extremely extremely relevant. That's why the assets must cover uh, this uh, this uh, life cycle. And of course, this kind of uh, this kind of services are different services. Our fleet management, our remaining useful life, predictive maintenance, etc. At the end of the day, we have to see that the same the same type of tools. The artificial intelligence tools in, uh, that we use in Google, Amazon, or wherever for our co uh, consumer consumer services are used by their main players like General Electric, Siemens, etc. It's for the services provided to the industry. But there is a substantial difference. The services provided by the industry is based on readings by sensors and basically is machine-produced data. This is extremely important. And what is the expectation that we have uh, with this kind of uh, services? The expectation that we have with this kind of services is the evolution of the analytics. I'm not going to spend that long in uh, the explaining that, but we have been we have been uh, suffering a tremendous evolution from the traditional descriptive analytics, like looking back in the mirror, uh, up to the cognitive analytics where the decisions are automatically taken. Of course, cognitive analytics is the maximum, the maximum uh, development, the, the highest uh, profile of the industry where the decisions are automatically taken by artificial intelligence and there's no human in the loop. And that's why, that's why when you don't have human in the loop is because you have a tool a model that is helping you to take such decisions. And this is the digital twin, because if we can twin the reality in such a way 
that in a reality, in a digital domain, the decisions can be simulated, can be validated, and therefore taken in the real domain, then we have, we have the domain of the cognitive analytics. And then we have to see that the digital twin is not a, something that is very fashion, is a service provider, is some, is some provider of services. We don't need something fashion that doesn't have any uh, useful stuff. We need the digital twin to provide services. And when I saw you in the very beginning, the picture of Dorian Gray, you may uh, wonder why this picture. The picture of Dorian Gray, if you remember this fellow, uh, he had a, a portrait of himself at home, and, uh, and uh, he did some kind of a deal with the evil in the sense that uh, he was going to be forever young, and the egg, in effect, was going just to be seen in the picture. This is, this is exactly the digital twin principle. We want to see in our portrait, in our picture of Dorian Gray, we want to see how the aging, how the aging of the, uh, how is the future of our asset. In the meantime, our asset is forever young, is as good as new. And this is very important because if you see, if you see the apps that we are used to work nowadays, for example, here you have a picture of mine and it's a prediction of the picture is the after some years. This picture, okay, this is what we want to see in the digital twin. We want to see how the picture is going to look like in a in few years. And this is the digital twin because if we go to the traditional stuff, predicting the past, predicting the past is much easier. Predicting the past, you have all the records and then predicting the past is just looking back and then validating the data that you have with your prediction models. This is the important thing. What we want is to predict the future and not predicting the past, okay? Then what is digital twin and how the digital twin works? The digital twin basically is a model. It's a model of data and uh, different uh, different uh, models of the asset that we are going to put together. And this model has to deliver some services, some uh, services like alarms, some services like optimization, or some services like, for example, for designers and manufacturers, uh, improvements of the uh, designs, etc. And the different applications of the digital twin, I must say that in the last two, three years, the uh, energy, industry, transport, it's, uh, are the maybe the most uh, the, the most uh, popular domains where the, uh, where the digital twins are uh, very, very successful. Due, not due to the fashion of the digital twin itself, but uh, due to the services provided by the digital twin. And of course, the digital twin is extremely popular also due to the uh, development of the IoT. IoT is the capability to have chip sensing with chip computing on edge in many points of your asset. Then you can deploy a number of sensors uh, wherever you want, very cheap. And in this regard, uh, the future of Digital Twin, of course, is triggered and powered by the development of uh, industrial Internet of Things because this makes the uh, development of these sensors much, uh, much cheaper. And in this regard, we have to be aware that the development of the Digital Twin has been very, very fast because we started 10, 12 years ago uh, working with some sophisticated models, trying to make uh, predictions. Many of them were used for predictive maintenance. That has been always one domain extremely popular for that until the, uh, the, until the, uh, the current uh, time where we are able to deliver not only predictive maintenance, but also other services for both designers and manufacturers end users and even uh, for disposal services of the machine. What I mean is that the digital twin is providing services during the entire life cycle of the uh, machine. And we have to uh, understand that the digital twin is a model based on a platform that you need, of course, and this platform, this platform is going to provide services for the customer that is buying this digital twin. But what kind of digital twins you are going to have because, of course, if you have a machine, you have a car, you have a plane, you have a, 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 some a factory, you need some kind a, of a, um, definition of digital twin. Unfortunately, we don't have any kind 
of a standard about what is a digital twin, and this is something that we have to uh, unfortunately agree. That's why it's, uh, we need to be aware that there's no standards for the digital twin and there are many solutions in the market. Some solutions are just uh, uh, solutions provided by uh, big companies, big players, and other solutions are uh, solutions uh, just tailor-made for some other companies. But basically, you have three parts in the digital twin. You have a connected product with a lot of sensors and IoT, you have the digital twin platform where the services uh, and the analytics is performed and the services that are provided uh, are provided to the end user. And the digital twin at the end of the day is that is a digital replica of your asset where the data and the models of the asset get together in order to provide these services. The only goal of the digital twin is to, to provide added value services rather than the traditional analytics okay and of course the main value that one digital twin can provide is the prediction of the digital twin in the future how the digital twin is going to look like in order to take decisions now to uh, to prevent the degradation of that asset and we have basically two type of digital twins we have the stochastic digital twin Basically, a stochastic digital twin is if you have a fleet, for example, of cars, and, it's, uh, and uh, all the information that you are collecting from the cars, you reproduce one uh, stochastic probabilistic digital twin in order to see how is the probability, the probability of failure or the probability of behavior of some parts of the car means that a fleet of cars is providing a digital twin that is, is reflecting all the behavior of the entire fleet. That's why it's a probabilistic digital twin. And basically what you get there is a probability or you have a real time model. What you have one to one digital twin means that if you have a fleet of cars, you have a digital twin for each member of the fleet means that one car, one digital twin. The, in this case, you don't get the probability, you get actually the, uh, the, the, the real behavior of the, uh, of the digital twin one to one for each element of the fleet. And the only, the only reason to have such digital twins is always the same. As I said, providing services. And the most popular service that you can get from a digital twin is the ILS, Integrated Logistic Support. Basically, it's okay, if I have a digital twin, tell me how the digital twin is going to behave during the entire life to predict the behavior, to predict the degradation, and therefore, uh, I will be able to schedule preventive maintenance or uh, buy spare parts or whatever, or even I can predict or I can uh, schedule the replacement of the asset. This is the, the concept of ILS, Integrated Logistic Support, and maybe it's a in military concept is very well known, but it's the main service provided by the digital twins. And the evolution of the digital twins, uh, I'm going to be uh, quite brief in that, but, it's a, but I'm going to show you the different digital twins, how the families of digital twins are uh, actually uh, more or less, uh, they have evolved. The digital twin uh, 1.0 is a digital twin just based on operational technologies. You take all the data from the SCADA systems from the sensors, you put all the data together in a neural network, in a support vector machine, or in whatever, and you get some kind of normality and some kind of forecasting. This is for operational technologies. The digital twin 1.0 is excellent to detect any kind of deviation of normality uh, when you have a lot of data from the OT level, the operational technology level. In this regard, it's very basic, it's real time, and it's very easy to implement. Uh, if you uh, go, for example, for a, a wind farm, it's uh, very common to have uh, the data that is coming every 10 minutes from the wind farms. It's very common to have such digital twins because they are very, uh, very, uh, very basic and purely based on operational technologies. That is basically the data coming from the SCADA. What happens when, when we bring the IT systems to the picture? The IT systems is like the CMMS, the ERP, 
In this case, we need uh, to add something else. We need to add taxonomies and ontologies. What do I mean with taxonomies and ontologies? Basically, when you bring the uh, information technologies, you are bringing different information uh, to the uh, to the to the information fusion. And what does it mean? If you have, let's say, in a wind farm, you have some alarm in a sensor. This has triggered some uh, work order, and this work order has triggered that you have purchased some uh, spare part, and then you have to schedule a shutdown. All this information is in different databases. These different databases, when you connect these databases, these databases is information technology. And if you want to connect all the databases, then you will have definitely the digital twin of your asset because you are twinning the reality of your asset rather than just the sensor information that is coming in the digital twin 1.0. In few words, when you have IT and OT convergence, then you have a much richer information is in the sense that you are bringing not only the sensor readings but also the events and this is what we call the digital twin 2.0 the digital twin 2.0 basically is the digital twin where you are bringing the information of the sensors together with the information of the information technologies and mixing this information from the sensors, SCADA, etc., with the information of the information technologies, doing this sensor and information fusion, you can create a metadata that is much, much richer in order to take decisions later on in order to provide richer services. However, uh, even though we are missing some information, why? Because you have the OT, you have the IT, but still you have a lot of data that you are collecting. What shall we do with all the data that you are collecting uh, and you are not using for this purpose? The way is to use context engines. Context is everything that is surrounding our asset. For example, the temperature, the humidity, the geographical location, social aspects, economical aspects. This is the context. And then with the context, using context awareness, we are able to answer questions, for example, why this machine that is identical to this other machine, but is located in a different place, is behaving totally different. This is the context awareness, and that's why when you bring to the digital twin contextual information to enrich your, uh, your um, asset information, then we can have the digital twin 2.x. The digital twin 2.x is the digital twin where the contextual information is very rich and then you can, you can add more information and the more information you add, the richer is your digital twin. However, still we have a huge problem to make predictions with this kind of uh, digital twins because these digital twins, they are lacking one important thing. What is the uh, lacking in, where is the missing uh, information and why we cannot predict anything with these digital twins? Definitely, we need something to rely on. It's where nowadays the industry is moving forward and we need the capability of prediction. And if we cannot predict, the industry will not rely on these methods. And what is the problem? If you look the figure that you have in front of you, you will see that the, uh, that the past is very easy to predict. You have there my picture and you have there my past. You have my uh, history and then you have my past and therefore it's very easy to predict the past with the models. But how you can predict the future? The future, you don't have the models, you have just data. Then how you can predict the future if you don't have the physical model or the model of my asset, of myself? You need something else. What is what you need? You need a co-creation of engineering and data science. In few words, you need that the data science is used for the bunch of data you have, but also you need the engineering knowledge to fill the gaps of the data science. Then we can complete the uncompleted data sets 
in the area that we don't have data with the knowledge of engineering. This is extremely important because when we bring the models and the physics of the failure to our digital twin, we complete this kind of data that is missing because are events that never happen. And in this regard, we have to be aware that the data driven, the data driven is not enough to develop a sophisticated digital twin. We have to go for something more elaborated, and this is what we call a hybrid model. A hybrid model is something where we have, we have not only the data coming from the SCADA, OT, IT, etc., but also the models and the physics of the failure. Therefore, this kind of hybrid models is what we call the Digital Twin 3.0. Digital Twin 3.0 is where you have not only the IT and OT, but also the ET, the engineering technology that is helping you, helping you to fill the gaps of the data that you don't have information about. And this is extremely relevant. The process of 3.0 uh, twin building is very simple. What you have to be aware is, okay, if you don't have information of certain behaviors, you need to go to the models and to the physics of the failure to complete this kind of uh, information and fill the gaps of the data with this information and then you can start running your analytics. But if you run your analytics without filling these gaps, definitely your Digital Twin 3.0 will be totally useless. And that's why we have to be aware that the architecture of Digital Twin 3.0 will be a mix of the architecture that you have seen in 1.0 and 2.0, but in this case, in the cloud, we are going to have our models and our physics of the failure running together with the analytics and this data driven together with the engineering knowledge are going to co-create this kind of solution. And this is the digital twin, the digital twin in this case, 3.0. However, uh, we have uh, faced with this coronavirus time a huge problem because there are some events that are totally unknown for us. Uh, nobody expected the coronavirus. Then uh, we need something also to, uh, to enrich the digital twin with events that are very rare and uh, the digital twin is able to learn from these events. And this is, this is what we need from this industrial AI and these digital twins. They should predict also the invisible things. I don't want them to predict only the failures that I, I already know that they may happen. Also, I want this kind of, uh, this kind of um, digital twins to predict the things that I never thought of that. And this is important because then if our digital twin can predict, can predict the very rare events, then I can, I can avoid the digital butterfly effect that I had the pleasure to listen last year in the conference. That is when something extremely small has a catastrophic effect because it's spread all over the world. And in this case, the digital twin, the next generation of digital twin, must consider the black swans. The black, the black swans, and if you remember, nowadays everybody talks about coronavirus, the COVID-19, as a black swan because it's something very rare, happened suddenly, uh, the impact is extreme, we can see the impact, and when we look back, we can explain what has happened. This kind of black swan is something that we need to introduce in our uh, knowledge because if we are able to incorporate our black swans in our knowledge, then we will be able to have a more robust and resilient digital twin. Because we cannot forget that the industry now with COVID-19, where it's demanding, is something that is robust and resilient in order to have unmanned systems. And if we can do that, then we will be able to mitigate the black swan losses. And how we can do that? There's no uh, magic recipe for that. We have the data that we have talked. We have the knowledge dimension that is the engineering knowledge, but we have the surprises. Surprises is unfortunately black swans like COVID-19. How, how, how can I incorporate this in my knowledge? No way. You have to incorporate this knowledge now in your models. Your model has to be, has to be, 
good enough to absorb the knowledge of this kind of blood swans in such a way that updating the knowledge of your system, the black swan turn white and suddenly your black swan will be recognized as a white swan. This means that you will be able to predict all the black swans. No, but the, your model will be able to learn from the traditional uh, in, from the traditional black swans. And once this black swan happen, the second time that something equal or similar pop up, then the system will be able to recognize it. And this is the digital twin 4.0 when we are able to incorporate the black swans in our system. Then. Uh, in few words, what we have is that our system needs to have all the information from the entire life cycle. Means that the engineering knowledge that you have in the design and manufacturing together with the information from the field. This is what we call a PLM approach. This PLM approach means that we need the information of our asset during the entire life cycle of the asset. Remember, a digital twin cannot be developed by the end user because you are missing the information from designer and manufacturer. Actually, the digital twin, if you look the figure, must be the point where both designer and manufacturer and end user get together and co-create a solution to deliver services for both. This is extremely important. And in this regard, we have to be aware that the Traditional knowledge has to be incorporated there. If we are missing, if we are missing the information from manufacturer, we are missing information very rich. If you take a picture of myself now and you predict my behavior from now onwards, you are missing all my history and then you cannot predict anything. Then, then in this regard, you have to be aware that you have to consider the past knowledge together with the data that you are collecting on the field and also the uh, information the information from engineering remember data from engineering data from sensors engineering knowledge and surprises and with this we will be able to develop digital twins that are modular can be created aggregating digital twins of different systems we have to be aware that the digital twins now are going to be modular and all the global suppliers will supply the product with the digital twin and functional mockups and other uh, formulas are becoming very, very popular uh, for that in order to be aggregated and create digital twin for complex systems. And in this regard, we will have the real digital twin with the PLM approach that I was mentioning. And this is extremely, extremely relevant. Remember that a digital twin has to be something that incorporates information from design and manufacturing with the end user information. And then the data of the end user and the information of the manufacturer get together and co-create a solution. Why? To offer services. The end user will get excellent services in terms of predictive maintenance, etc. And the designer and manufacturer will get uh, services in terms of improvement on the design, improvement of the manufacturing, at the, at the end of the day, will improve the product. In summary, the Digital Twin 4.0 is something that makes the engineering knowledge, the data driven, the contextual information and the surprises. And the small, small area that is in between is the Digital Twin 4.0. Uh, as a summary, let me say that the Digital Twins definitely, definitely are very catchy nowadays, but are catchy as long as we can provide services based on the digital twin. The digital twin is not just a 3D uh, model of a beam model of something. This is very nice, but it's not useful for anything. The operation and maintenance is maybe the, uh, the guy that is going to get most benefits from the, the digital twins. But for that, you cannot rely just on data-driven solutions. You need also engineering, engineering knowledge and uh, all kind of information from design and manufacturer. That's why the manufacturers and the end users must see the digital twin 
as the point where they co-create the solution. And definitely the next evolution of Digital Twin, the Digital Twin 5.0, will consider also the evolutionary models. What I mean with this? What is normal now is not normal in a few years. For example, my temperature, my blood pressure now is normal maybe due to my age. In 20 years, the normality also changes. That's why the incorporation of more sophisticated models, well, the normality change, what we can call model drift, will be maybe the next generation of the digital twins. Thank you very much. I hope that I haven't uh, I haven't talked too much uh, because this uh, topic definitely is very catchy. Definitely, we will see during the coming years uh, many things and many services uh, delivered by the digital twins, and definitely also the digital twin will be spread over the uh, industry, transport, energy, and many other sectors. Thank you very much. Customers are forcing businesses to transform. They want to engage on their own terms and seamlessly navigate through digital and in-person touch points. But above all, customers want to be recognized, to be known. Not tomorrow or next week, but in real time. Unfortunately, most businesses can't deliver. Please hold while I check five different systems to understand your relationship with us. Sound familiar? It's time for you to get to know your customers and to reimagine a customer experience built on connected customer data. Reltio Connected Customer 360 powers all your touch points with rich profiles that are continuously updated in real time. The Reltio platform connects the dots of siloed customer data scattered across all your applications. You can manage billions of trusted customer profiles packed with thousands of searchable attributes, including transactions, interactions, and third-party data. You can unlock the power of relationships between people, products, organizations, and locations. You can drive hyper-personalization and support connected interactions with real-time insights across all touch points, all while simplifying compliance with privacy laws, consent, and communication preferences. You can use inside-ready data to power machine learning and AI investments and bring big ideas to life. Reimagine customer experience for the future. Deliver it with Reltio.
Hi. It has been five years since we first met. We had ambitions then. We were curious. We were excited. We were afraid. We wanted to demystify data innovation, understand what advanced analytics is and how data science can help our business, make management believe in the potential to invest in people and tech, change the way we work, change the world. We started learning and became explorers. We started sailing the sea of data and became navigators. We started experimenting and became scientists. We started sharing our knowledge and became their legends. Welcome to the new decade. Are you with me? Hello, 
My name is Peter Kainz. I'm an associate prof professor of computer science at Linköping University, uh, where I do research on artificial intelligence, especially um, really much interested in about how can we use AI in a trustworthy and sustainable manner uh, to solve real world uh, problems. So today I'm going to talk about uh, privacy preserving synthetic data generation. So the outline of my talk is that I will start to uh, describe what is trustworthy AI and what is sustainable AI and why is this necessary. Uh, then we will go on and as you all probably know, real data is very central to modern AI. So basically this kind of data driven methods require that we have accurate real data. And of course, this Data Innovation Summit is, is very much focused on the question of data. However, uh, using this kind of real data uh, introduces a number of major concerns, such as privacy, fairness, bias, uh, and so on. And uh, I will therefore uh, argue that one uh, set of techniques or one approach to deal with this, especially when it comes to dealing with privacy, uh, is to use synthetic data uh, which allows us to basically generate data which is similar enough to real data, but it is not real data and it's not connected to any real individuals, uh, so therefore it's uh, private. Uh, you can also use it to improve fairness and uh, reduce bias and so on, but that's not the point of this talk. Uh, also, of course, everyone knows that AI is being used in a wide range of applications. Uh, so I, I would argue that the major uh, improvements that we've seen the last couple of years is around uh, computer vision, voice recognition and natural language processing. So basically uh, analyzing and trying to figure out the information related to images, video, uh, speech, text and so on but of course also large scale data in and in general and of course the, the common one common denominator here is that all of them depend on access to real data and to build models from this real data and then using these models to uh, do interesting things uh, at the same time we have this uh, uh, especially push in in europe uh, when it comes to trustworthy ai that Europe has taken a very clear position that yes, we do want AI, AI is very important. However, we don't want any AI. We want AI that we can really trust and that uh, works for us humans. So what, what we want is what we usually say is a human-centered, trustworthy AI, which means that AI is not a goal in itself, but rather a means to improve the situation for us as individuals and consumers and citizens and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I've been part of the European Commission high level expert group where we have developed ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI. And uh, the way we defined it, uh, in order to be trustworthy, an AI system has to satisfy uh, the legal requirements and follow the rules and regulations uh, as applicable. Uh, secondly, it also has to satisfy four uh, ethical principles. Uh, and finally, which I think is actually one of the most important parts, is that good intentions are not enough, but you actually need to have a robust and safe and secure implementation so uh, that uh, we can really trust that it both makes the right decision and that it's uh, uh, in a proper implementation. Uh, a second thing that I think we have done differently in this high level expert group is that we have not only stated the principles, which many organizations have, but we also uh, set up a, a number of requirements uh, that the system has to satisfy in order to uh, achieve these principles. And finally, uh, we've also started to work, or actually we have just released an updated version of an assessment list for how you as an organization can um, uh, convince yourself and others uh, that you actually uh, satisfy these principles. Uh, so that's one part uh, to be trustworthy. Uh, the second part, uh, which is work that I've been doing uh, at the AI Sustainability Center, uh, led by Anna Fellander and Lane Grunewald. Um, and uh, uh, there, uh, the focus is on how to help organizations to use AI in a positive manner, uh, in an ethical and long-term sustainable manner, uh, which means that we want to 
uh, uh, reduce the risk of misuse and overuse. We want to uh, make people aware of bias, both in the creator, in, in the data, and in the algorithms, and so on, and also to avoid a pitfall of immature AI. So basically, uh, the, the center has developed a framework for, for helping organizations to, to do this. And uh, uh, this talk is partly based on one of the projects that we are doing uh, in the AI Sustainability Center, uh, which is a joint uh, project between the AI Sustainability Center, uh, Telia Company, Malmestad, and Linköping University. Uh, uh, but of course, one of these major things, uh, major challenge when it comes to data is bias. Uh, so one way of, uh, well, one kind of common aspect of bias is that the data sets that we have do not represent reality. Uh, for example, we have seen a number of issues, for example, with the facial recognition system, uh, which works reasonably well on, on white males, but then uh, really fail when it comes to, for example, colored women. Uh, and, and this is then a, often the case that these systems have not been trained on a representative sets of faces and therefore fail on certain uh, important groups. Uh, in principle, this is uh, somewhat easy to, to overcome, namely to collect more and more uh, representative data. Uh, but of course, there are other challenges as well. But what's also interesting is that in some cases, the data that we get from reality is not what we want. For example, if we're looking at uh, uh, giving advice on uh, job opportunities by looking at salary information, uh, and of course, the salary information will be biased so that men have a higher tendency or uh, to have higher paying jobs and, and, and jobs with a large portion of women have a tendency to have lower salaries. So in, in a sense, this if we then build our recommendations based on this uh, uh, real um, salary information, salary data, uh, there is a major risk that our recommendations will be biased uh, due to this. And here it's a much more challenging problem because it's not about collecting more data or improving your data collection, but rather you need to do something else, that you need to actively uh, either choose the data in such a way to reduce the bias or um, taking, uh, and of course, in, in, in any case, you need to take a normative stance on what you think is correct and what you think is incorrect, and then in different ways, manipulate the data to get to the desired statistical properties. Uh, and I think that's very interesting. Um, but of course, the, the purpose of this talk is more to focus on privacy. And in our society, privacy and personal integrity is a fundamental. So we have, for example, a legal right to be able to have private conversations, uh, for example, with our, our medical doctor or with our lawyer and priest and these kind of things. Uh, and we have, for example, uh, the right to have a private vote uh, in, in the democratic system and so on. So um, privacy and personal integrity is a fundamental part of our society. And this is, uh, but at the same time, we have this need to actually use and access data. Uh, so uh, a number of traditional ways of doing this is, for example, through anonymization. So we remove, say, name and uh, uh, phone number and other things that can be seen as uh, uh, personal identifiers. Uh, there's also uh, aggregation. So instead of looking at individuals, we, we look at groups. And of course, we have encryption uh, that allows us to transmit this sensitive data. And of course, there are also methods being developed of how can we do uh, analysis on encrypted data. So we never decrypt the data. So the, the system that's doing the analysis never can see the real data, but work on directly on the encrypted data. Uh, but some of the issues here are, for example, if we take aggregation, of course, we will lose accuracy because we cannot look at individuals. We can only look at groups and these groups have to be of a certain size uh, before we can actually analyze them. Uh, uh, when it comes to anonymization, it has been shown, for example, uh, that by adding more data sources, it can be easy or at least possible to uh, de-anonymize or to identify individuals. Uh, so, for example, if you have uh, movement data, so there was a big um, 
story in Dagens Nyhet, I believe it was, uh, some time ago, a year ago, half a year ago, or something like that, uh, where they were getting access of basically uh, GPS data, people moving around, and then they could plot this data on a map. Uh, and by looking at uh, another further source of information, figuring out who was living in a particular house, so they could see that uh, here is a GPS trace that uh, starts in, in one building and ends in another building, and it does that uh, regularly. And then it could look up who is living in that house, uh, and then for the people living in that house, they could look up where do they work, uh, and then they could see, oh, this uh, the location of this uh, workplace and the location of this home uh, uh, would identify a person. So by using all these additional data sources, it was possible to identify individuals, even though the kind of original data was anonymous. I mean, there were no personal information uh, associated with the original data that they used. Uh, so these are then some issues uh, when it comes to anonymization. And then synthetic data is an alternative approach uh, so basically, uh, the general idea is that you take the, 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 the real data, you learn a model of it, or rather, I would say that you, instead of using the real data, you, you uh, generate data that should look similar enough to the real data, but should not be uh, attachable to any individual. Um, so in some sense, it can also be seen as a mix of aggregation and anonymization, actually. Uh, so, so that's uh, another very interesting technique. So in the particular uh, use case that we're doing with the AI Sustainability Center, uh, it's about uh, improving uh, the crowd insight product from, from TLA company, uh, which provides mobility or rather insights based on mobility data, uh, based on the large number of subscribers that TLA has. And uh, the information that they have about how they uh, how these subscribers move around and, and how they, they travel, for example. Uh, so basically, the idea is to uh, approximate or to estimate where the users are uh, based on their communication between the mobile phones and the cell towers, and then aggregate this data over millions of different subscribers, uh, and then provide insights uh, for for companies and organizations to make better decisions. So it means that all these insights are both anonymized and aggregated. And there has also been some statistical um, uh, improvements uh, to compensate to, to get a representative set of data. Uh, and the main form of aggregation is based on grids. Uh, so basically the country is divided into grid cells uh, of different sizes. Um, uh, and uh, depending on the size, uh, or rather the size is, is uh, defined in order to make sure that we have a sufficient number of people within the grid uh, to uh, ensure anonymity of the individual people. Uh, and then this uh, data can then be used, for example, for travel analysis. So you might have seen uh, this uh, nice um, presentations and uh, visualizations that they have been showing in TV to uh, be able to provide insight in how the patterns of travel of people in Sweden has changed uh, due to Corona uh, uh, restrictions and uh, recommendations. Uh, and uh, the particular use case that we're looking in is to use this uh, crowd insight to uh, help Malmö Stad make better decisions. So for example, uh, some of the uh, things that we could be interested in is can we uh, help the city uh, estim or um, evaluate the effectiveness of different measures? For example, that uh, in order to increase the perceived safety, uh, we might uh, there might be the situation that in, in some part of the, the city people are not walking around late at night, so we can see that there is not a lot of movement at uh, certain hours. Um, uh, and then you could say that, oh, if we add uh, more light to, to add more light to this area, uh, we, we, we believe that this will increase the perceived safety uh, of this uh, area. Uh, and then uh, we can actually try to check this afterwards and see, did this increase the movement uh, of people 
uh, in, in uh, by adding this uh, traffic lights or sorry not traffic lights but street lights uh, however the challenge here is that in order to be able to make that kind of analysis <clears throat> we, re we need higher levels of uh, granularity so this uh, 500 by 500 or even 250 by 250 meter grids are not uh, uh, enough to be able to get this level of detail to answer these kind of questions uh, so therefore the question that we pose in this project is can we uh, improve uh, increase the granularity both when it comes to the kind of temporal resolution and the spatial resolution while still being absolutely sure that we maintain this personal integrity and privacy and um, the idea or i mean the kind of basis for this project is that we would use synthetic data uh, to be able to achieve this but of course there are also ethical and legal aspects that are relevant to this and, and it's a very natural development uh, on top of the Telia Crowd Insights product. Yeah. Uh, so now we come to synthetic data. So I think the best example of synthetic data is the following. Uh, so these images look like uh, people, just like you and me. Uh, however, what's interesting here is that these people do not exist, but rather uh, they have been uh, generated uh, by a computer program. Uh, so people have been using machine learning and one particular usually have one particular set of method called generative adversarial networks gans uh, and then you train this uh, generative models on real data so you basically take a large number of real faces uh, you learn a model uh, based on this <clears throat> and then uh, this model is capable of generating new instances uh, in this case new faces uh, that uh, should be as close as i mean for all means and purposes indistinguishable from a real face with the added advantage that there is no person that really looks like this so there is no person whose uh, personal integrity or privacy we uh, could be invading uh, so therefore that's kind of the the, the, the general idea here and uh, one particular interesting application could be uh, the medical domain so again the medical domain is one where we really need the real data for real patients. We cannot look at st statistical uh, individuals that don't really exist. We, real, we need the real individuals with all their different uh, combinations of, of uh, features. And uh, uh, one question is, can we use these kind of techniques to be able to learn a model of how a patient would look like and then generate synthetic patients and using them uh, to improve uh, medical diagnosis or treatments and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, the approach that we are taking is that we have the kind of the sensitive real data at the start, and uh, then we use machine learning to learn a generative model that captures uh, the distribution of this data. Uh, so we want to learn the, the significant features of this data, uh, and then we can sample or generate data sets uh, from this generative model and uh, these synthetic data sets uh, should then both capture the salient features the important and uh, features of the data original data and it should be non-sensitive which means that it should not be possible to trace it back to the original data and so on and so forth and then we need methods to verify that the, the accuracy of this uh, synthetic data and we also need methods for uh, verifying the non-sensitivity or the privacy preservation of this data uh, so that is what we're currently doing research on. Um, uh, as you saw in the previous uh, slide, there has been results when it comes to images. And uh, what we are interested in this particular case is actually about movements, which means that there's not just an individual image, but rather uh, how individuals move over time. Uh, so we have all this temporal aspect, which uh, adds another layer of complexity onto this and of course from a researcher perspective I, I find this very interesting and very challenging of course uh, so that's what we're working on how can we extend uh, this generative adversarial networks to learn not only the individual positions for example classification or, or something like that but actually learning to uh, generate sequences of uh, real uh, um, believable accurate enough uh, movement so that we can use it for example to improve the telia crowd insight 
so that we can provide Malmö stad with better insights on how to uh, make their city even better. Uh, so, so what we want to do is then to maintain privacy while increasing the spatial and temporal granularity. So can we go down to uh, smaller grids? Can we uh, produce uh, information for shorter time periods? Can we also improve the accuracy for smaller groups? And uh, maybe we can also reduce the need for data so we don't need to use as much data and thereby even further improving um, the, the, the privacy of these solutions. So uh, the main message is that trustworthy and sustainable AI is absolutely necessary. And uh, modern AI techniques be, uh, require real data to really work and, and provide value. Uh, but using real data raises concerns re regarding fairness, bias, and privacy. Synthetic data uh, is one approach uh, that we strongly believe we can be used with great success to preserve the privacy and probably also to improve the fairness and reduce the bias. Uh, and uh, all of this is, uh, would not be possible to do this work unless we had this collaboration under the umbrella of the AI Sustainability Center, uh, working together with Telia company, Malmö Stad, and of course, my, my team here at Linköping University. So thank you very much for listening and have a great day. Thank you and bye. Olivier, welcome to the fifth edition of the Data Innovation Summit. We are glad to have you with us today. Uh, to start with, please tell us a bit more about yourself and Henkel. Thank you, uh, Ivana. Thank you also for, for having me uh, and for giving me the, the chance to talk about uh, data yes. and innovation, uh, which I'm super passionate about. Um, so, uh, about uh, myself, I joined Henkel about two and a half, uh, three years ago, uh, and I'm supervising uh, what you could s uh, name the uh, strategic uh, aspects of, of analytics uh, within Henkel. Mm -hmm. So, my job is to make Henkel uh, more data-driven to, let's say, uh, data-enable the organization. Uh, we're doing this uh, with my team by uh, running pilots, uh, developing prototypes, just to show uh, mm -hmm. the, the benefits of data-driven um, decision-making and to inspire the, the colleagues uh, in, in terms of what uh, data is giving away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, good. And at the same time, 
we're also providing some some training upskilling uh, so that uh, our colleagues uh, also get a feeling for themselves on, on what they could be uh, doing in the future more autonomously. Right, right. Um, so the second question is um, regarding your presentation uh, of the Data Innovation Summit. Your uh, topic was regarding trend detection using social media data. Um, mm -hmm. How did your data-driven transformation initiative actually start? Uh, what was the reason uh, that inspired Henkel to start connecting, collecting and analyzing social media data? Okay, so um, for the um, first uh, part of your question, um, I have to say that social media uh, data is only one of the sources uh, that, that we use, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so data the driven transformation is a, is a much bigger topic yeah. um, and uh, social media data is one element. Um, and I have to say that before I joined uh, the team, we're already collecting uh, social media data. We had uh, social media, social listening platforms uh, in place and, and data was already there. Mm -hmm. But as the term uh, implies, the, it was only about social media listening. Mm -hmm. So that's about uh, tracking what people are saying about our brands, about uh, other brands, about uh, specific topics. Yeah. And shortly uh, after I joined uh, Henkel, I was in a meeting uh, where uh, executive VP uh, said, uh, yeah, social media is, is good, but, but actually what I am interested in mm -hmm. is trying to uh, identify new trends to foresee what uh, could be happening what are the things emerging from social media uh, so that I have a better understanding of, of uh, what could uh, be happening in the future uh, in terms of wellness uh, lifestyle sustainability and so on. So when I heard about this, um, uh, th this requirement, I picked up this idea uh, and I started uh, looking uh, within uh, the, the data that we had already have in these places, uh, in, in these uh, platforms, and also tapping into additional uh, sources, data sources uh, that, that we had. And, and the result uh, was a, a concept or, or tool that I'm describing uh, in, in my presentation at mm. the Data Innovation Summit. Uh, and to answer the, 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 your, the second part of your, um, of your question, uh, the inspiration really came from, from that business issue, you know, from something mm. uh, that was a really a, an executive, uh, a top executive, was really keen to solve. And I think that this should always uh, be the, the source or the, the starting point from any uh, analytics or uh, data-driven initiative yeah. or, or, or program. The business is what everything starts with. The business use case. Exactly, right. or right. the business right. question or, right. or the pain yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That, that somebody in the business mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the top executive or someone in R&D, in marketing, um, has on, on, on their mind. No, great insight for all, all companies. Uh, so the change of company culture is also part of the data-driven transformation. Uh, could you tell us um, the, how the whole process of instilling that uh, data-driven culture in your company went? Yeah, so first of all, I, I really have to highlight uh, that we are uh, in the middle uh, of this mm -hmm. journey, right? right? So I cannot tell you the, the full story uh, about that. Uh, and in general, for a company like, like Henkel, we have more than uh, 50,000 uh, employees. Mm -hmm. um, instilling a, a data-driven culture is not something that can happen uh, within a couple of months or, or one or two years. It's going to be a much uh, longer um, endeavor for, for us, a much longer journey. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I see 
uh, three uh, phases uh, mm -hmm. in, in, this, uh, in this journey. Uh, the first one is about reducing uh, the fear of data. So, uh, you know, in a, in, a, when, in a large organization, uh, not everybody is, is an analyst, right? Yeah. Yeah, people are not so familiar with the data. Uh, and they, many of, of my colleagues uh, perceive data as something for geeks, uh, something uh, for IT people, mm -hmm. for analysts, or for technicians uh, in general. Um, and my, our role, or in, in that first phase, the, the objective is really to, to prove, to demonstrate that data are actually everyone's friends. Uh, the colleagues to do this kind of stuff on their own. Um, so, uh, you know, once they believe in, in the value of data, uh, my team uh, or in, in general, uh, IT departments maybe or, or analytics uh, center of excellence or departments can be a bit too, too small. So it has to be carried uh, further by the business um, themselves uh, so that they're more autonomous in the consumption of data in, in, the, uh, in running analytics uh, projects. Um, and this requires two, two, two things. Uh, one is more on the, on the technical uh, side um, it's about uh, developing an infrastructure that um, allows uh, um, people who are interested in the data um, to access mm -hmm. um, the data, to access trusted data. Um, and so this is something we uh, started to deliver about uh, two, two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, in the form of an analytics uh, platform. Key to uh, speak data and to communicate uh, among one another with data and to argue, uh, I think it is going to be very, very important for us to instill, um, as you call it, this data-driven uh, culture. The third phase um, in this journey uh, is when uh, we will face another uh, type of fear, not the fear of data, but the fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you're familiar uh, with this concept yeah. in, in the context of uh, social media. Um, this is uh, when uh, people who do not know um, how to play with data have the feeling that they're having uh, less fun than the people who do. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is the, um, the, the stage uh, when uh, data is not going to be about the, the data geeks, but uh, it will be the kind of the new normal. Yeah. Right. Um, and here again, uh, we don't want uh, to, to discriminate uh, anyone who is not uh, data literate and we don't want to force uh, anyone. But, you know, in, in view of, of the culture, I, I hope uh, to be able to foster a, um, a, a, the feeling um, of proud to be tech, proud to be uh, data-driven. Now, we're not there yet, but this is a kind of my ambition for this third phase. Right, that's still a work in progress, but hopefully <laughs> uh, you'll get there. Uh, but exactly. what about the challenges that you face along the way? Could you reveal some of them and how you tackle them? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, challenges, as you can imagine, there are uh, quite a, f a few. Um, the, the first one that comes to my mind um, was related to this uh, analytics platform that we uh, introduced. Mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine, uh, there, you know, not everyone, uh, uh, you know, was uh, believed in, in yeah. it. Right. There was some skepticism uh, simply because uh, some colleagues or some teams did not really understand or grasp right. um, how to use uh, these data and how to exploit uh, this platform. So I had to knock on many uh, teams or departments door um, and to to offer uh, our support to build these pilots and these uh, proof proofs of concept. Uh, 
And, and of course, uh, some of them were not interested, others were. And so my job was to uh, make look good those who were uh, open uh, enough to, mm -hmm. uh, to be the first ones to try. And I believe that we've done a, a fairly uh, good job in this regard. Another challenge uh, that we were facing and that was partly solved actually with this platform, um, but that we have still not, not uh, completely uh, fixed yet, is the fact that a lot of these data or the data sources were siloed. Mm -hmm. um, it means that they were in, in different systems, they were not uh, connected, um, so isolated and managed uh, or, or owned by different departments, mm -hmm. right? So if I was uh, interested in, in uh, obtaining uh, these data and, and using that, it, it could have been, it, or it was actually quite difficult to access it, right? Yeah. I needed to apply for the data in this uh, process that sometimes uh, involved uh, um, top executive, you know, for security reasons and privacy and so on. Um, it, took a it took a long time. And, and so the solution uh, that, that we uh, built uh, to, to, to make it happen was to install a so-called data governance, mm -hmm. right? So uh, we uh, defined, uh, uh, established new roles, data custodian, the data steward, we established, um, you know, uh, rights and obligations for people involved in, in the use of data. So people who produce the data, people who own the data, people who uh, consume uh, yeah. the data. We also uh, introduced standards um, and, and, and guidelines uh, for data quality, for data trust levels um, and so on. Now I have to say that selling this concept was also quite a, a challenge and data governance doesn't sound very attractive. It's, it's not, not a very um, nice uh, no. topic, uh, you know, to, to, to talk about in, in, in business, right? It's, it's associated with bureaucracy rules and so on. But I have to say that tackling it uh, for us uh, was really, uh, really worth it. And so far, we're not done yet, but I, I personally believe that it's uh, already a game changer. Yeah. So that was the, the other challenge uh, that we were facing in, in instilling this data culture in order to, to, for our people to be able to consume, to access these data. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's, it's also a non-negligible part uh, in this in this journey definitely uh, so and one last question Olivier uh, what are your future outlooks for data analytics at Henkel um, what would your next steps be so and uh, now that we have gained some uh, momentum um, and and that m the appetite uh, for data and for using data in, in decision making or the, the motivation around analytics uh, is there. Um, we have this kind of demand that needs to be matched uh, with the supply. Yeah. Uh, so we need to uh, work on, on this side and this will require, um, you know, the development of, of more skills and more capabilities. Uh, we need to uh, to have more, um, to provide more data sets, uh, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we need to, uh, to, to invest in, in data engineering, right? For the production yeah. of, of, of data. We also want to keep um, uh, educating and upskilling uh, the, the, the people so that, um, you know, the, the supply is coming also the, the supply and skills is also coming um, from uh, from the business, so we also need to be uh, to to further improve uh, mm -hmm. the efficiency of our processes, and we need to build operating models um, around these analytics uh, around these tools, so that the the data we are producing are properly uh, packaged 
and made ready for uh, consumption across uh, many parts of the organization uh, so that they can uh, so that they do not spend so much time on um, on connecting or preparing the data but rather on uh, consuming it or consuming the data or uh, the, uh, the the insights yeah. or perhaps for some not deliver the data but the business recommendations uh, mm -hmm. around it um, so either automatically um, or in form of uh, um, of some kind of uh, uh, app or something like that. And th this is the operating model that we need to um, build around the, the data and uh, the analytics. Um, so it's, as you can see, there's still uh, some work to be done here. Um, and to, you know, if, if I'm allowed to, to borrow uh, the, the expression by uh, Jim Collins in his uh, book, Good to Great, uh, what we need to do now is uh, turning the flywheel, you know, turning yeah. the flywheel uh, and, and continue to, uh, from our past from good to yeah. great. So great. Uh, well, yeah, thank you for providing your future kind of steps and uh, giving us insight into the work you do at Henkel. Um, I would also like to thank for being part of that Innovation Summit uh, 2020 and for doing this uh, interview with me. Thank you, Ivana. It's uh, my pleasure. And again, of course. Uh, thanks, having, thanks for having me with you. I'm Don Yudlod. I am the head of AI research for RISE, the Research Institute of Sweden. And uh, I'm also an associate director for KTH Digital Futures, a large research center within digitalization. But here today, I'm mostly going to speak as a co-director of AI Innovation of Sweden. So AI Innovation of Sweden is a government initiative to really accelerate the use of AI within Sweden, within the whole ecosystem, within industry, within public sector, and connect all players to really deploy AI at scale in Sweden. So how do we do that? How do we actually come together and create a workable strategy for Sweden? How do we create uh, Sweden as an AI leader in the world, basically? or at least an a, a leader in applying AI. Well, first of all, let's uh, take a couple of steps back and talk about changing perspectives. Because these perspectives on what AI is and how it's used is really the fundamental guiding principles in how we look at the strategy for Sweden forwards. So first of all, we have been saying for a very long time now that AI and machine learning is mature, deployable, and really is the key to advanced digitalization. However, there are real practical limits to uh, AI and its applications, and uh, these are not necessarily going to change drastically within the next few years. So we can rely on these to actually develop where we need to work and how we need to work. Finally, we truly believe that now, with new capabilities, looking at challenging applications, really systemic applications of really building large-scale engineered AI solutions, really will guide development on how we have to learn how to work with these systems, how we build these systems, and what kind of methods we really need to develop further. So, has things not changed. We've been saying this for a very long time. Well, of course, everything's changed. Nowadays, working with relatively complex computer vision problems are actually relatively straightforward. And we can do things that 15 years ago would have been seen as incredibly difficult with more or less standardized models. And this is due to deep learning. So deep learning really solved a lot of, in the beginning, computer vision problems. But there was still this nagging question, basically. So is it going to work on other kinds of domains, other data sets at scale? 
can it prove its worth, basically? And yes, it has. Uh, during the last couple of years, in a relatively different domain, within natural language processing, deep neural networks with somewhat different structures than from computer vision really has taken over as methods to understand, generate, classify, etc., text. And these methods are becoming really, really sophisticated and powerful. So we really can say that this type of methods have really uh, gained lots of traction. They're really, really useful, but they also have quite serious demands on, for example, data and processing power. So we need to take that into account, basically. Data becomes important. These models are very large. They are uh, a little bit brute forced trained nowadays and so on to actually learn from these very, very large uh, data sets. So you need compute power, you need data sets and so on. So we need to provide that in one way or another. But looking at the future, we're really looking at a future where we're hopefully moving away from some of these problems. And we're going to talk a little bit about how. Because a lot of what happens within AI and machine learning right now is basically expanding how we can deploy these things, pushing the envelope of where we can put, for example, machine learning and deep neural networks. So in reality, the things that we need to put these methods on are often decentralized, distributed. It might be uh, in mobile phones. It might be in uh, pushing things out into a telecommunications network that is not just in a data center, etc., etc. And related to that challenge is the challenge of these data sets to actually get access to them. Because data sets are often quite difficult to spread. They have privacy issues. They have, uh, they can divert, divulge information on, for example, company practices and so on. So data sets are often very difficult to share. So we need to do something about that. The same goes for, as uh, many of you have been talking about, I'm sure, explainability and how do we understand these methods and so on. These become really, really crucial questions when we're going to use them for actual decision making. And if we're now going to put them out in industry, safety and robustness becomes extremely important. So how do we provide predictable performance, performance guarantees, make sure that these methods degrade gracefully and so on? And many of these fundamentals are more or less unsolved. So we need to be able to work quickly and really empirically. Let's try to build things. Let's be prepared to fail and fail fast. And to do that, systems, the systems we use must become even easier and faster to build. Now, we're in a completely different situation today than 10 or 15 years ago. But still, it needs to be more accessible for every company all parts of public sector to quickly set up data pipelines, try new models, manage models, and deploy these things into services and so on to really get to this kind of experimentation. So these are some of the challenges. And if we're looking at the fundamental ones, so what are the fundamental limits of learning, explainability, scalability, how do we manage uncertainty, robustness, and so on and so on. These are Again, this is a slide that has looked the same for at least 10 years. So we can expect these things to still be around, but we're going to push the envelope. And if we take one step back and look at a specific part that is very important to how we approach AI in Sweden today, is the fact that our perspective on how we do machine learning has so somewhat changed. So if you look at, for example, these large scale uh, natural language models, they are often trained unsupervised with rather little tagged data. So we create a synthetic learning problem 
take a sentence, take out a word, make the model predict what word is the missing one. And by doing that on lots and lots of data, we can basically train representations, general representations of language. And we can do this similar things for computer vision, for satellite data, for medical data, and so on and so on, and reduce our reliance on highly valuable tagged, very, very um, often expensive to get uh, data where we both have, for example, the input and the correct solution. So this is changing a lot on how we work with machine learning models and data sharing. So let's get back to that a little bit. Some of the changing perspectives that we see right now is that we're talking more and more about machine didactics. And I'm saying this more or less as a joke, but you know, how we actually tr set up synthetic problems to train basic representations of, for example, language or images to then build on for specific applications. And these models can be shared. These are not specific for only one domain, et cetera, in many cases. We're talking more and more about machine reasoning uh, instead of just machine learning, because now companies are really thinking about deploying these things at scale. That means using machine learning for automating things, using the predictions and classifications and so on to actually provide actions that can really be efficient and uh, provide near optimal solutions. For example, in supply chain management, in healthcare, in controlling complex industries, and so on and so on. We're moving away in a little bit from talking about data science and talking about, let's say, bolt-on AI. You know, looking at a data set and see what you can find and see if there's any use there in the organization to really an integrated perspective on AI. So what is the business proposition? How do we break that down into components? What do we need to solve? What data do we need? What do data do we have? What kind of machinery do we need? What do we need to learn? What do we have already, et cetera, et cetera. And really moving towards complete AI engineering solutions. And this is a great change, actually. This is really, really good. And with that, comes this larger focus on application and less of a focus on expertise in many organizations and more on how you actually build teams and organizations that can have AI as an integrated part. So how do we support these developments? Because some of them are super important for Sweden. Well, the government has said that Sweden should be leading and taking advantage of the opportunities within AI. And I think this is a great starting point, basically. And, uh, we cannot look at Sweden as an AI superpower yet, but we do have some potential. We have digital maturity, we have data, we have test beds, we have resources, and perhaps most importantly, we have really large industries within gaming, digital services, within automation, cars, um, telecommunications, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that all share some common themes, application uh, challenges but also span up a huge area of uh, practical applications of AI. And if we can sort of concentrate that and work together, perhaps Sweden can become a real AI superpower. So let's get back to AI innovation in Sweden, how we work with these things. We work with education, we work with competence, we have what we call data factory, where we try to collaborate around data, models, et cetera. But what I'm going to talk about here is strategic projects, basically. So how can we come together around certain issues? So we want to talk about industrialization and operationalization of AI, really doing industrial grade AI that can be deployed everywhere robustly. So we're looking at defining key issues for this challenge, basically, for accelerating AI. And these areas for AI innovation should provide platforms where lots of different partners have a common interest. From academia, public sector, industry, lots of people can collaborate. And if possible, 
they should contribute to Swedish AI sovereignty and independence. We're not saying that we shouldn't use the best models, the best technologies, the best methods, but at least be prepared to move from one set of platforms to another if uh, necessary. So which ones are we looking at at the moment? Well, we've started and talked about the first one, reusable models for Sweden. The Swedish language needs to have good basic models that applications can be built from. And here we've started working, training large-scale uh, neural NLP models for the Swedish language that can be shared and retrained on better data, setting up these kinds of pipelines. This will certainly be expanded to more and more data types within medicine, within satellite imagery, and so on and so on common basic models, shareable models that are useful for Sweden. We're looking a lot on the data sharing problem, not only methodologically but, and technically, but also legally. How do we work with, how do we share sensitive data? What do the contracts look like? How do the technologies look like? And what kind of methods should we actually focus our efforts on? And very related to that, we're also working a lot with setting up pro projects within decentralized AI. A lot of Swedish industry is not prepared to move everything into the cloud and do, for example, all learning in one data center. It's just not possible to do that for a whole telecom network or for large supply chains or industrial production systems. So decentralized AI, moving out learning to devices and having them collaborate around models instead of raw data is super important for Sweden and an area where we can become really, really good. Again, we need to be better uh, in Sweden at building AI, ML ops systems and platform. With that, we mean software systems and processes for AI. Again, both technologies, software technologies, but also ways of working especially across uh, organizations and so on. So here we're starting up projects that um, have several different types of um, actors within them, basically. And the final that I'm going to mention is basically what we now call complex systems management. So a lot of the value of AI within Sweden and internationally comes from basically running large systems more efficiently. That might be, for example, managing all trains in Sweden or traffic or running complex production systems across the globe or running a telecommunication system, but also, for example, providing healthcare efficiently. A lot of that, a lot of these applications share the same basic components and are basically a combination of machine learning for anomaly detection and uh, prediction and classification that then provide input to scheduling optimization systems that try to run these systems as uh, efficiently as possible. And here are huge possibilities for both value and collaboration in Sweden. So these are some of the areas we have started working on. We invite you to contact us if you are interested in participating. And we're also going to look at what we also talked about a little bit earlier. How can we actually build industrial grade AI that have robust performance and that can be relied upon for year after year in real, real uh, systems and uh, environments, challenging environments. And decision-making under uncertainty. A lot of what we do in Sweden, in healthcare, in industry, autonomous vehicles, really relies on how do we act upon uncertain information and predictions and classifications. So these are some examples of areas that we have started working on where there are huge potentials for collaboration. And as a final note, a lot of these systems are going to be very difficult to build. It's basically engineering on an unparalleled scale. So we also look into major impact initiatives that can drive AI research and implementation in Sweden, such as AI for healthcare. 
and how we better that. AI for democracy. Look at these ones at our web page if you're interested. And a final note, we're also trying to create some of the people that are going to help, really help catalyze to build this system. AI enablers with one foot in method knowledge, one foot in industry, businesses, and application knowledge. The key people that can really understand the problem and the potential methods basically through education. So if you're interested in any of these, of these things, please do not hesitate to contact us. We're open for all kinds of collaborations and uh, Thank you so much for listening. We have a wrap. Data Innovation Summit 2020 has come to an end. My name is Henrik Jökberg. I'm the chairman of this conference and I'm the founder of Daredax. Together with me today, I'm standing with the grandfather of Data Innovation Summit. Not that uh, name again. <laughs> I, I, I like to use that name, and you're the grandfather of this. So, and you made all this uh, possible from the very start. Well, so, the organization did, that, right? Uh, the organization mm -hmm. did, but mm -hmm. you started you started the idea. So, yeah. thank you for that. And I have to correct you. It's not a wrap because we are wrap for the official part of the event. Keep in mind that the event doesn't finish today. It finished actually on 21st of October. So you have uh, these two days. Uh, these four days has been excellent, perfect but the event continues until 21st of uh, October. So make sure that you tune in, uh, in the Agorify platform, see all the presentations, still the chats are still open, the, co the, the comments are still open, forge new contacts, it's not over. Wow, the beauty of being digital. Right. Now, it leads me into one question. How was this year? I mean, like, give us a hint no, around. Don't ask me about this uh, year. Uh, <laughs> uh, what it meant to uh, to move into a, a digital setup, uh, yeah. and, you know, and what you saw as challenges, but also maybe benefits. Well, it definitely has been a very challenging uh, year, uh, as uh, for many industry, event industry have suffered quite a lot. But also, it forced, uh, it pushed us five years ahead. So we had to digitalize in only in only three to four months. So what was, um, I will not talk about the negative ad outputs, uh, I would like to focus on the solutions in this. And I'm very excited about this because, you see, when you usually organize events, you're limited by the format of the event that you create. What means uh, a format? So the format can, uh, usually when you create conferences, you will go to a venue and uh, the venue will have like certain set of, uh, of rooms. Um, and then you basically uh, cater that or hire that place for a, for a certain amount of time. So all of these are constraints that usually when you're constructing an event, you need to think before off. So you know that you can put only 30 presentation, 60 presentation. When you, so when you, when you are online, that, lim that limit is gone. There is no limitation. So you can add, like we did this year, we had two more top, uh, two more sessions. We had two more days, just quickly like that. The second part was basically about the content. Um, usually, uh, the, 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 um, uh, when you invite speakers, you know, the timing, travel, uh, um, time of work, and etc. limits how many speakers you can bring. This year, we have been fortunate to bring uh, so many speakers that we uh, haven't worked with uh, before. I'm very thankful to, to, um, to the presenters from, for example, Mitsubishi from Japan. We have Formula One to work with, Google, and many exciting uh, companies that we haven't had before on the event and makes me super super happy because this is what data innovation is it's a it's a it's a platform for benchmarking between data and ai practitioners between companies because between industries countries uh, regions to that aspect and the only way how you can do that if you bring them all together and the third one which was very very clear as a result out of this uh, uh digitalization it was like uh, we moved step forward into uh, building relationships. So it's, you make instant context, contacts. How it usually works on conference, like, hi, my name is Goran. We had a uh, very uh, good conversation. You give me your business card, I put it in the left pocket, I go home. Uh, by accident, I gave the, 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 the suit uh, to, uh, to Chemical <laughs> Laundry. <laughs> now, it doesn't have to be so, so uh, tragical, but it's uh, right now you are pushed directly to be in contact with the person. No, and, and I think 
for it's me, th this is actually one of the key things that I experience is that immediately when you have seen a conversation or presentation, top of mind, you connect to ah, your agenda point or what you have a challenge or what you want to discuss uh, for your agenda at home. You, you send away the chat. And if you, if, you you know, if you hit home and you start connecting, you're already moving. You know, so mm -hmm. you're short in the distance, number yes. one. Number two, since you have done this all digitally, this is all now in your records. You will find it, it it's part of your, your home workflow. It's there. You can find it, you can find it in your uh, Glorify platform. You can see with, the, you know, with who you have been in contact with. You can refresh your, your memory you know, yeah, about so, the discussion. So, so I love uh, conferencing and networking. And, and my strength has been you know, talking to everybody. Mm. I, I, don't, I, I think it's so much fun, so I don't really care. I You're extremely good with that. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah but, but on the other hand, Maybe I've had 50 really good conversations, but in the end, how many of those did I get to LinkedIn or how many and then did I then move on? No. Only, only maybe a couple of percent. Mm. Now it's more like uh, the hit rate of my, my conversations and who I want to talk to and I, that then moves into value for me in my mm. normal job, mm. I, I think has gone up. Yes. So, so I think this is one. Another reflection I have is a little bit like, I think we all need to uh, learn, right? I mean, like, yeah, I'm talking to my mm. kids and they sort of, uh, I, I say, oh, you need to go out and play with your friends now. And they look at me like I'm an idiot. I've been playing with my friends for the last four hours. We've been playing Fortnite, we've been chatting. <laughs> so it's a little bit like, we, we all need to sort of embrace also how to do this. And yes. I think uh, th there is a lot of things to, to, to learn. I we can do it better as, as organizers. But we can all also it is it is new. It is new. On the game. It is new for us as an organizer. It is not new for us as a person because how people communicated with other in other countries in the nineties through AOLs and Mirts and all these other things. So we have already done that. It's yeah. just basically we are used to, to yeah. this spontaneous. No, and, and, uh, next and we to are coffee. used to the conference yes. industry working in a certain, certain way. way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Let's leave that. I want to talk a little bit now about how did you experience the content, what was the actual, taking the pulse of the conference itself? What did you see or what did you, what oh, do you want to highlight? I, I, so I, I would like to shortly just go into this because uh, I, I believe you will have a little bit more to say on this, but what for me, what was very uh, important and very, uh, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, first of all, um, uh, the ROI examples have grown. We don't need to search anymore for ROI examples. This pocket of innovation, uh, how can we use this for customer experience, for innovating uh, new model, uh, new business models or optimizing processes, it's already there. Uh, there is no talk about it. Now the problem is actually how do we move to production? And that is linked to actually the, 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 the mindset, the vision of the organization, but it's also very, and it was very obvious again this year that it's all about the data. So data management has been a very, very big topic this year. We are talking about everything from uh, moving to cloud to feature stores and infrastructure as a code and ML ops and data ops and many, and many others. And then we have basically also what was also very, very, um, it made me happy because people finally f uh, understood that we can only fast track this if we collaborate. Not to innovate in a bubble, but actually make clusters for innovation. So you had like, for example, in a presentation of, of Volkswagen, when they're collaborating with other uh, industry giants in Germany, we have done that in, uh, in Sweden as well, with Deerdux, with yeah, innovation in Sweden, Combient, and et cetera. And this is very, very healthy. This is good. I mean, like, I, I, I must say, I had the same idea. And, and interestingly enough, we set out the whole uh, agenda in, in the opening keynote as, you know, to become, to industrialize. Community open source is one of the key uh, critical enablers. And I think it's many dimensions on this that we need to take on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and how we do it, how we find, uh, how we find the, the, the platforms and tools, how we, you know, to understand what GitHub is, GitLab, and all these different tools that it's out there doing, to learn what the coding community has done for years, and actually do it open source with everyone, but even open source within your own company. Yes. Yes. Uh, the production topic uh, is dear to my heart. I think we have truly grown now in terms of understanding uh, data science to build the algorithm is just a tiny, tiny piece of the puzzle to go to production. And the whole discussion around production now uh, was much more 
um, mature. So we're talking about one use case and deploying an insight into operational production, mm -hmm. you know, putting algorithms in production. And now we're talking about industrializing what happens when we are dealing with many algorithms and we need to build a factory type uh, orientation, data ops, ML ops. And the whole idea with feature stores, yeah. yes. I think really came up. Rockstar Games had a great mm -hmm. presentation on this. Yeah, we um, a few others. Yeah, so, so, so this whole idea, uh, algorithmic process to production, in my mind, we, we've sort of had the innovators, the real data and AI powerhouses who's been doing that for years. And we and, and sort of and, and for the rest of the world is sort of not really understood what's happening under the hood. This year you can clearly see that we have the early majority joining in. Yes. Yeah. And and, and interesting enough now, which I also think has to do with this conference, making it global, is a fantastic, interesting arena when you have some of the best of the best with someone that is just starting out and everything in between. So it becomes the true benchmarking vision yes. ha happened this year more yes. than anything. Yes. Because you could really see, well, we are pretty good in, in, in my company or in my industry or in, my, uh, in Sweden. Yes. Uh, but now, it's all, yeah. okay, there's, we can sort of see now what's the next step we need to take. And I think that's going to be one of the strongest accelerators when you understand more clearly what is the steps you need to take. Yes. That has been more transparent this year than ever before. What was the saying? If, uh, if you want to move forward, you first need to understand where you are. And right? you need to understand, mm -hmm. you know, what is possible, mm -hmm. the art of po possible. Mm -hmm. So let's leave it at that. Uh, the last topic I want to explore a little bit with you is what about the future? How, how, how do we take the next step? Mm -hmm. With, with the Data Innovation Summit, learning from this and, and combining it with what we have done greatly for the last four years before. That, that is an interesting question. I think that Martin uh, Wilcox said it in uh, one of the Data Octagon panels. He said, in the, in the world of prediction, the hardest thing to predict is the future. <laughs> That's a good I one. Think, I think it's a good one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> uh, but in, 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 in uh, um, I mean, it's been a very interesting uh, year for sure. And um, now I would say it like this. First of all, we I really want to assess this event once it's finished. As I said, we are not done. So the no. on-demand period starts today and it's going to go until October. We are preparing for a lot of uh, virtual roundtables on the industry specific topics, for example, moving to cloud and uh, fraud detection and etc. So it's going to be interesting to find different this um, other topics to explore. But then uh, I don't believe also that we as an event industry will be able to go back to executing only uh, in-person events. And, and even those ones that they will do so, probably it will be a little bit of short, uh, short-sighted short decision. We have always recorded all of our sessions, but we never actually had this thinking that, hey, if we invest a little bit more money, we could have streamed the entire event uh, online. So we will continue with doing uh, hybrid events in the future. Uh, we will focus on the in-person experience because that is what we know and that is what we like and that is what we are good at. And I like this human touch on going to conferences because it has this vibe, it has this, it's, it's quite but, but it's this refreshing, really, right? The, the true hybrid now, the, the, the digital allows us to be global faster. Yes. And it yes, allows absolutely. you to think differently also. I mean, like, I know for a fact that we were planning to, uh, events uh, before the pandemic in Dubai yes. and Milan. Yes. And I think also in Bangalore. Bangalore. It was, so so it, how, it, how it, it was a hard it was a hard oh, it's yeah. exciting now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, maybe the we, TED, uh, the TED experience is Yes, is absolutely. To, to so, be from. so data innovation is going uh, definitely international. So uh, in order I we, we shortly uh, me and Keenan uh, who is a partner manager um, responsible for the partners, etc. We had the discussion the other day. Um, and so for a year now, we have been talking about, okay, how can we uh, accelerate the importance of this platform that we are building? And the only way how we can do that, this was before the uh, Corona, was actually to, for us to geoclone the event in different uh, regions. So we had like a Dubai, uh, a lineup, Milan and uh, Bungaluru, and then of course, US and uh, South uh, Africa and, and South America in the future. But right now, everything's on stop. Of course, that is how the, the situation yeah, but, is. But it but will, the, go, it it will, will, it it will, will come back. Then, of but course. the interesting thing now, it's going to be accelerated. The strategy, it's how faster. you do the geocloning is most likely you know, inspired and different 
than how you were thinking before. I think this is an interesting time. I'm, I'm definitely very enthusiastic of what is coming, not because of the situation, how it is, but uh, I have been in this person. Yes, and how we I, can incorporate I have, that. I have been in this something. industry for 15 years. This is the first time that I get a kick of doing something new. So <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Let's leave it Take at it. that. You know, stay tuned because you, you know, where is this going? It's going to be exciting to follow the on-demand uh, process. And uh, you know, the next couple of months. You know, the more engaged you are with us, you can help us shape what this event should be next year. Yes. Let's leave it at that, maybe. Yes, absolutely. I want to thank everybody who has uh, been with us this year, uh, who has supported us in all this transition because it's not been very hard. I have my smile on the face because it's finally over, <laughs> you know, at least this part. So, so but I'm truly thankful for everybody who joined. And um, uh, as always, we will be here to uh, serve our community and try to learn and um, be better in what we do in order to serve you better in the future. And thank you, thank you, Hypebrite, for making this happen. Thank you, Kendrick. You have been awesome as always. Thank you thank so you. much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye.